I unapologetically ignore hints on purpose so people will be direct like an adult and will continue to do so. Miss me with that BS. Same here. I play completely dumb. It's maddening to feel someone trying to manipulate you to volunteer for something, relying on your good nature. Adults are indirect all the time. We all talk in parables. We all get nervous to say directly what we mean to say and it doesn't make us immature and if it does, then a lot of times it can be more of a personality flaw and not representative of everything about who we are as a person. That's something I wish more people would understand about flaws. Now, they're not always indicative of a constant way of going about life, meaning that one immature behavior doesn't mean that every behavior is immature. It's reasonable to want people to be direct with you, but it's a little mean to consciously ignore indirect statements when you know what people are trying to say just because you don't like hints. We all miss hints all the time, by the way, and that's just a part of life. We realize we miss them and we ask for clarification or we just make a mistake and it never fully resonates. Either way, there are worse things. What you're doing is fine, but it also seems kind of mean and elitist. Except there are people like autistic ones that don't even recognize those said hints. They don't ignore them, they just don't see or understand them to begin with. So yeah, people should be more direct. Throwing hints will just make the situation worse and more confusing. I've always done this. It just bothers me. My sister had a habit of walking into a room, sighing, and then looking at you, so I ignored her. If you have something you want to talk about, just talk. I'm not asking, so you're not alone. I do this at work. I do this when I know people have a problem with me, or something I did, and gives hints of act passive-aggressive. I'm not going to come to you. I don't have a problem with you. You have a problem with me. My work life is harmonious. Yours are not. I do this when I feel like I'm being manipulated. Also, me. When do I need this by? Them. ASAP. Smile, lol. So, like, when do you need this by? End of the day is fine. I can't stand vagueness. Please just be direct. ASAP means shh when I have other priorities. Secretly leaving money. My friends are a young couple with a young baby. Money was already tight and dude lost his job today. I was at their house today and when they didn't see, I took 50 from my wallet and left it in the place where one of them will find it and I think, oh cool, I must have forgotten about this. I'll emulate you. That action is worth emulating. I did this with my father after my mom moved out. He worked his ass off and barely held himself. Me and my brother housed and fed. I started hustling a little bit to make some extra cash for myself, but would hide money in his pocket, car, etc. when I could. I will never forget the face he had when he came home with three steaks for dinner and a rental DVD after he found $100 in a winter coat. He was so happy to finally get us something extra. Best steak I ever had. Another thing to help out could be to take note of what diapers they use for their kid and pick some up when you're at the shops next with a, I was at the shop and figured you'd need these. It's simple and sweet gesture that would probably mean a lot to them. That's really great. Even if they know it's not theirs, they still won't know for certain who left it there. Faith in humanity is slightly restored. You're a great friend. The world needs more people like you. When I was broke, I always fantasized that my friends would do that someday, and as far as I know, they never did. Maybe they were too good at it. Sometimes when I shower, I like to turn the water a bit cold, sit down, and pretend I'm a frog in rain. Sounds fun. Gonna try it next time. Tried this, and it was so relaxing. I wish I was always a frog. Thanks for sharing. This is pretty cute, and also a little strange and embarrassing. Perfect confession, 10 out of 10. I like to put YouTube videos on. Rain on a tent is my fave. Close my eyes and pretend I'm there. Every response to this is liberating. We are all human beings who just want to sit quietly under the shower, pretending we are little moist froggies sitting on a leaf during the tropical monsoon. Thank you, friends. I like to pretend I'm a duck stomping in the rain. I'll give the frog thing a go. Saw a completely different side of the guy I'm dating. My date. He always seems like a calm, composed, focused, serious kind of person. He doesn't post much on social media, doesn't have a large friend circle, doesn't talk too much. A kind of guy you'd think works for some super secret services. We've been on a couple casual dates and he spends good time with me and opens up a little, but I always feel like there is so much that I don't know about him. So this happened yesterday after our third meetup. We went to grab dinner. He wanted to drop me off at my place in his car, but I insisted him to walk me off as the place is pretty close to my apartment. We were walking down the street and I noticed the stray kitty and I showed him the cat. He just turned into something I never expected to see. He walked up to the kitty, started petting her, talking to her in a sweet, cute voice. His voice is pretty rough. Looking at him was like seeing a toddler get a toy they've wanted for too long. Seeing him like that was so wholesome that I couldn't stop my tears of happiness. To everyone saying this isn't a confession, is a clickbait, is misleading, etc. It is a confession for me as I can't share this with the people I know and wanted to share an experience I had with others, hence I decided to post it. About the title, it is literally what I experienced and I had never seen him act that soft and cute and that is a side of him I'd never seen. I don't know, I don't care, and if it comes out as clickbait because I didn't intend it to be one, thank you. This is definitely went in a much better direction than I thought it was going to. Lol. When a person is kind of animals that speaks volume in my eyes. Swear you were working your way up to him killing the cat. Jeez. I'm sure I'm paraphrasing, but how we treat the most vulnerable is a measure of our humanity, and I've always believed that. Me halfway through the second paragraph, oh god, please don't say he kicked the cat. Me after finishing. Aw, OMG, that's perfect. Most dudes are like this. He's not afraid to show himself to you. Why the f*** is this in 
confessions and not wholesome, right? Really clickbait too. So what exactly are you confessing? That they need attention. I read my boyfriend's notebook. It's not a diary or anything. It's not hidden. He's just got several notepads lying around the house with lists, song, lyrics, etc. Well, I couldn't resist having a flick through. You know what it is. Then I came to the page which says, you are a beautiful human being and I'm all the better for knowing you. You are a fucking nosy bastard though. <laughs> I am well and truly rumbled. He's not the soppy type at all unless under the influence. So this is very sweet for him, but I can never confess to him. I have seen it. So now I confess to you. You should leave little notes for him to find around the house. I love when the non-sappy type gets sappy for a second. My partner drew a heart on my dry erase calendar like two years ago, and I still to this day haven't erased it. I just don't make plans on the 19th. He already knows. That's why he wrote you're a nosy b in it. I'm sure he knows. Right? You too. Right? No, I'm not. Definitely doing this. Thank you. He really nailed you. He seems to know you pretty well too. Today I found out what the weird whispering noise is upstairs. My fiance pretty much always has her headphones in, loves music. She has music quite loud, so she will text me to say that she's got headphones in so that I don't accidentally scare her by creeping up behind her, etc. If I'm going upstairs, I'll call or text her to avoid getting her a heart attack. We've learned from experience. Sometimes though, I hear an odd whispering. It's like someone is yelling, but whispery yelling? Aggressive whispering, I guess you could call it. I did the unthinkable and silently crept upstairs to see what she was doing, what the noise was. I found her arm in arm with the cat, holding her outstretched singing to her, whisper singing to our cat. I've never seen something so perfect in my life. I feel like I fell in love with her all over again. I love my little family. Not gonna lie, I was expecting something like, I don't know, she really cheated or other really creepy stuff, but this was so wholesome. This is objectively the best story. Something similar happened to me as well. Third day, I got my cat. My cat got attached to me and she was giving me cuddles. I was listening to Little Peep on TV and I started singing one of the songs. My cat fell asleep on me. That's so cute. Don't ever let her know though. She might get embarrassed by it. I want a life like this someday. I'm manifesting it. Got my groceries held hostage because I didn't tip beforehand. I'm done. I use a delivery service that brings my groceries directly to my door. It's been a great help and saves a ton of time. It's a dice roll whenever you get your order though. There are definitely some questionable people doing deliveries and I've had a couple bad experiences so for that reason I choose not to tip until after the service is complete. I tip anywhere from 10 to 15 percent I think that's reasonable and fair. I usually tip more if I order heavy items like soda or bottled water. Really I don't think tipping should exist at all. I can't tell you how annoyed I get when I have an iPad shoved in my face by cashiers, people handing you your to-go order, and even the freaking guy that fixed our air conditioning. It's presumptuous and rude. You're getting put in this awkward position where you're expected to subsidize the wages of people who've done the bare minimum in order to fulfill the service I've already paid for. Tips used to be reserved for people that went out of the way to do a great job. Anyway, I opened the door today to a lady with no groceries in hand who instead greeted me abruptly asking if I'm planning on leaving a tip. I told her I tip based on the service I receive, which means I have to tip after she finishes the delivery. This woman loudly sucks her teeth and tells me I'm not getting my order until I give a tip. She's very adamant that I tip her in cash and I asked her to deliver my groceries first and she flat out refuses. I just stare at her in shock. We stand in silence awkwardly until I told her that I've already paid for my order and it's her job to make sure I get it regardless of what I tip. Before I can even finish my sentence, this lady walks away, shuts her trunk, and drives off. I spent the next half an hour being bounced around from person to person on the customer service chat, only to be told that I had to call in to resolve the problem. One disgruntled phone call later, and I finally got my refund and my driver reported. I'm done with tipping. I'm so tired of being guilted into paying on top of an already expensive bill just because the owners don't want to pay their workers a decent living. You can call me selfish or rude, but I'm past the point of being moved by social pressure to tip. From now on, I'll be discontinuing all tips. It's not fair to the customer or the employee. It relies on guilt and praise on people's fear of social awkwardness in order to fleece us. We should not be worrying that an employee won't deliver our order or spit in our food if we dare not tip. Prices go up fine. I want to know exactly what I'm paying for something. No more not mandatory but actually mandatory gratuity. If enough of us do it, tipped employees will be motivated to demand compensation from the people who actually should be paying. It's not the customer's responsibility to pay your staff. Damn. Whatever the opinion on tipping or not tipping is, absolutely no way on earth should you have not received the order. This is just straight up the woman not doing the job she gets paid to do. Kroger delivery is awesome and they don't accept tips. They come to the door in a refrigerated box truck. All of my groceries have been fresh and delivered without issue. It's not even funny how right you are and how ridiculous tipping has gotten in the US. 100% agreed. Tips must be earned and shouldn't be standard. Business owners are just taking advantage of workers and customer with this predatory practice. Peace. I had a waitress yank my bill out of my hand to compare with the card terminal receipt. When she saw the numbers were the same, she scoffed at me and threw both slips of paper at me and then walked away. No, I didn't tip her because she got her orders wrong and never checked in with our table. But she visited in every other table around us. This was not a teenager either. She was very much a senior. For reference, wait staff here are still paid at least minimum wage and tipping is above and beyond. Should I ask my math teacher to adopt me? This might be kind of confusing story and I debated posting this but decided why not? So I am 15 and my math teacher who I will call V, F35 and her husband is M40. My real parents are or were abusive alcoholics and drug addicts. They got arrested last year and was going to enter the foster system and now I had already told V about my struggles with my parents and I confided in her about me going into foster 
foster care. So I guess she jumped in and her and her husband somehow became my foster parents. I absolutely love living with them and I feel like I have true family for the first time in what feels like forever. I really want to ask them to adopt me, but I'm unsure of it. For one thing, I'm incredibly nervous and very unconfrontational. And second, I know the foster system gives people money to take care of the child, so maybe they would be better off just staying foster parents. Also, they already make quite a bit as my foster dad is a doctor. I just don't know what to do. Can anyone please give me advice? Even if you don't want to straight up ask them to adopt you, just telling them this, I absolutely love living with them and I feel like I have true family for the first time in what feels like forever, is going to mean the world to them. Kid, you made a grown man cry. I'm so happy for you that you've been shown so much love that you want them to be your parents. Tell them. They might not be able to for a various amount of reasons, but they'll appreciate it so much. Whether they can adopt you or not, I have a feeling that they'll be with you for life. Math teacher here who adopted a 15 year old student of mine. 10 out of 10, would recommend. That was 16 years ago and she's getting married in September. One of my closest sisters isn't blood related. She was our babysitter and her parents died in a fire. She became a ward of the state and lived with us all through college. My parents never adopted her and while I'm not sure why, there are many variables, it doesn't matter. She's my sister. My mom introduces her to people as her daughter. My point is, no matter what happens, it doesn't define who your family is or who loves you. Your foster parents sound like amazing people who have shown they're there for you. Good luck, OP. Yes, you can tell them. Regardless of if they do or not, there's nothing wrong with letting them know how you feel. Glad you're doing great. My dad's girlfriend is really cool. I'm a teenage guy and my dad's girlfriend is honestly the coolest person. For some background, my dad has a job that required him to be away from home for weeks at a time and he and Mariah, girlfriend, have been together for seven years. If you're wondering about my mom, she died when I was young. Mariah is really chill about homework and chores. We have lots of things in common. She acts in a motherly way towards me and she even calls me Honey Bun as my nickname. She's also kind of a fitness nut and likes to work out and do yoga and she even got me into it too. She makes the best food and I like cooking with her. She treats my dad like how he deserves and is literally the sweetest and most loving person in the world. She makes my family feel complete and she even asked me to walk her down the aisle when she and my dad got married this summer. So at the request of others, I have decided to tell Mariah how much she means to me and today she made me breakfast and I told her, Mariah, I know I don't say it a lot, but you mean so much to me and I think you're the coolest and most kindest person ever and I love you so much, mom. She had to stop eating because she started crying and she hugged me and said that I will always be her boy. On top of that, she revealed that she's pregnant. I'm getting a sibling. She has told my dad and he's also very excited, but dear God, I am just so freaking excited right now. Thank you so much, everyone who commented. I hope you all have an amazing day. There's a ton of negativity posted here, so refreshing to read something so nice. Being a step parent takes adjusting. Sounds like you and your dad are very lucky. Lovely to hear, OP. Thanks. This post brightened my day. I don't know why. I read this as my girlfriend's dad is really cool. Makes sense now rereading the post. I'm worried about my comprehension now. I'm so happy there's no dark side. Thank you for sharing this. Man, I've been on the internet way too much. I expected this to go in a very different direction. So glad to hear you have a great relationship with her. Neither of my kids get along with my second wife, and I wish she and they hit it off the way you and your stepmom to be do. I steal hermit crabs from souvenir shops. You know those hermit crabs they sell as pets to tourists and coastal souvenir shops? The ones with shells that have badly painted cartoon characters on them? The ones that come free with the purchase of a little plastic carrier with a thin layer of brightly colored gravel, some flake food, and a shallow water dish with a sea sponge in it? Maybe your parents let you get one while you were on vacation as a child because it's such a simple little pet. And maybe it lived for a few weeks or months or even a couple years in that little plastic box before you noticed a bad smell and found it dead. And maybe you shrugged it off because it's just a little crab. And they don't live long, right? Those crabs have a lifespan of 30 plus years. Those crabs are highly social and need to be kept in groups. Those crabs require air that's around 80% humidity or higher in order to breathe and kept at around 26 degrees Celsius slash 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Those crabs need separate pools of both fresh and salt water using marine aquarium salt that are deep enough to fully submerse themselves in so they can regulate their internal salinity. They need large enclosures with deep substrate to burrow down in so they can molt. They need a varied and nutrient rich diet with fresh fruit and vegetables. The little crab you got as a souvenir in the same place selling custom airbrush shirts and shark tooth necklaces died a slow and miserable death. It's a miracle it made it that far to begin with as all the hermit crabs sold in these shops and major pet retailers are collected from the wild. They have their natural shells broken off their bodies with a hammer so they have no choice but to wear some kitsy garbage with Spider-Man painted on it. Roughly 50% don't survive the process and no one seems to care. I care. Several years ago I was in one of those shops and saw hundreds of hermit crabs kept in a bare unheated open air cage with only a shallow dish of water. I could smell them before I saw them. Dead little bodies rotting in their shells and limbs strewn about. Children were encouraged to pick them up and play with them and beg their parents for one because they're hardly more complicated than a pet rock, right? If I bought some of them I could give them a chance to live. But in doing so I'd be supporting a cruel industry and funding the death of so many more. I'm not sure how long I paced around the shop with my moral dilemma before a sudden realization hit me. I have pockets. As casually as I could, I picked out a couple sickly crabs and gently put them into my pocket. My heart was racing, but no one stopped me when I walked out the door and so started my life of crime. I don't do it often, 
fun. But if I'm in town with one of those souvenir shops, I'll pop in and jailbreak a few hermit crabs. I gravitate towards the weak ones and those missing limbs. They're on their way out, but I want them to have a chance or at least die as comfortably as they can. The ones that have pulled through are all healthy and active now. A colony of contraband crabs. I love the background noise of their shells clacking against their terrarium and each other as they go about their crab business. I'm a little drunk and sentimental tonight, which is my excuse for writing all this. I have a feeling most folks won't care to read it all, but I hope they do and somehow it'll make a difference. If you made it through my rambling, thanks. May you never be pinched. Yeet them into the ocean like Gob Bluth with the letter while screaming, go back to whence you came from. I don't usually condone thievery, but I can applaud this. Animals are not souvenirs. Guys, it's so true. Animals are not souvenirs. They're animals. They live. They have feelings. They have a brain. Be nice to animals. Treat them well. I got mad at my girlfriend today and opened her MacBook Air I had wrapped under the tree and rewrapped it and addressed it to my son. Girlfriend and I got into an argument over our kid's Christmas spending budget. We both have a kid from a previous relationship, her daughter, and my son. We have an agreed budget of $1,000 for each kid. We have met that budget for both kids last week. Today she tells me she wants to get her daughter a phone and wants to buy her an iPhone XS Max, easily putting her daughter close to $1,200 over our agreed Christmas budget. We have a shared bank account, so it's not quite the it's her daughter and her money, so what's the deal kind of thing. We argued for three days over the issue. We couldn't afford to spend another $1,200 on my son to even out the budgets again at a ludicrous $2,200 each. My son would have never known if we spent extra money on her, but that's not the point. It's unfair, and in my opinion, it's favoritism. After another very heated argument over the issue, I walked over to the tree, grabbed her present, opened it in front of her, and then rewrapped it and addressed it to my son. Now the budgets are mostly equal again, give or take $100. Merry Christmas, b- P.S. The MacBook was purchased on my personal credit card, so she wouldn't have known about it. A classic Christmas tale. Is a $1,000 budget for one person's Christmas presents not insane to anyone else? Yeah, it kind of is. I feel like when I was growing up, the most luscious and ludicrous thing I got for Christmas was like the Nintendo DS, which was what, like $150? If that? <laughs> so, sheesh. Good for, good for them, I guess. I stole my son's teacher's keys. My son has Asperger's, which is like autism light. We've done extensive therapy and intervention, and for the most part, he is no different than any other kid his age, except he comes across as shy and a bit nerdy, saying that with love. The only issue we had at school was that he would become overwhelmed, panic, and run out of the classroom. Of course, that is not okay, and we in school decided to allow him to take quick breaks to decompress when he starts feeling overwhelmed. He has not had an incident since third grade. He started the sixth grade last year, and it's hard for any kid, especially for an Aspie's kid. We met with all of his teachers and reminded them that he has this accommodation in writing, and he will likely need to use it since middle school is tough for an Aspie kid. All but one of his teachers understood that and were supportive. His math teacher is just a nasty b- She's one of those teachers that should not be a teacher. We're not those crazy in your face parents. We just want what's best for our son and work with his teachers do so. We kept on reminding her verbally and in writing, especially as our son's anxiety started to grow around her. Imagine my surprise when I get a call from his counselor telling me to pick my son up. Apparently he had bolted from her classroom and ran out to the field. Principal and a counselor tried to escort him to the office and he refused unless they called me and horrified me because I've seen videos of cops being called and tasering or hitting special needs kids. When I got there, my son was very upset. It was like watching years of progress unravel. Apparently, he started to feel overwhelmed in her class because she's a b She turned on the heat too high and closed all the doors. He felt trapped and claustrophobic. When he asked for a break, she refused and told him to sit down or get detention. That only fueled his anxiety more and he exploded. The school quickly accepted that the situation was handled poorly by the teacher. I requested that he switch classes and even threatened to get a lawyer for not following the accommodations that they are required by law to follow. That got their attention quickly. They did not send him back to her class. Rather, he went to another class until the matter was resolved. The teacher did get into trouble and wanted to discuss it with us before pulling him out of her class. We met with her and she was just a nasty b- she accused our son of using his diagnosis as a crutch and he needed to grow up. I wanted to slap her. She went to take a phone call and I saw her keys on her desk. I put them in my pocket and we finished our conversation and I politely thanked her for her time. Then I threw her keys in a dumpster and got my son pulled out of her class the next day. That made my day, lol. <laughs> Look, I don't condone I go I don't condone stealing. But but if you if you got a if you got a bad teacher who's gonna who's gonna do that to your to your son, revenge is a dish best served sweet. I'll just leave it at that. Something scared me and my brother really bad when we were younger and I'm just now remembering the details. We were watching one of the Garfield movies. I can't remember off the top of my head. And everything was well until the I Feel Good song by James Brown started playing in the movie. Now you may ask, what could have scared you so bad from a song like that? Well, I'll tell you. In the beginning of the song, James Brown does this sort of scream, I guess you could say. Well, me and my brother had no idea that it was part of the song and we thought the scream came from somewhere in our room. After hearing the scream, we immediately ran to our parents' room and told them that we heard someone scream from inside our room. So my father jumps up and grabs a knife from the kitchen and walks into our room to find nothing in there. So now everyone 
everyone in the house thinks there's an intruder, so we all go lock ourselves in my parents' bedroom and call the police. Police show up and find nothing. I was watching the movie with my niece the other day and heard that familiar scream and realized that it was only the movie, and we'd have called the police for no reason at all. Wow! I feel good! Pack the frickin' bags, Karen! The place is haunted! <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> That's I love that. I insulted a child who I thought was wearing a costume while waiting outside my kid's school to pick them up. Class of middle schoolers walked past. It was close to Halloween. I looked up when a girl with makeup and colored hair called out hi to me. I was kind of caught off guard, but noticed she was made up for Halloween and guessed she wanted some attention for her costume. I noticed what looked like big teeth and assumed they were fake. Trying to be funny, I said, oh, wow, you really need to see a dentist. Almost immediately, I regretted it. I think I heard her mutter, how rude, and my brain finally caught up and realized her teeth were not fake, but just abnormally prominent. There was nothing I could do at this point. I've seen her once more around the school, but didn't say anything. I can't really say, sorry, I thought those were fake costume teeth. That would not help. Now I just feel like an a-hole. I physically cringe every time I think about it. Holy frickin' stuff. <laughs> Lol, this is probably the worst thing I've read someone confess on this subreddit yet. I'm cringing too. <laughs> Lol, oof. Your comment may have crushed one soul, but sharing your story on Reddit has lifted many other ones. You really need to see a dentist after eating all this Halloween candy. You could have come back from this. It wasn't Halloween yet. She didn't have all the Halloween candy yet. I don't think that would have worked. We swapped our twin brothers at birth. When I was 11, my mom gave birth to my little brothers, identical twin boys. My sister and I, also identical twins, decided it would be funny to swap them. They had bands on their wrists identifying them, but we were able to ease them off and swap them. We then placed them in each other's cribs. We did it because we thought our parents would realize straight away and laugh since they were able to tell us apart even when we swapped clothes. However, they didn't. A while later, possibly a few weeks to a month, we decided to swap them back because we gradually became scared they'd find out and we'd get into trouble. We swapped their baby grows that had their names on it, but by that time, my mom had gotten used to their faces and individuality and asked what we were playing at swapping their clothes. We never told her that we were actually trying to reverse an original and successful trick because we knew she wouldn't believe us or be furious. So we are the only family members who know that they were swapped and that the eldest is actually the youngest. Only one of our best friends know the truth. They are 16 in December. We plan to tell them one day because they have a right to know, but neither of us have the balls at the moment. Lol. But at this point, who cares? Their names don't matter, their personality does. It's about who's the oldest. Honestly, that's one you should both take to the grave. I can't see any good coming from admitting what you did. Yeah, having to admit that their entire, like, they're they're each other? That's messed up. If I had a twin brother that th their names got swapped, I'd be mad and I wouldn't forgive them. <laughs> that would be, that's like insane to me. Mother breaks down at dinner and confesses the horrifying truth of the missing bear. This is a confession to me from my mother. So, many years ago, I was sat around the dinner table with my mom and she broke down in hysterical laughter, tears and all, and told me she she had something to tell me she couldn't live with the lie anymore. When I was a little girl, I used to have a child-sized bear, originally named Big Bear, who lived under my bed to protect me from monsters, etc. I loved this bear. He was my protector and my best friend. My mom, however, hated this bear. In her mind, he was one of those cheap bears you can win at the fairground stuffed full of straw. But to me, he was perfect. When I was eight years old, we moved house, and during this move, Big Bear went missing, believed stolen. My parents assured me that they had contacted the police and they were on the case. Eventually, time passed, and I forgot about Big Bear and life moved on. Coincidentally, at the same time, of Big Bear's mysterious disappearances, I was in my school play, Teddy Bear's Tea Party, and my role was Teddy Bear number two. My costume was amazing. It was a handmade, full zip-up teddy bear costume, complete with a cute little bonnet with a pink bow. I was the cutest teddy bear in the whole show, confirmed by my grandparents. Now, you've probably guessed the terrible secret that my mother has carried with her all these years. My amazingly cute teddy bear costume was Big Bear. She had murdered him, pulled out his insides, and cut off his head. She then cut off his face, attached a bow to his head, and made me wear his cold, dead, very cute, and fluffy teddy bear skin. I think she finally caved and confessed because she could no longer live with the guilt. I was, and still am, traumatized. Rip Big Bear, R.I.P. That was not the ending I was expecting. Look at me. I'm the Big Bear now. <laughs> That is morbid. That's crazy. I actually, like, yeah, it was a complete plot twist. I have literally done nothing at work for a decade. I have a great job in Canada doing data entry and analytics. I would prefer not to give the field of work as it's fairly specific. 70k a year, benefits, whole nine yards, really awesome. The confession is that all my info was pulled from standard Excel files made by other people. In my first month, I made a macro that pulls from 50 plus places on our shared drive and compiles a five page report daily. The email sends itself at random times around 2.30 every day, Monday through Friday. Everyone thinks I'm amazing at my job. I'm the laziest fork you'll ever meet. I'm almost done getting a VPN function approved that will allow me to work from home. When you eventually leave slash retire, will you reveal your secret? Teach me. <laughs> that, you know what? You know what? That's honestly based because, hey, you can't, you can't work your entire life. Live your life, man. And if you get, if you, if you're smart enough to make a macro that does your job for you and you get paid 70,000 a year, brother, take that. Good for you. I made a Facebook meme page in high school that got the police involved. When I was in high school, I created a meme page that made fun of every teacher, student, and 
faculty there. Some of them were extremely offensive and were basically attacks on individuals. I just kept doing it for the lols. Once the administration got a hold of it, they hired a private investigator to find the culprit. Luckily, I wasn't that stupid, so I made and uploaded all my memes from the library computer. I started making memes, making fun out of the bad administration and the investigation, which then escalated into a whole chase for me with the police involved. They threatened legal action, but since they couldn't find me, I just kept memeing my way through high school. During my graduation day, I posted one final meme that said that I just graduated and that the search team sucks. <laughs> I think at that point, they had an idea it was me, but they never proved it. It feels good to finally let it out. Haha. <laughs> I never told anyone. I had a fear for snitches. Kid in my high school did something very similar right when memes originally became popular, but was eventually caught and expelled. A cheap camera in the library could have solved this pretty quick. I'm pretty sure they could have easily tracked it by computer, and time it was posted. I slapped a child in the face and then shoved him off his scooter. I'm 25. So I have a beloved kitty named Pixie. She was around four when I found her on the street. She had a rubber band tightened on half her tail. I spent two weeks feeding her until she was comfortable enough to let me near her. She didn't trust anyone. I took her in, cleaned her up, and got the dead portion of her tail amputated. After five years, she finally warmed up to people, and she became so sweet and friendly. It took her years to be comfortable around strangers. Last month, she was out for her daily stroll around the neighborhood and immediately came back in through the kitty door 20 minutes later. Usually, she is out and about for two to three hours. She had two small holes in her chest and one near her butt. She was completely frightened and was crying slash meowing. She wouldn't even let me go near her for the first five minutes. I knew for certain that she was shot with metal BBs. I take her in my car and start driving to the vet, but took a quick detour around the neighborhood. I was going to take the long way to see if I could find the culprit. Sure enough, I see a kid on a scooter standing in his driveway with a CO2 powered BB gun, aiming in the drainage cavity by the sidewalk. I see cats in there all the time. It was then I knew who the culprit was. I parked the car, got out, walked over to him, and said, I'm telling your parents that you're shooting cats. He replied, they are pests. They told me I could. The smug little look on his face threw me over the edge. I slapped the frick out of this bee and kick sweeped his legs out from under him and watched him fall fall flat on his ass. <laughs> Then I picked up his gun and smashed it on the ground. A small part of me wanted to finish him off with a stomach kick for good measure, but I'm freaking 25. So I looked both ways before crossing the street and bolted. As I hopped in my car and sped away, I heard him shrieking in the distance. My kitty was treated and is doing okay. She is a lot more skittish and spends less time outside. They told me I could. Well, frick them too. My 26M wife, 29F, just came out to me as a lesbian and I'm not in the slightest okay with it. We've been together for about five years, but we were friends before that and I've pretty much been living a lie. I've seen for the first time in years what she looks like when she's actually happy and not faking it. That just feels like a punch in my stomach. Last time I saw her like this was back in the early stages of our relationship. I've been falling deeper in love with her every day that we were together and we had a beautiful son and now everything's all over the place. I can't really just up and leave to go process all this because of my son, but I can't stand being here and seeing her every other day. I mean, I've been pretending everything is okay, but every time I see her, I want to scream until my head explodes. We agreed to get a divorce early next month and have already agreed to share custody. She she seems to be happy that she's finally herself, and it just pisses me off that I'm the one that has to pretend now so that things stay smooth. Hypocritical of me, yes, but I'm only human, and I can't really lie to myself until I believe that I'm not angry. I really don't want to be an absent father, but I also would prefer not interacting with her for some time until I can properly deal with my anger towards her, because I know that if I keep pretending everything's fine, my mental state's only going to get worse. You're allowed to have feelings, man. You're allowed to be angry, frustrated, and disappointed. You can feel all those things and be a decent human being. Your feelings are valid. Is there somewhere you can stay? so that you can get some distance to grieve your relationship? Do you have a supportive friend or family that can help custody transitions so that you don't have to see her? As Top Comment said, let yourself grieve, brother. What you went through is nothing short of exhausting and tiring. Take your time and don't feel guilty about your feelings. Dude, just because someone comes out doesn't make them immune to hurting people. It's all right that you feel this way and I'm so sorry that you find yourself in this situation. If you can, I would suggest distancing from her, if at all possible, and getting divorced ASAP. This isn't a healthy environment for you and you are worthy of love, affection, and respect. Also, find community to support you. Maybe a church, therapy group, online mentors, etc. But you need community and support through this. You can't carry this alone. Just know that it won't always be like this. Joe Rogan is not a good interviewer and his podcast is not analysis. Popular with the unaffiliated voters, Joe Rogan's interviews are full, personal, unsubstantiated opinions and commentary. His interviews push his own opinions and he doesn't push back against interviewees with correct or pertinent data. Only ever his own thoughts. Listening to Joe Rogan is not the same as analyzing an issue and it is certainly not a rigorous platform for testing ideas. It's irresponsible of him to conduct interviews this way, but that's probably why he's so popular. I'm 
just here for the comments. I like listening to his podcast, but I don't agree with his standpoint on everything. My biggest pet peeve with him is that he believes pretty much every article he reads on the internet, and then he takes some moral high ground stance that relies on the article's information. So yeah, I like listening to him, but I also think when people say he spreads misinformation that they are correct. As with the media, Joe Rogan, anyone. It's all fun and interesting until they start talking about something you have vast knowledge of, and then you realize that they're idiots. He's not an interviewer. He makes a conversation with the host. He is not there to analyze and makes an uncomfortable question. I don't necessarily think it's even put forward that way. He's just hanging out, so chill. Tried to warn a girl at my gym. I tried to warn a girl at my gym that had period stains on the back of her shorts, and she went on a rant saying that she was working out and OMG and trying to make fun of me in front of everyone for being weird. So I announced the entire gym that she was staining the equipment with her period blood and that she needed to wash and clean herself immediately. I've never seen her since. I know it was probably really petty, and I got a lot of shit from people for doing that, but honestly, try being humble enough to listen before making a public scene, you gosh dang drama queens. One time I was working out and saw a woman with a stain, and I went and discreetly told her, and she said thank you. It's a boring story, and that's a good thing. Contact with blood is a biohazard. We have training videos about it at work. Wasn't there a post last week about someone who stopped being someone's friend because she free bled all over the gym, and her defense was, but I wipe it up with a towel. Ew! What? Gross! As a woman, I would have been thankful. Been there, it's embarrassing when you realize and wonder how long you've been walking around like that. Once I was at a bar, and I noticed a girl walk out of the ladies' room with a five-foot-long stream of toilet paper following her that stuck to the bottom of her shoe. I saw some people pointing and laughing at her, so I walked over to her and tried to discreetly tell her about the toilet paper. She reached down and pulled the toilet paper off and screamed, F*** you at me. I guess no good deed goes unpunished sometimes. Uh, excuse me, you have- I have a boyfriend! I'm sick of nobody knowing about this. Right. The other day, I walked into a pub for the first time in ages. The gust of wind caused by me opening the door caused two receipts to fly off the bar straight at me. They flew either side of me in an act of astounding coordination, dexterity, and raw speed, I caught one in each hand simultaneously and slapped them both down on the bar in triumph. Astounding reflexes, cat-like agility, never to be repeated, and nobody saw or gave a shit. People need to know. Edit, Marvel had just contacted me about a possible film franchise. I was the only person in my crowded middle school gym that saw a kid toss his empty plastic bottle towards a garbage can, only to have it land and balance on the rim. He looked around excitedly to see if anyone else saw it, and our eyes met from what seemed like a mile away when you're 12. Never knew that kid's name, or even talked to him, but I think about him often. I hope you got a free pint out of that. I didn't even get finger guns, mate. One time in a study hall in high school, a friend right across the table from me threw a pen at my face. I caught it in the air an inch away from my face with some once-in-a-lifetime reflexes and then wrote Q on a piece of paper and handed it to him with the pen. Those moments are gold and so precious that it's just for you. I laced my braid with thumbtacks as a self-defense tactic. I, 28F, was 24 years old at the time and worked in this independent kitchen with no HR department as a cook for several years. There was a brief period of time where a co-worker was pulling my hair repeatedly after being asked and told not to. He didn't even stop when my managers told him to F off. So I got permission from my sous chef to take things into my own hands. I braided my hair for work one day and wove thumbtacks into it. I was met with a yelp when he tried to pull my hair again, and he never did it again. This has been on my mind lately because it was a pivotal moment for me in the way I allowed people to treat me. I'm totally here for this. He deserved it. Well, that's a bad <laughs> way to solve that problem. Good job. I had a guy that liked to jump out of the darkness and scare people. I told him not to do that to me ever, and he did it to me one day, and I punched him as hard as I could in his neck. I'm a massage therapist, so I'm not a dainty or weak. A memo was sent to the rest of the crew the next day not to scare other employees because it could lead to physical confrontation. Even with no HR, how TF did nobody else try to stop this person? He was literally assaulting a coworker. It's insane to me that you had to do that because they refused to fire him when the manager knew what was going on. My estranged family asked me for money. I haven't seen or talked to any of them in 23 years. They disowned me for being gay when I was 17. Now one of my brothers and one of my sisters called me because the family business is bankrupt and my parents are in danger of losing their house. They want me to pay it off. They figured I can because my husband is an ophthalmologist and I've never laughed so hard. Telling them the f*** off was one of the most satisfying things I've ever done. It's funny how when it's their a it's family over everything. Good on you. Frick em. I would be like, oh, I would love to help, but unfortunately, I'm gay. Sorry, all my money is gay, so it wouldn't be any use for your straight problems. Ah, you want some gay money, huh? Buy the house after they lose it and then kick them out. But I'm not that petty. And make it a home for gay homeless people that were kicked out by their families. Sorry, still gay. Bye. I cannot imagine disowning my baby for being gay. I can't imagine never seeing one of my sons again. I can't imagine asking them to pay my house off under any circumstances ever at all. I'm gonna hug my boys so hard when they get home from school. Well, the 17 year old might not let me, but I'll try. Sorry about your family, OP. Glad you made a nice life for yourself. It's pathetic how differently I'm treated when I'm attractive. I'm a 24 year old man. In my late teens and very early 20s, I made some money as a male model, but due to mental health issues and a string of awful relationships, I put on a significant amount of weight. The way people started treating me differently was staggering. No one cared about what I had to say and people treated me like being fat or chubby was the most significant aspect about me. I've gradually started losing
losing the weight, and now it is showing. It is blatantly obvious how differently I'm treated. People look at me more, smile more, give me more stuff, go out of their way to help me, and are overall more attentive to what I have to say. People also seem to be more scared about confronting me, but that may be because I'm more muscular now. I understand when it is a stranger, but my own family treats me like this. Particularly two female cousins and one aunt, it's like now I'm everything to them, and they want to know how I'm doing. Yep. Growing up, I learned this quickly because there's a huge switch in the way you're treated on days you do your hair and makeup and days you don't. Beauty discrimination is very much real. I experienced something similar. I used to be pretty skinny, fairly conventionally attractive, and put on some weight during a major depressive episode. I immediately noticed the difference in the way people treated me, and it really sucked to realize just how shallow most people are, even some in my family. I lost 150 pounds, and the difference in the way people have treated me due to my weight loss has made me struggle with an eating disorder. The thought of going back to being fat doesn't bother or worry me, but going back to the way people treated me when I was fat is terrifying. Who would you say had the more noticeable attitude adjustments? Men or women? Strangers or friends? When I became hot again, women went from uninterested to friendly and flirty. Men went from bullying and condescending to respectful and friendly. Strangers just stare more and smile more. Family, I am ashamed to say, had the biggest change. They just want to spend time with me now. It's the same if you come into money. Funny how attitude can change even from people you've known for decades. Suddenly, my in-laws like me and compliment everything about my appearance and home. Keeping track of the pronouns in my teen social group is exhausting. To start, let me say that my husband and I do not care about our children's or their friends' gender identities beyond a deep desire to respect the young people in our lives and create a supportive and positive environment for them. We are both queer, we understand how hard navigating adolescence can be, and we want to make sure our home is accepting and welcoming to everyone who steps foot in our door. Our daughter's friends go through frequent pronoun changes. Often each time I see one of these kids, they will be using a different set of pronouns and a new name, and I cannot for the life of me keep it all straight. Our relationship with her friends is cordial, and that's about it, which honestly I feel is appropriate. I'm not a teenager, and so beyond exchanging pleasantries, providing snacks, and offering a ride home, they're not a big part of my life. I would honestly struggle to remember their names if they weren't changing regularly. But every time I get it wrong, my daughter gets incredibly offended on their behalf, and I'm trying so hard, but it is just exhausting. Questioning who you are at this age is developmentally appropriate, and I don't begrudge them for that, but I also can't wait till her social group settles into a more long-lasting identity. For now, I'm just apologizing frequently and baking a lot of cookies. You could just start calling them by hair color, piercing, shirt color of the day, hey red shirt, hey green hair, hey platform boots. My 12-year-old daughter's friend group is this way, and it is definitely exhausting. I call them all hun or kiddo or something equally generic. Being in the medical field, I have just learned not to use pronouns mostly because I can't remember my patient's name to begin with, so everyone gets called lamb chop, sweetie, or love bug. Only if they're older or senile, though. I'm not about to call a big <laughs> man lamb chop, lol. Otherwise, I would just say hello and avoid calling them anything. I'm dude, you're a dude, we're all dudes. Hesant is gender neutral and usually gets a laugh. My sister's stupidity destroyed my family. My sister let her boyfriend drive my parents' car. She took it when they were out. She only had a learner's permit, so she was supposed to have a licensed adult with her. She let her boyfriend, who was a year too young to have a learner's permit, drive, and he crashed. He died. My sister was seriously injured. They think one or both of her feet were on the dashboard. She's paralyzed from the chin down. My parents' insurance isn't covering them since my sister took the car illegally, and her boyfriend's family are suing my parents. My parents tried to sue them back since he was driving, but it was thrown out when they tried. We had to move to an apartment because my parents couldn't afford our house. I see them cry every day. I heard my mom say that going bankrupt doesn't get rid of the lawsuit debt, and their lawyers told them to try and settle before it goes to court because they will probably lose. My sister has to be in a home forever because she needs help and care 24-7, 365. She remembers everything, and her brain is not affected at all. Her medical and nursing home bills are so much money. My grandparents are all trying to help, but they're all in retirement homes and don't have much. I've seen them cry too. I know she is getting punished already because she's paralyzed almost completely, but I still can't even look at her because she destroyed our entire family. Thank you for the awards and nice words. Tragic. I saw something similar to this a few months ago up here. This girl's sister and her boyfriend, both 20s, were in a car accident and the boyfriend didn't make it. Her sister was driving and the boyfriend was in the passenger seat. She was speeding, trying to beat a train that was coming, and lost. Even though the boyfriend died, her sister also ended up paralyzed and remembers everything. The girl said it's been a few years now and she still resents her sister for what she did. This is one of those posts that leave me speechless, and I fail to form any words of comfort. What a tragic situation, and I can only wish you well in life, and I pray that you'll have enough patience to face other challenges. This is the worst answer to the situation, but your parents need to relinquish custody for her to the state. Her medical bills and care will be covered at their expense and it will give your family the breathing room to pay off the lawsuit. Y'all can still visit her and stuff. You just wouldn't have to cough up the money. She'll be in better hands with them. Is this an option for everybody? Can the state afford so many disabled people if all of their families choose to relinquish custody? Yes. Your sister needs to become a ward of the state. She can get her care taken care of and the burden off your parents. This is one of those moments I've been on Reddit for long enough to say I have read almost this exact post before almost word for word from memory. Either two families are exceptionally unlucky and this is horrible coincidence, or this is a fake post. If it is the former, then I am truly sorry for OP's situation.
situation. I've definitely read this post before, like a year or two ago probably. You're not alone. I'm a man and prefer sitting down to piss. I don't care what anyone thinks, it's more comfortable to sit and not have to aim into a toilet. Edit, I appreciate all the attention the silly post has gotten, sometimes we just need to enjoy the mundane and find humor in that. If not humor, then a common bond. I hope I've either made you laugh or bond with me or someone else in this mess of a post. Much love. The only time I don't do this is if I'm in a public restroom with a turd-themed toilet seat. I saw this post literally as I sat down on the toilet to take a piss. You're not alone, brother. I piss sitting down in my house, but standing if I'm outside. God bless you. Sincerely, female roommate who deals with piss on the floor. I thought you said sitting down in piss. That is all. I still think about the plumber that unclogged my pipe 10 years ago. 10 years ago, my pipe got clogged and it pushed a huge amount of feces out of a drain in the backyard. A plumber came and I thought he would use some kind of tool to unclog the pipe. Nope. MF walked over the mountain of feces and shoved his hands into the drain and kept pulling stuff out. No gloves, no tools, went in arm deep. Ew. I just stood there in shock. He then washed his arm with the garden hose, didn't even ask for soap. Sometimes I think about him while trying to sleep. Last night was one of those nights. Plumbers are a different breed. Had one eat a sandwich while I was dry heaving because the smell of poop was so intense. TBH, not what I expected to see when I joined this sub, but I completely understand why you wanted this off your chest. I remember when I was working with a retired carpenter and he gave me words of wisdom one evening. When you're a plumber, you just gotta remember three things. One, paychecks on Friday. Two, poop always coming back, so keep an eye out. Three, don't bite your nails. I was so unprepared for the third one. I don't know you at all, but I can still picture your face as you watch that scene unfold. Wow. Shock Pikachu face. Yeah, editor, put the one up. Put it up. Show the picture. I love that picture. That man is immune to everything. You don't have to worry about him. I just realized I'm jealous of my six-year-old. I woke up this morning and found my six-year-old on the sofa, fully dressed and ready for school an hour before he's supposed to be up. I ask, hey buddy, what are you doing up so early? He replies, I accidentally peed the bed this morning around like four and I tried to wake you up but couldn't, so I took my blankets off, put them by the laundry room and changed, then I came out here. I thanked him for taking care of it and I told him not to worry, we'll have everything cleaned and ready for his bed later. Next time, make sure you pee before bed, accidents happen, blah 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 blah. Then he got up and got breakfast, I made coffee and I sat there and thought to myself, I'm jealous of this kid. It then reminded me of being around his age as a child and I remember wetting the bed, but my first instinct wasn't to wake my parents. Hell no. It would have beat the <laughs> out of me. I instead went to the bathroom, stole a roll of toilet paper, and tried to dry my pee drenched linen. Because I knew if my parents found out, I would be in so much trouble, I was terrified of them. My son doesn't have to live with that kind of fear. Instead, he tried to get me, and when I didn't wake up, he took care of it himself. And I wish I felt that sense of safety and reassurance when I was his age. We can't change how we grew up, but we can make sure our children have a better time than us. Seems like you're doing a good job of it so far. Your six-year-old got himself ready for school unprompted, and here I am having to tell my 12-year-old the reason he was having a hard time putting his pants on was because he was wearing shoes. You are who all of us want to be. Healing yourself while helping your kid, you're a great parent. I just saw something yesterday that said, you are the adult you would have felt safe with as a kid. And it really hit home. Generational trauma is tough to break, and you did it, OP. Be proud. You raised the damn good child. Nah, not jealous. Proud. Proud that you can be that for your child, and that he will not have to have parents as you had. You should be incredibly proud. To the guy who hit my dog with your car, thank you. Thank you for staying with him. Thank you for holding him and caring. I wish I could have gotten your name and number so I could call and tell you that he is okay. I could see the look of sorrow and remorse when I came up to you, and I want you to know it wasn't your fault. From the amount of blood coming from his paws and legs that I got on me taking him to the vet, I can only imagine how much you got on you while you held him. There are far too many times where a pet does not survive, and I got extremely lucky, and who knows if he would have gotten hit again if you had just kept on driving. So thank you for being a good person. When I was a kid, an older gentleman hit our family dog with his truck. He knocked on our door, and we were the only house for about a mile, so he correctly assumed she was ours. He offered to come with us to the vet's office, but we told him it was okay, and we'd take her. He got back in his truck, looking like he was going to start crying. I wish he had come with us, because she ended up being fine. Some poor guy is out there, thinking he killed a family dog. I clicked on this post, expecting it to go to a very different direction. Was pleasantly surprised, and chopping onions, apparently. Glad your boy is okay. Give him lots of loves. Can't even begin to understand what the driver went through. I would have been distraught. You're a good person for not going off on one on this driver. He's a good person for stopping. Accidents happen, and it could have been a lot worse, and glad it wasn't. That's a class act. I've seen two dogs hit by cars, and both times the driver sped off. In either case, I wouldn't have been mad if they had stopped, even though one of them was very much the driver's fault. Hope your dog is okay. My German Shepherd I had as a kid was told she would barely be able to walk for the rest of her life, but she was running full speed later that year and lived another 12 more after that. I'm so sorry that happened, but thank you for sharing. What is your puppy's name? A guy hit my dog once and his car got damaged. He sued us for it. Yeesh. Sometimes I'm silenced by the things my daughter says back to me. I40M told my 17-year-old daughter she's not allowed to be alone on dates with her 18-year-old boyfriend because I know teens sneak to have sex if left unchaperoned. She says, you know there's lunch breaks at school, right? And bathrooms and bleachers, right? You can follow me around if you want. It's not like it's gonna stop anything. I was mad, but I didn't even have a response because damn, 
damn girl. She's not wrong. At the end of the day, she's gonna do what she wants. Keep an open line of communication and teach her to be safe. She isn't even remotely wrong. Parents have been trying to prevent teenagers from having sex since literally the dawn of time. You honestly think they can't find the opportunity to do it outside of dates? It's more logical to give them access to protection than it is to try and stop them. Promote safe sex at this point. She's 17. Or piss her off and push her away by trying to control what most people that age are getting into. I let a girl sleep alone in my bed and she said it was the nicest thing anyone's ever done for her. 17M had girl over 17F and she was spending the night. It eventually got to the point where we had to figure out who was sleeping where. I didn't want her to feel pressured into sleeping with me. If she would have given me a signal, a thousand percent would have done it. I told her, I don't want you to feel obligated into anything. You can sleep on my bed. I'll sleep on the couch. She kind of had a confused reaction and said, okay. I wake up the next morning and I go to check on her and in a choked up voice, she says something like, what you did last night was the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me. And she leans in to hug me. Kind of left me feeling weird because it's a bare minimum thing to not pressure someone into that. But at the same time, being told that felt really great. Maybe things work out with this girl. I sure hope they do. Edit. She invited me over. To make a long story short, I got what was probably the best <laughs> job I've ever gotten. I guess the kindness paid off, lol. In a girl world, this would be normal, but thank you for making this girl feel safe. I was very well into my 30s before I realized how messed up my sexual encounters had been. Wanting to say no more, but being pressured. It really puts into picture how <laughs> many people have been to her earlier. Your parents taught you well. For a 17 year old, you did more than an adult person would. You have my respect, kiddo. This is what women mean when they want a nice guy. Dudes who will do things so they feel comfortable and not expect crap in return. Good job, man. My girlfriend lost her entire college fund for this semester to a scam. I really don't know what to say, honestly. I really love my girlfriend a lot, but I just can't put up with her naivety anymore. She lost $14.5 thousand dollars to a crypto scam. She knows nothing about crypto at all. Nobody we know invests in it, and she fell for the scam over Twitter. That money was not just hers, but her parents, and I contribute most of it. She only works part-time as a server, so it really feels great to know the last five months of saving has been for nothing because she naively thought a 12-hour-old account on Twitter was going to give her 50 bitcoins because she won a giveaway. She's always been a moron, if I'm honest with you. She falls for things so quickly, it's kind of absurd. This isn't even the first time she's done something incredibly stupid before with money. She's always falling for sham pseudoscience scams and buying incredibly expensive supplements and products. She actually believes the YouTube scam ads and will freely give away her credit card info to any site she finds herself on. Those are easy enough to get past, however, because $50 of some stupid bottle of pills is one thing, but 14.5k is another. I'm just tired, I guess. She actually believed after a week that the transaction to transfer the 50 Bitcoin to her wallet was still on hold, and it was only me discovering her bank account had been emptied that I figured out she messed up massively. I don't even have the heart to tell her parents right now that her daughter just messed up so massively that she actually cannot attend school this semester. Now she's convinced that if she contacts the FBI, she'll be able to not only get her money back, but the 50 Bitcoin she was promised. The fact she cannot pay her tuition this semester does not even cross her mind, and she still plans to attend classes and just take out a loan or something until the FBI gets her money back for her. I plan on breaking it off this week. I'm going to tell her parents ahead of time so they don't just get dropkicked with that info that she fell for the scam. Yep, smart move. From experience, 99.99% of the time, the FBI is not interested in financial crimes under $250,000 and anything under $500,000 are very low priority cases. It's tough when someone you care about is as dumb as a rock. Beginning of the second paragraph took me out. Several skull emojis. Damn, if she just sends me a few grand, I'd be happy to send her 51 bitcoins to make up for her loss. <laughs> Yikes. I can understand not willing to devote yourself to constant financial hardships due to her lack of financial intelligence. That's a headache for years to come. She's always been a moron, if I'm honest with you. Romance isn't dead. I'm quitting my reasonable, well-paid job in finance to buy a burger joint. Throw away. I work for a bank in risk management. I get paid well, do little work, and have great benefits. I hate it. I've always hated it. My life is a constant cycle of being relaxed, f***ing off most of the time while getting paid, and I absolutely dread the occasional deadlines I have. I'm just a cog in a multi-billion dollar global banking machine. I love to feed people. I love to cook. I was happiest busting my ass working a grill and managing staff when I worked in food service and catering in college. I would happily work 20 hours feeding people over four hours of this dreadful, pointless monkey work at a bank. My wife and I have enough money to open the business and build it more. It's well positioned with a lot of great development nearby, and because of the pandemic, is essentially being sold at cost. It's pretty much turnkey. If I told my co-workers, they would say I'm absolutely crazy, and I'm pretty sure I am. I will most certainly make far less than I do now, with far more work expected of me, but I would much rather own something, be in charge, and deliver smiles in full belly. Nothing makes me happier than being in a kitchen, but I'm also 35 and I have a little time on my hands to take a risk. Nobody's ever told me leaving a lucrative career for food services is smart in any way. It's not. And I get this. I'm certain this is going to fail, or at least not be worth the effort, but I'm doing it anyways and accepting the calculated risk. I'm scared I won't see my wife and son as much, and I'm scared I'll be a poor business owner, and I'm scared I'll lose respect in my social circles in the business community. But I'm doing it anyway. I'm doing it. My wife supports me, and we're stable financially, which is a blessing beyond blessings. And it's time to do something I feel passionate
audition for. It's time to or get off the pot. Happiness is the new rich. Follow your dreams, Bob, and tell Linda I said hello. I've tried my best for many years to avoid my calling as a classical pianist. I know exactly how you feel. I would pursue a hobby instead. Have a long, hard look at what you have right now. I'm going to guesstimate a house, a car, and a load of you don't really need. That's more than the average Joe, mate. Why risk to lose what so many people don't even dare to dream of these days? Who the frick gives a about putting smiles on faces? Life isn't a fairy tale. You're going up against a Mackey's, a Burger King, and a whatnot. Why fight the uphill battle when you don't have to? You expect your business to fail, so when that day comes, then what? Your financial ruin and broken dreams. If that's what you wish for, then by all means, go for it. I know I'll get downvoted for this, so be it, but I'm not some pretentious f***er that just tells everyone to do what feels good. My boyfriend broke up with me two days before the surprise birthday party I threw for him. I pretended we were together in front of his friends and still threw it. This happened a while ago, i.e. pre-COVID, but wanted to share. I planned a surprise birthday party for my now ex-boyfriend. I invited all his close friends on Monday and told them to go to a local bar on Friday night. I even made a secret group meet with everyone but him so that we could coordinate and his friends planned to bring a cake and stuff. The plan was to invite my BF to hang out, just the two of us, on Friday night and just grab a beer together. The Wednesday in between, he broke up with me and I hadn't invited him to go to the bar yet, but I still invited him anyway. In retrospect, it was probably weird AF. He said something like, I don't want to be with you anymore. And I was like, oh, okay. Still want to grab a beer on Friday though? When we got there, he ended up being so surprised he was really happy. It was a weird party for me, but I didn't feel like making a big deal of it in front of his friends. They thought we were still together, as they should have because we both kind of acted like it and didn't say anything, and even saved two seats for us next to each other at the bar. It ended up being really fun for him, and I think everyone else had a good time. I was drinking, and the breakup was still fresh, so I cried a couple times in the bathroom. Ah, oh, well, such is life. Wow, you're so nice. I don't think I would have been able to stomach that party, let alone be the one coordinating it. You're so nice and strong. Holy moly, girl. I'm in awe. You're a sweet and good person. I hope you thanked you for the kind gesture. I'm glad that breakup was for the best. You deserve happiness. It's okay. Life be like that sometimes. Yeah, he did me a service by breaking up with me. He treated me like trash towards the end, and I ended up meeting someone much more compatible a few weeks after that. You are a gentle and kind soul. I read in one of your comments, he was shitty to you. I don't know if it's your case, but some people do that because they're too much of a coward to tell the truth, and being shitty and let you do the dirty job is easier than having that confrontation. I'm also glad that you recently found someone else who really clicked with you, and it's better. I'm glad you had that outcome. You deserve someone as kind and caring as you are. Keep being awesome. Leave shitty people behind. At least you ended it by being your best. You can never say shit about you after that. I can't stand people who are always positive and upbeat. Those people that are always full of energy and smiling. The kind of person that does a little clap and has a huge grin on their face when they're about to tell you something. Like, what are you so happy about? Why are you always moving your hands so fast? Why do you need to create some stupid <laughs> job title like creativeologist when you're a branding manager? It's not normal for grown <laughs> adults to behave in such a way. It's unnerving. Just bring it down a notch. But of course I can't say that because then I'm the <laughs> asshole. Your second paragraph seems r slash suspiciously specific, lol. I'm an extrovert that doesn't have a lot of friends. I'm just happy when I get to talk to people about things that excite me. Some of us are dying inside, but try to fake it until we can make it. Well, I never try to forget I'm really going to die probably within 20 or 25 years or so. I want that time to be as happy and fun as it can be. That doesn't mean I don't get sad or lonely, but I try to enjoy things as best as I can. The taste of a good meal, the cool and calm of a late summer night, drink that stuff in, because who knows how much a future exists. Same man, life is short and I'm here to enjoy it as much as I can. If I don't try to see the positive side of things, I will kill myself. So let me be. I met a man who didn't know how to read today, and it's changed my perspective on life. I went to a diner in hopes of finding something good to eat. I'm waiting in line, and the man in front of me turns around and smiles shyly, doesn't look more than 30. He asked if I could read the menu to him. I'm a bit confused, because it's not something I'm normally asked by someone, but he must have picked it up on my confusion, because he sighs a bit nervously and quickly says that he doesn't really know how to read all that well. This caught me by surprise, but I helped him by reading the menu to him. Even a woman behind us chimed in on what her favorite dish was. He orders and thanks me, seeming genuinely happy. I don't know what his life came to that he wasn't able to get a good education, but it makes me so thankful I had the opportunities that I did. I really wish him the best in life, and I wish I could help him in more than some way. He just looks so happy he got someone to help him. I'm tearing up, definitely a little more grateful today. My dad has a disability that prevented him from learning to read, that and growing up in the sticks in the 60s. I read for him all my life. Recently, my uncle gifted him an iPhone and made him get rid of his flip phone. I helped him set up voice to text and large tech display. I received my first text from my dad earlier this week. I bawled like a baby in the car. I found that often, surprisingly to me, the folks when working in healthcare in rural areas, they wouldn't be able to fill out their new patient paperwork, etc. It changed me, also when I first encountered it because of the indisputable reality of how much it can alter your life trajectory. Plot twist, he forgot his glasses and was really hungry. I was born in a third world country. Neither of my grandmothers ever learned to read and every time I think about it, my heart aches. Maybe he has dyslexia or some other disability that has to do with visual perception or maybe he was raised in a dysfunctional family who didn't care about his education. I'm leaving my husband because I found out that he has been making fun of me behind my back to his ex. My husband, 45M, and I, 
F, met about six years ago. We've been married for one year, and when we met, I was very fit and athletic. I started gaining weight, however, after suffering two miscarriages and the loss of my mother to cancer. I was very depressed and barely got out of bed, if not to go to work. I stopped exercising and instead started eating junk food. I gained 40 pounds in two years. Under this time, my husband, then fiance, was very supportive and loving. I felt guilty and tried to give him out several times, but he instead proposed and we got married last summer. Since our marriage, I've been feeling much better and it showed. I've lost around 20 pounds so far and I gained back my muscles and abs. He was so happy to see me feeling better. On his computer, however, it was a totally different story. He was talking almost under our entire relationship to his ex-wife about me. His ex-wife, 46F, left him about seven or eight years ago for her colleague. The relationship didn't work and she tried to get back together with my husband. He has already met me, but they stayed friends, mostly via chat, texting, since she lives 12 hours away. My husband was complaining about everything about me, my job, my depression, my cooking, but mostly about my weight. He was telling me how disgusting I was to him, how he even found it hard to share the same bed since I snored like a dog. He sent her pictures of me while sleeping, sometimes in underwear with comments about my belly, double chin, back boobs, etc. She found these pictures extremely amusing and she came up with the name White Whale. They both found it hilarious and now that is what they referred to me as. They don't flirt exactly or talk about being together or starting an affair, but they do say they miss each other and they reminisce about the time they were married. She's more flirtatious and he really enjoys it. Whatever he's telling her isn't what I have experienced with him. I don't disgust him. He tells me that he loves me all the time. We have great and passionate sex and the way he touches and makes love to me is so great he must be a really good actor if he was really and disgusted by me and he hates the few times we have to sleep apart he's lying and i don't know why he's doing it he's lying to one of us and i'm not sure if i want to know who he's lying to and why i decided to get out of this marriage and leave this behind me right now i'm acting like everything is normal but i have started looking for a new job at another city and a place to rent i also started with birth control pills in case something happens between us and i have talked to a lawyer to prepare the divorce and start the process once i'm gone one thing i'm not going to do is fall back into depression and weight gain i will not allow it what a waste of love he has been edit i can't believe i need to explain this about the birth control pills very simple explanation up until i went through his messenger i love and trusted this guy and we had great sex life and we were trying to conceive when i read that what he has written and the way he took pictures of me sleeping something happened inside me like i don't know this person in front of me anymore and i can't read his face and i don't trust him i don't know how long i'm gonna need to stay under the same roof as him and i don't know what his reaction would be if i refused to him under a long period of time with no real excuse i don't know what else he's capable of besides taking pictures of sleeping people i don't know if i in a moment of weakness succumbed to lust or if he for a moment could fool me that he actually loved me for all these reasons and many darker scenarios i have played in my head i'm taking extra precautions anyone with an iq of a chicken can understand that or so i hope thank you everyone for the support and i will update you when i know more about where i'm headed well at least he's given you a quick way to lose some dead weight what a freaking a-hole you'll be much better off without him just saying 40 pounds is easy to gain in that situation but 20 pounds is hard to lose you should be very proud i would suggest printing out the emails then leaving them on the kitchen counter with your house keys and wedding band when you leave. Leave while he's not there. If that's how he wants to behave, let him see that you left him because of it. That must be so heartbreaking to read. How could this person act one way about you and then turn to speak so ill or poorly of you to someone else? It just doesn't make any sense. Have you tried confronting him? Save the messages for divorce court. Sorry he did this to you. Start putting money away now. Peanut M&Ms are far superior than regular M&Ms and I'm tired of people saying otherwise. There's nothing to say. Peanut M&Ms are far superior for two reasons. One, it has the perfect ratio of saltiness and sweet and two, it's peanuts with chocolate. There's nothing more that needs to be said. Regular M&Ms are too concentrated when it comes to chocolate, and they're very bland in my opinion. This is all. Thank you for reading my rant at two in the morning. I hope you all have a good day. That's not how you spell crispy. Uh, that's not how you spell almond, all right? I'm allergic, bro. I literally die. I prefer the rice crisp ones. I was about to say this. I freaking love the crisp ones. Best M&M ever. Pretzel M&Ms will always have my heart. I don't like how the peanuts mask the intensity of the chocolate. To each their own. Mini M&Ms trump them all. Dot. Shove them up your butt because they are poop. Caramel M&Ms. Shrug. I hate my seven-year-old sister. I hate saying this, but I've reached the point where I can't even see her in front of me without losing my patience. She's been raised as a damn spoiled kid doing whatever she freaking wanted with my mother defending her behind the she's just a child and you're 19 excuse. She yells at my mother and threatens her, so does with me, but I don't stay quiet as my mom does. I always snap back. She screeches to get anything she wants and always does, even if that means f***ing me over. She gets into my room and steals my stuff and breaks it and then says my stuff moved itself to her room and my mother always looks away because she's just a child and if you yell at her you're psychologically abusing her i try to treat her calmly explaining carefully that her behavior towards my mother and me is not okay but she always doesn't <laughs> understand and keeps being the same little piece <laughs> of shit as always yesterday i reached my breaking point with her we have two hamsters well had two little precious fur balls one of them was mine bought with my own money and the other was bought by my mom for my sister since then i've been telling my mom that it wasn't a good idea to give my sister a living creature but she never listened my sister always grabbed her poor hammy in a harsh way shaking it playing with it as if it was a toy. I told her many times 
to stop treating the hamster that way, and it's my hamster, you don't have the right to touch it, I get as a response. Yesterday, my sister took poor animal's cage to her room without permission. Minutes later, she comes screeching and yelling that the hamster fell from the window. We live in a third floor flat. The poor thing agonized and died minutes later. The hamster fell from the window itself from a closed cage in a room which had a tightly closed window. I don't believe a f***ing word from that little liar. But then again, my mom justified the hamster's death, saying she's just a child. Then my sister went back into her room to play as if nothing happened after telling my mom to buy her another hamster. Edit, my mom believes my sister is not lying and the hamster threw itself out the window. Now I can't even look at my sister without feeling like I'm going to explode of anger. I hate her, and I know it's wrong to feel that towards a child, and I even feel like a bad person for hating her, but she's not going to change. My life has been <laughs> since the day she was born and nobody cared. Thanks for reading this far. Your sister commits war crimes. She's just a child. She's old enough to know how to treat pets. My four-year-old niece knows that. Your mother is failing that child and you. This kid is dangerous, bro. She's going to hurt people. Are you able to move out? No. At least not until I finish my degree at university and I'm in my first year. Tell your mom to get that kid straight or she's going to wake up one day with the seven-year-old holding a knife over her. Don't let your mom get a pet for her ever again. When you're out of university, get out of that house as quick as you can. Your sister has a real psycho behavior and if not corrected, she's going to kill something bigger. Stay safe. Animal abuse is where I draw the line. Just get out and never look back. Let your mother deal with that little shit. My husband screams while puking. It's horrible, but I get enraged when my husband is sick because of the way he pukes. He screams and gargles. I don't mean normal noises. I'm taking full on all out screaming. It's legitimately unnecessary. I'm talking to him about it and all he can say is it helps. It does not help at 3.30 a.m. when he's had too much to drink and I've woken up to the sounds of a grown man emptying his entireties into my toilet. I've never heard any other human being make as much noise when they're sick. SOS, man. SOS. I did say I love the interactions most of us are here. Y'all are hilarious and intellectual. My husband doesn't have a drinking problem. We rarely drink and he rarely actually gets sick from drinking, but when he does, it definitely is a phenomenon to behold. I vented on a venting page this morning because I was annoyed after being woken up to these crazy sounds at 4 a.m. and then listening to it for a few hours, I came to see that many other people have this problem and we've laughed about it together. So thank you. Duke Dip, if you're really nauseous and you just want to get it over with, lean over a garbage can or toilet and take a long, slow, deep stomach breath through your mouth. Let your mouth hang open the entire time, starts the drooling, and gets the job done in 30 seconds. No retching or gagging or dry heaves. The hurling wolf at midnight. My husband sounds like a velociraptor when he pukes. I don't even know how he manages to turn a stomach bug into a scene from Jurassic Park, but it was very unsettling the first time I heard it. After 16 years, I'm used to it now, and it just makes me laugh. This honestly sounds horrific. Ah! <laughs> I'm very sorry, but I just try to imagine the situation in my head in a way I can't figure out how I can let anything out while screaming. But at the same time, it's hilarious to imagine someone screaming into a toilet bowl. However, I do sympathize with you, and I hope you will find a solution for this. WTF? Was just asked out on a date by this girl, and I've never been on a date. She asked me if I had plans for Saturday, and I just played it cool and said nah. And then she asked me if I wanted to go to the movies. Now I'm here, and my anxiety is killing me as the day approaches. I've already thought about 7,000 things that can go wrong. I honestly just want to call and just cancel. Calm down, LOL. You're going to do amazing. Congrats on your movie date. Do you know which movie you're going to go see? Batman. Funny thing is, if you tell her you're stressing about watching a movie with her because she's cute and you don't want to act stupid, you win points. If you cancel, you lose points. If you hit zero points, she's no longer interested. Also, the points don't exist. Good luck, OP. Nah, don't cancel. You got this. Tell her you're nervous. It makes the situation so much easier for everyone. I'm 100% sure she's nervous as well, so if you break the ice, both of you win. It is totally normal to be nervous AF, so that's really the best way to go about it. Once you name it, it loses its horror. You got this. Don't cancel. Whatever you do, do not cancel. You can do this. Just found out my boyfriend got another girl pregnant. And you know what? I don't care. Sound like he's gonna be a dad. I'm just happy it ain't me he got pregnant. <laughs> Good luck to his baby mama though. She's gonna need it. He's upset that I'm happy about it. Told him congrats on his new family and to get out of my apartment. Fork his feelings. Gonna go have fun getting drunk at the beach tomorrow. Consider yourself lucky you found out who he really was now instead of 20 years of marriage and three kids later. You dodged a bullet. Enjoy those drinks. Sounds like you dodged a bullet there. Good for you. He has nerve to be upset. Set. We love to see trash taken out. My god, OP, your energy is contagious. Amazing response to all that nonsense. My cat died two years ago, and I kept this secret to his grave. When we first adopted him, we had no idea that our cat was going to grow up to a 31-inch long, 23-pound beast, so his name quickly was changed to Bubba. Bubba was an aggressive cuddler. Anytime you were reading a book, he would come over and plant himself directly between your head and your book. Several years before he died, there was a night where my wife and I were laying in bed. 
I honestly have no idea what I ate that day, but I had a case of particularly noxious gas. I happened to let a silent one go right as Bubba jumped on the foot of the bed. He walked up to the head of the bed. Every step he took helped push the fumes out towards the top of the covers. He reached the pillows and decided to curl up right between my wife and I, with his butt conveniently pointed towards her. It was then that the fumes got out and my wife instinctively blamed Bubba. She grabbed him off the bed, ejected him from the room, and closed the door. As she spent the next couple minutes complaining about the cat, I couldn't say anything. It was all I could do to keep from laughing about the cat getting the blame. Two years ago, Bubba died of a heart attack. He was walking across the family room and fell over dead instantly. I will always remember you, and I will never forget the time you took one for the team. Is that really taking one for the team? Because if anything, it sounds like you abandoned the cat to have the guilt. This is the cat of legends. There will be religions about him in 2,000 years. R.I.P. Bubba. Way to take one for the team. Brought a tear of laughter to my eye, possibly similar to Bubba's omission. I let my son believe he's a dinosaur because it helps him sleep better. My two and a half year old thinks he's a dinosaur. Like 24-7 acts like a dino. It started at about a year old when I made him a dinosaur hoodie for Halloween. He started pretending a lot and roaring at everyone. Then in transitioning from crib to bed, he picked out dinosaur sheets and it's all dinosaurs all the time from then on. He roars constantly and at total strangers. He has a whole dinosaur family of toys that follows him everywhere. He walks like a dino and tell me every morning what new species he is and gets really upset when I forget today's type. At first, I thought it was cute. Then after a week, I got concerned. Now, after a couple months, I have fully embraced it. With an active two-year-old, it's sometimes hard to get him to calm down and go to bed. But since the dinosaur awakening, he's gone to bed flawlessly so long as I pretend he is a long neck traveling to the Great Valley. Land Before Time reference for those that don't know. I spin this big story and he closes his eyes and gets so excited. It's his favorite thing in the world. My favorite thing in the world is hearing a quiet, whispered rawr. In response to my good night, I love you. He'll probably be upset one day when he discovers I've used his overactive imagination to trick him into sleeping, eating broccoli, walking faster on our hikes, etc. On the other hand, I have two months worth of super cute videos of him speaking dinosaur, so I think I'm okay with it. Lucky, I'm pretty sure my four-year-old thinks she's teenager. Wait until his future wife one day serves him broccoli and a deep memory is awakened. I used the gas card of an old job for three years to fuel up my car. Some years ago, I spent a year or so between jobs. One of these was installing slash removing insulation from people's attics. It was a complete crap job, but my buddy got me in the door and it actually did pay well. I ended up being there maybe two months tops. We worked locations within a hundred mile radius of the company site, so one of our daily routines was to fuel the truck up on the way out of the shop at the trucker fuel stop around the corner. We worked in teams of either two or three on job sites, and all of the employees were given fuel cards, so there was never any excuse for why we would be in a situation where we couldn't get gas. A few weeks after quitting, I realized I had forgotten to give them the card back. Another few weeks after that, I was driving in the general location one weekend and just for shits and giggles, went to the fuel stop to see if the card still worked. What do you know? It did. I then decided I was gonna wait until the next time I needed gas, then go to that same stop to fuel up again. I figured if I only used that location like all the other employees do, it wouldn't raise much suspicion when the bill came. This went on for about three years until one day the card stopped working. I confessed to my buddy shortly after that what I had been doing. He told me that all the fuel cards were basically just copies of the same card on one account, so they had no way of distinguishing any one specific usage. Also, the shop went out of business, so that's why the card stopped working. You know, one could say that you're the cause of the business going out, but eh, also, whatever, they gave you the card, they didn't shut it down. Who, who's to blame? Your fueling up all those years was what finally put them under. I personally knew a guy who did this, got busted, sued, and charged. Let's just hope that doesn't happen to our pal over there. Let's just let him get away with it, you know? Lied to get out of a school project and ended up stuck in therapy for a year. When I was a senior in high school, in the beginning of the school year, we had to do a project where we had to do a presentation and show how to do something step by step. I picked making chocolate chip cookies, so when I was going to present, I had to show a step by step on how to make them. So I had to bring in milk, eggs, bowls, etc. We had three weeks to plan for the project, but it was the day I had to present and I didn't prepare or bring anything. So as soon as I got 
got to school, I went into my English class and told my teacher I didn't have anything because mom and dad got into a fight two nights before, and my dad kicked us out, and we've been living in a hotel. She said it was okay, and that she would give me credit for my written part. The next week, I was in third period, I get called into the office. The school therapist was there and told me she wanted to talk to me. She asked me if everything was okay at home, and I didn't want to have to do my project and get caught lying, so I kept with the story that my dad kicked us out. I started crying, and the therapist told me she would like to see me once a week. So I went for my whole senior year once a week to therapy to avoid doing one project. Okay, I'm not saying you should do this, because it's not, like, the smartest idea, but if you make a bit, you've gotta commit. Let's have a group therapy session with your folks. Oh, no, nightmare, nightmare, nightmare. I'd drop out. I couldn't. Bro, all you had to do was make cookies. You had three weeks. Props on the commitment, though. That's the true life lesson. Honestly, like, cookies are not that hard to make. Like, maybe it takes two hours? It's not hard. You should go into acting. You know, since it did pay off, maybe you are pretty good. I always BS my way through school, and most recently college. I've always hated reading long texts when I'm not interested on the topic. So, when I was in high school and the teachers gave an assignment related to reading, like in English class when we had to read Macbeth, Of Mice and Men, etc., I would just read chapter summaries and do the respective essays and tests. My lowest grade was like a B. And so on. Or this other time when we were watching a documentary for social studies class and the teacher told us that we had to write the key ideas in a piece of paper. I remember that it was boring, so I was just on my phone and every once in a while I would write some ideas that I heard. I didn't write more than 10. And when my teacher read it, he said, this is one of the best summaries I've read. Then someone told me that this would not work in college when you really had to study. Nope. Still works. I'm taking a communications class where we have to read a long and boring textbook and write a one-page summary in our own words. For this, I just Google the title of every chapter and get some ideas from different websites and write my summary. So far, I've earned A's in these summaries and another A in the first exam. Sometimes I regret it because I know I'm not really learning anything, but I believe studying shouldn't be the only thing you care for in life. So I'm not going to stress out about the classes I don't like, and that's not required for my degree. And I'm going to continue doing this for as long as I can. Once again, it's not the most advised tactic, but, you know, if it works, it works. The only time this may be detrimental to you is when you start taking classes directly related to your major and are out of your intro classes. Otherwise, work smart, not hard. Well, you're taking a communications class. That's why it's still working. I did the same stuff in high school too, but now I'm in engineering and it really does not work. Just wait till you start work. That's where the real BS kicks in. In fifth grade, I pushed a girl in a monkey cage enclosure and ripped the skin of her arms off. I'm sorry, what? I attended an elementary school that is near to a small park where there were about 10 exotic animals, like hawks, snakes, and monkeys. It's basically a small zoo. We usually wait there for our school service to arrive. We were just sitting around the birdcage-like enclosure of this aggressive monkey that we're making fun of and waiting for the school service to arrive. When the school service arrived, we all stood up and raced to the school service front seat. I knew that I won't be first, so I pushed the girl who was in front of me. She tripped close to the cage. The monkey got startled and went crazy instantly. The monkey grabbed her arm and ripped her skin off in one bite. It is the gnarliest thing I ever saw. Her face turned pale white, I think because of the shock and loss of blood. We carry her out of the park while she and some of us were stained with blood. An old guy who is working in the park sees us and immediately carried her and called an ambulance. The day after that, the monkey is not in the park anymore, and we have a new school service driver. Oh my god, like, I get it's an accident, but oh, that is the worst possible accident. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is right. Monkeys are effing scary. I've never understood why some people find them cute. Full disclosure, I agree with this guy. I the Monkeys freak me out. I don't, like, they, I don't, I don't understand why I, they freak me out, but they do. Harambe Jr. If anything, this monkey was way worse than Harambe because it actually ripped the skin off the little girl. I got drunk at work, stole cheesecake, and ended up passing out in the dressing room. So this happened a few years back. I worked for a high-end clothing store at a stock clerk slash order pole. One week, they asked me if I would be willing to work the night shift from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. These were very unusual hours, and it was me and two other co-workers required to stay. I had another job lined up at the time, so my commitment for the current one was not very strong to begin with. I decided I wanted to make my night a little more interesting, so before I work, I stopped and bought a bottle of whiskey, knowing that my boss would not be working and it would be very relaxed. I ended 
up drinking a lot more than I should have. I'm great at handling my alcohol, and my friends will tell me that I don't seem even slightly drunk, when on the inside I know exactly how drunk I am. So I pounded a bottle of whiskey in my car right before going in. About an hour and a half into my shift, I was stumbling and knocking stuff over. Luckily, none of my coworkers saw this. I started getting hungry, and I knew that on the third floor, there was a little bakery slash restaurant that the store owns. I'm not sure why they don't lock the bakery up, but I thought it would be a good idea to go check it out. I ended up hopping over the counter and getting into all of their cheesecakes. I had about four slices of four different types of cheesecake, and I also helped myself to some Sprite. I was so happy, but I started to feel really tired after. I ended up going into one of the dressing rooms and completely passed out on one of the benches inside. I woke up about two and a half hours later with my name blaring over the loudspeaker. I thought for sure someone had seen me and reported me. I got to one of my coworkers and they were saying, where were you? Where did you go? We've been looking all over for you. I told them I got sick and I was puking in the bathroom and needed to go home. No more questions were asked and I was sent home that night. Never ended up getting caught. You know, it's a little unfair when I see stories like this because I know that their luck stat is just maxed out and I'll never get there. Where are you? Cheesecake. I mean, it'd be a valid reply. Getting drunk and eating cheesecake would probably make me puke. Well, that's because you've got a little baby stomach and you can't, you can't eat anything. So I pounded a bottle of whiskey in my car right before going in. Okay. That is a bit of a jarring sentence because how do you just pound a bottle of whiskey? Like that, that kills you, doesn't it? I fed my boyfriend and his friends dog food. I was in high school. It was the late 80s. I was emancipated already, so I had my own apartment. I also had pay channels because the landlord had a package deal that included my TV. A guy started really hitting on me, whom I really rather liked. It didn't dawn on me that he had only started doing so after I got my own apartment, which meant time away from his restrictive home environment for him. Well, he started spending time at my house, then he started bringing his friends to watch my pay channels with him and ignoring me. The first time they ate my food, I had cooked myself some crockpot chili for the entire week. It was literally all my meals for the week, to be divvied up into the freezer and eaten as needed. I asked nicely for them not to do it again and explained clearly that it was all my food for the week. They did it again the next weekend when I made myself a lasagna, and this time I yelled at them. My erstwhile boyfriend then slapped me and told me to knock it off. I was interrupting their show, you know. I was rather outraged that not one guy, not one, so much as batted an eye about it. Instead of breaking up with him immediately, though, I hatched a plot. I bought two cans of Alpo wet dog food and a bag of egg noodles. I made goulash with it in the crock pot and let them eat it. After that, I brought the landlord's dog up. I carefully let him lick each and every bowl, because of course, they didn't wash their dishes after they stole my food either. I placed them into the cabinet as nonchalantly as I could, pretending this was how I always did dishes. I then answered their question about what was the recipe of my delicious food and placed the two open cans of Alpo on the table. Needless to say, they never came back. I took great relish in spreading it around school that they not only ate literal dog food, but they loved it enough to want the recipe. God, the 80s are just, oh, yikes, just hitting women? Yeah, I guess. I do think you should have just dropped him right then and there, but I do appreciate the scheming, really figuring out how to get back at him. A-holes deserved it, and I hope your boyfriend didn't hit you after you told him about the food. I would hope that that didn't happen, considering they didn't say it in their story. I'm hoping that's the case. Today I learned dog food is delicious. Well, you can only know that if you try it. Are you saying you tried dog food? What's wrong with you? Oh, how the tables turn. Realistically, she probably could have turned the tables by hitting him back, but also the 80s, I don't know if that would have worked out. Cop pulled me over, and I called 911 and lied to get out of going to jail. When I was 19, I was running late to work in my tiny POS economy car and on fumes of gas. I didn't come to a complete stop on a right turn. Lights behind me, so I pull over. I know I've barely got any gas at all and was almost to a gas station, hence why I rolled through a stop a little, trying not to have the car die. At the time, around 1995, a new digital phone had come out called Voice Stream, now T-Mobile, and their whole big thing was the phones were digital and not cellular. They were the first phones with caller ID, and one of the big things the salesman had said over and over was since it was digital, the signal can't be triangulated or traced. Not that I cared, but it stuck in my mind. Well, as I give the cop my license, registration, and insurance card, I got an idea. I knew if I was late 
late to work, I was going to lose my job. They were super strict there. So I get an idea, and right after I hand the papers to the cop and he's walking back to his cruiser, I called 911 and tell the operator I just saw a guy with what looked like a shotgun walk into a 7-Eleven that was about two blocks away. I confirmed the address, then I hung up. About 30 seconds later, the cop comes sprinting to my car and hands me all my stuff and rushed says, come to a complete stop next time, then peels off to the direction of the store. Pushed my car to the gas station that I'd almost made it to and felt pretty pleased with my ingenuity. Look, I'm not condoning this behavior, but if you're quick enough, you could probably do this. Nice work. I know a gentleman who called in bomb threats to the airport back in the late 70s because he was going to be late. All flights postponed or canceled. God, the 70s had to be crazy. I just casual bomb threats? Yeah, no biggie. My little cousin cracked my iPhone XS Mac screen, made my aunt pay $329 knowing I have Apple Care, and it only cost me $29. My little cousins are the biggest poops in the world, and my aunt pretty much lets them do whatever they want without consequence. They were roughhousing and knocked my phone off the counter, shattering the screen. My closest Apple store is about two hours away, and it's a huge inconvenience for me to drive there, not to mention the extra gas. So instead of explaining this to her, she's the kind of person who doesn't care about things that don't affect her directly, I told her it was $329 to fix, which is true if I didn't have Apple Care. She wrote me a check for $329 and I only had to pay $29 and I pocketed the extra $300. I consider that my non-disclosed inconvenience fee. I wish I had this level of scam quality because my lord, that's just such a perfect scam. I mean, it was still basically that much if you had to pay for Apple Care. They have a point. $300 was the fee for the emotional damage they caused you. <laughs> I overcharged over 5,000 people. Back in high school, I used to work the concession stand. In my school, the booth was a little folding table where I would sell water, pop, and chips. To anyone that was a visiting team, I would charge 25 to 50 cents more on the item they wanted to buy, and I would keep it. I ended up making somewhere around $3,000 doing this for my high school career, and no one ever found out because I didn't charge anyone from the home team the same amount. While I don't fully agree with your business strategy, it did work out and you were in high school, so it's fine. Joke's over, buddy. Give me back my 50 cents. That's how the mafia works. The snack mafia. I cheated to get my bachelor's and my master's degree. Honestly, I feel like a lot of people do it, so let's see your reason. Yeah, I cheated. I didn't write any of my papers. I didn't do any of the work myself. I stole a lot of work. Took only classes anyone I knew did and used all their work for it with minor changes. I made it through six years and got two degrees. I got a scholarship out of high school by cheating. I cheated during the SAT. I cheated most of my life. And I feel a little bad, but not really. Thanks to a couple real ones for holding it down for me. Wouldn't have made it this far without you. Oh, so yeah, you just completely plagiarized. That's a little extreme, but if it worked, I guess. I had a friend in college mooch off me, and he had a better career afterwards. Now that one, that that one kind of hurts since they actually did the work and they're still not getting great jobs. What college did you go to? Please state your first and last name and date of birth. They just want to look up your academic records. They're not going to report you or anything. I gave a lactose intolerant customer dairy on purpose. I know this sounds weird, but when I worked at Starbucks, there was a regular customer that was very difficult and rude. I was warned of this customer on my first day of training. She came in every morning and would try to rush the workers on doing their job and makes other customers feel uncomfortable. Three months into working, she came in one morning and caused absolute hell. She was complaining about her drink while one of my coworkers was making the drink. As soon as she got it, she accidentally spills it and asked for a completely different drink. I was so fed up. She wanted a frappuccino. She went to the bathroom while we were making the new order. I switched with my coworker and made the drink. Instead of almond milk, I made the frappuccino with regular milk. The drink was ready by the time she left the bathroom. She takes the drink and takes a sip and didn't complain. Five hours later, she calls the Starbucks from the hospital, and I was the one who picked up. She got in a car accident trying to rush to a bathroom. She said she shitted her pants. I couldn't be any more happier that she was safe, but got her karma. You know what? Understandable. If you have an unruly customer that thinks they own the place, you can, you can dabble in a bit of dubious behavior. I faked my resume, and now I'm in the shit throwaway account for obvious reasons. Since I started high school, school, my parents stopped checking in on my grades and their mentality was basically, we don't care as long as 
you get into a good university. And they've carried on this mentality to when I got into college, and they didn't really check on my grades and gave me free reign as long as I majored in the subject they wanted and graduated on time with good grades. Well, basically what happened was that I failed my first year and had to switch my major. I didn't tell them and they didn't ask, so I thought as long as I got myself together and not drop out, I'll be fine. One day, out of the blue, last semester, my dad asked me to write up a resume. I panicked and wrote up a resume, but changed the GPA and major, and made up some stuff and thought I saved myself. Well, this winter break, my dad dropped it on me and told me he knows people in a big company. He gave them my resume and everything, and wanted me to intern there. So I am effed. They'll probably figure it out and let my dad know, and I'll probably get disowned or something. And best case scenario, they don't check and give me the job, and I have to live with the guilt that I got a job that I didn't deserve because of nepotism. This stuff is depressing AF, and I'm typically an easygoing guy, but this whole ordeal is giving me anxiety like nothing else. I feel like an ass for failing and lying to my family about it, and now I'm on the verge of being blown, and I thought maybe making a post here will make me feel better, but I honestly don't know. To my knowledge, a lot of people lie on resumes, like saying they have a degree in this and that just to get the job, but with your parents so close to it, yeah, you're kind of effed. This is gonna be like waxing your ball sack. Bit of an odd analogy, but I, I understand it. Fake it until you make it. Seemingly, they've made it, but they just have to, you know, keep faking it. When I was younger, I saw a lady drop a hundred dollars. I picked it up and used all of it on Yu-Gi-Oh cards right in front of her. Basically, she dropped the hundred dollar bill in one of the aisles of this game store. I picked it up and I remember wanting to give it back, but I was there to get Yu-Gi-Oh cards. I had recently lost all my good cards to my friend in a bet, so this was a miracle of sorts to make a solid comeback. So I kept it. I thought the woman had left the store, so I went to go purchase my cards. Right as I gave my money to the cashier, she walks up behind me, watching me buy my hundred dollars worth of Yu-Gi-Oh cards. This isn't a normal thing to do. She said nothing though, and I left before she went to go buy her items, so I didn't have to see the look on her face when she realized. There is no doubt in my mind that once she realized she was a hundred dollars short, she would make the assumption it was the kid in front of her in line, who spent a hundred on cards. As much as you should have given the money back, I, I, you know, kids will be kids? I once nicked 20 pounds off my parents to buy Yu-Gi-Oh cards. The addiction hits everyone at some point. Admittedly, I was a bit of a Yu-Gi-Oh head, but I never just had the money to spend, so the addiction never caught on. <laughs> the intense feeling when she was right behind you. Oh, it had to have been like a horror movie, like hearing a whole soundtrack just feeling her eyes on the back of your head. This is why I joined this sub. I'm honestly surprised the lady didn't make a comment about your balls dragging on the floor. Well, uh, I, I know what you're saying, but if she did say that, she'd be in jail, so. For three years, I switched my partner's tea in the morning because I couldn't deal with his fake snobbery. When my ex and I started dating, I used to make him a morning cup of tea as a cute gesture, and it stuck for the three years that we were together. It's a nice small thing you can do to make someone's day, and it's a nice way to get to know how someone likes things doing. So my morning tea used to be any old tea bag, Yorkshire tea if it was an option, a splash of milk, and the first cup always had a teaspoon of sugar. Every cup after was just tea and milk. My ex, however, had to have a very specific ritual. Thompson's Punjana tea, a teaspoon of milk, and absolutely no sugar. He was adamant that he could tell in a heartbeat when his morning cup of tea, and at the age of 33, he's never liked any other tea other than Fortnum and Mason's Royal Blend. So, in the beginning, when he would stay at mine, I entertained this notion and used to make his morning tea the way he liked. Thompson's Punjana tea, a teaspoon of milk, and absolutely no sugar. He would always thank me and tell me that I make the best cups of tea, and it was nice. Three times a week didn't kill me, and it was a sweet gesture. Fast forward three months, when he would spend nearly every day of the week at mine, but not moved in. He was very demanding of his morning ritual, and being a student, I couldn't keep affording to buy that brand of tea. Besides, what was wrong with PG Tips or any non-branded supermarket tea? Tea is tea, after all. So I used to always make his cup of tea with any tea bag, a teaspoon of milk, and no sugar. I was always sure to only make it when he was in the shower or still in bed, so he could never catch me out. And initially, he was dubious, and he was always asking to make sure it was Thompson Punjana tea. He used to call it by its full name to emphasize how good it was. After a few trials of different teas, I finally found that sweet point where he couldn't taste the difference. I would drink it with him and 
as he sipped, would go on about how you can taste the quality and that there is really no other tea like it. When we moved in with each other, it was a lot harder to disguise the fact that I was keeping the same box of tea and just filling it with regular tea bags, so I had to be a bit more clever. At the time, I was studying at college, so I was in control of weekly food shops and only really wanted to go twice a week to minimize costs so we had more to spend on meals out. I used to buy one bag of his tea and two bags of mine a week and keep them in the drinks cupboard. When it came to making his in the morning, I would take one of his tea bags and put it in my pocket, give him one of mine instead, and I used to give my tutors at college his tea to drink during the day. He would always comment that I run out quicker of my tea bags because of the quality and that with Punjana, one bag is enough for a considerable amount of time. Little did he know. This went on for a couple of years and I never told anyone about it out of fear that he would find out, as after all, he really couldn't tell, so why ruin the fun? It was saving me money and it was sort of amusing. I never let him make a cup of tea unless I was away, so he never really had to find out. After we split up, we remained good friends and I've spent some time with him too in our old flat. Every time I visit, he always asks me to make a cup of tea the way I used to for old time's sake, because everyone he's been with or dated after me can never make it taste the way I did. He even says that when he makes it himself with Punjana that he could never make it taste right and that I was some sort of special tea maker. I still haven't told him. I can feel the Britishness in this post. Yeah, didn't want to bring it up because I mean it's obvious what Americans really drink tea. Tea is tea. A certain island nation just died. If you post this in r slash tea, there is going to be some riots happening. Do people actually care this much about tea? I guess I'm just uninformed, but I, it feels weird. When I nannied, I would read the journal of the mom. I was only 20 years old and I nannied for this little baby boy. The mom seemed off. She would sleep the entire time I was there in the mornings or go on three hour runs or sometimes would just go about her business around the house, completely ignoring me. One time we both sat in the living room while the baby was sleeping in his room. I was reading a book, studying, and she sat there eating McDonald's and watching her show. She did not say a word to me the entire time. Well, one day when she was out, I snooped around and found her journal. I read the whole thing, then got sad for her. She was so unhappy in her marriage and in life. I ended up working for her for three years and we became close. But that first year was so uncomfortable and awkward. In retrospect, it seems very obvious that she was suffering from post-pregnancy depression. Gonna say, not the coolest thing to invade their privacy like that, but I guess it worked out and you're friends? I call fake orders in to a pizza place to get free pizzas. My husband works at a popular pizza chain. We'll call it piece of butt for the sake of rhyming. If orders are messed up or carry out orders don't show, the employees get to take the food home. Sometimes I order pizzas under fake names and give the numbers of local businesses as callback numbers and then purposefully never show up to pay for it. Nine times out of ten, my husband brings home the pizza I ordered. This is sinful pizza, yes, I know. But sin pizza tastes better than honest pizza inexplicably. As a pizza boy myself, I can't confirm or deny if this works, but it does depend on the manager if they'll let you take the pizza, because sometimes they can be weird about it. I got fired from a pizza place when I was in college for giving a burnt pizza to a homeless old lady. It's so awesome to be punished for doing a relatively good deed. The secret ingredient is crime, and it tastes so savory and pizza-like. I lied to a blind neighbor and told him I moved away. Many years ago, I was standing on one of my balconies when a taxi driver was obnoxiously blowing his horn out front and yelling for a blind man to walk towards my voice from his own townhouse. That direction was toward traffic. My roommate and I went down and helped him to the taxi and scolded the driver for being so rude. I made the mistake of giving the blind neighbor my phone number so that I could give him a ride in the future. Then the phone calls came and never stopped. And when I gave him a ride, he would ask for various detours. I'm very calculated by nature. If he had told me beforehand where he wanted to go, it would be cool. But no, we'd be driving along and he'd throw in two to three extra places on each ride. And it came to be every day that he wanted rides. And he'd even call me to remind me to give him a ride. Not that was ever late or backed out. Finally, I had enough. So I gauged how blind he was. His response was that he was blind as a bat. A week or two after he said that, I told him I had a job interview in the next city. A week after that, I told him I got the job and was moving away in a month. After I moved away, it was strange as hell walking by him and 
silence as he stood on the sidewalk. Kind of a morally gray situation, but I understand why you did it, because seemingly the guy was taking advantage of your kindness. I bet he could smell you and knew. Okay, not all blind people are daredevil, alright? I hope he doesn't see this post. Ah, we're just, we're just getting the easy ones, huh? Plot twist, he isn't blind, but is going along with your lie to save face on his lie. While it is possible, it probably isn't. You know, I'm just glad everybody was able to get that off their chest. Indirectly broke a dryer at a laundromat, then gave a fake name and number to the owner. Last night was doing laundry at the local laundromat. I had three washers going at once. Now normally you fill the wash, add detergent, add quarters, and select the cycle. When I press the cycle button normally, the previously selected cycle button pops out, kinda like a switch. I didn't notice it, but it happened with this washer. So the washer had two cycle buttons pressed. After half hour goes by and washer one and two are done, but washer three is still on the first part of the cycle. Now, it being 9 p.m. and with the placing closing at 10, I decided to take the unfinished soaking wet clothes and put them in the dryer. About two minutes into the dryer, the laundry attendant said I broke the dryer because of the wet clothes. She took my wet clothes and put it in a machine that just spins the clothes dry and then put them back in the dryer. She asked for my name and phone number, so I wrote down Trevor LaHaye and some random collection of 10 digits. Those of you who watch Trailer Park Boys will understand. So as the last dryer is finishing, the owner comes in and asks me what happened. He couldn't believe that Washer 3 didn't spin dry my clothes and was stuck in the same cycle for 1.5 hours until I had to physically show him how all the other washers work the same except for Washer 3. He still even tried to spin it on me for breaking the dryer because I didn't tell the attendant about the washer. So anyway, he grabbed the piece of paper with my fake name and number and said that he'll give me a call tomorrow, today, to see how much the dryer is going to cost to be fixed or replaced. LOL. F off. I think that's what they call the cost of doing business. I can't believe they would try to make you pay, scumbags. At least at the start, it kind of makes sense like, hey, you broke our dryer, please help us replace it. But after they found out that it's still kind of their fault, um, yeah, they don't get to ask you to pay for it. You broke the microwave by putting something too cold in it. You broke the fridge by putting warm leftovers in it. Yeah, how dare you put wet clothes in a clothes dryer? Ugh. I entered a stranger's house to avoid a DUI. How are these people getting in other people's homes? I live in Australia. Not sure how it works in the rest of the world, but I was on my provisional driver's license as a teenager. We call them P plates. And when you are on that, you cannot have any alcohol in your blood whatsoever. I stayed at my mate's place one night and he had some beers to drink. I had two knowing I had to drive the next day and was gonna stop, but he convinced me to have another. So I did. The next day I got in my car to drive home and as I was turning a corner, there was a couple police doing a RBT, random breath test, and I panicked. I knew full well I'd have a little bit of alcohol in me and that's enough to lose my license for a couple months. I had just left school and gotten a really good job and if I got a drink driving charge, I would have to rely on my parents to drive me there, which wouldn't work out as they both have jobs. I panicked and turned right onto another street. I drove halfway down the road thinking I had gotten away with it, but one of the cars suddenly turned around the corner and blasted the siren. I pulled over and the cop came to my window. Cop, can you explain to me why you just avoided an RBT? Instead of explaining to the cop why and just taking my punishment, I decided to lie. Me? I wasn't trying to avoid it. I live down here. Cop, whereabouts do you live? Me? Just over there. Cop, well, you wouldn't mind if I follow you and watch you enter your house for proof, do you? Kind of pooped myself, but agreed. He got in his car and I drove into a driveway halfway down the street and walked up to the door. My current plan was just to explain to whoever's at the door what's going on and hope he lets me inside. I walked up and knocked, but no one answered. Then I looked over my shoulder at the cop and turned just to open the door, and it was unlocked. I walked inside and shut the door. I was really scared for if whoever lived there was going to walk out and see me and scream, but no one did. I stayed at the door, peeking out the window at the cop, and he left after about 10 minutes. I waited another 10 minutes before walking down and driving off again with a big sigh of relief. Not here to condone drink driving or anything. I made a mistake and it was wrong. Just sharing this story. I think if I managed to skirt past the law that hard, that might make me believe in God. The amount of luck here is staggering. For real, you must have like used a cheat code or something, because I've never seen a luck stat so high. This is crazy. My knees would have been shaking. Yeah, if I were in this situation, I'd be so like nervous and scared. I would have honestly just admitted what I did to the cop because I'm a baby. You thought 
thought you'd still have alcohol in your blood after three beers the night before? LOL. Admittedly, I'm not too sure how long it takes for alcohol to leave your system, but three beers the night before really wouldn't have done anything to you. I shoplifted over $6,000 worth of clothing in one stint. This was almost 10 years ago. I was a sales associate as a teen at a well-known chain retail skate store. It was a cool job, but my store manager sucked. Just rude and aggressive all the time. Bullied the staff every day. I rocked it as a salesperson. I doubled my goals almost daily. Always at least met them. One day, the store manager got our numbers for the quarter. We were a little behind where we should have been, but there were also two new associates who weren't carrying their weight. Store manager blamed me for the numbers and accused me of giving discounts to people and allowing others to shoplift. I had never, I had never done either of those things. I was livid. So, one night, with a group of four friends or so, one of which used to work at the store with me, we came up with a plan to raid the place to give the store manager something to actually complain about. So, I went into my shift on a Sunday morning, knowing the assistant manager would be hung over. I convinced him to take a nap out back and that I wouldn't tell if he let me claim the sales for the day. He didn't care about anything, so it was an easy yes. Cue my friends coming in, acting as customers with their beach bags as I'm working with regular customers on the floor alone. A customer, friend, would bring their purchase to the counter to ring out and have the security tags removed and then immediately go into the changing room and bag it. Bring it to their car, wait 20 minutes, do it all over again. We all had lists of items we wanted, and I had mine piled on the counter ready to be taken. In one hour, we completed the list and my friends left. The assistant manager came back from his nap oblivious. I wrapped up my shift and went home. We divided up the clothing and celebrated. Never got caught. I put my notice in the next day, and that was that. Old friend from work told me when the next quarterly report came out, after I quit, the numbers were so bad from shrink, inventory of clothing missing with no money to show for it, the store manager got demoted. Was it wrong? Yes. Would I do it again? No. Do I regret it? Not even a little bit. This reminds me of a heist right out of GTA. I sort of see your point, just with less guns and death. Don't get me wrong, I'm judging you, but I'm also impressed. I stole thousands of dollars in change over two years working at McDonald's. When I was 16, I got a job at McDonald's. I hated making food and working front counter. I always asked to work drive through window, taking money at the first window. This was before credit cards, so everyone paid in cash. All I would do is keep a quarter or dime of almost everyone's change I gave back. I would put that extra quarter or dime in a special spot in the register. Once I got five or ten worth of change, I would dump the change into the right spot and pocket a ten or five. Some nights I would leave with over 50 bucks in cash. A lot to a 16-year-old me. No one ever caught on. Only twice I can remember people telling me I gave them the wrong amount of change back. I would just act like a dumb kid who miscounted. I don't know how nobody at work caught on because I always had a ton of change at the end of the day. This is called shortchanging, and it's illegal. But if I found out a kid did this to me, I honestly wouldn't even be mad. My change always ends up in couch cushions anyways. Well, you're perfectly suited to run a big business. Anybody who is pissed about this better hate Domino's for delivery fees. The biggest crime of delivery fees at any delivery job is that it does not go to the delivery driver. It is not a tip, it is just some extra money that the business wanted. As a child, I copied a poem from a book and won first place in a poetry contest. When I was in the third grade, I was very into reading slash writing and often stayed up far past my bedtime reading anything within my comprehension level that I could get my hands on. We had a stack of children's encyclopedias I loved on all sorts of topics, dinosaurs, the planets, world history, etc., including one of stories slash poems. One poem stood out in particular. It was about solitude in nature and really struck a chord with me. Because I loved the poem so much, I copied it down into a journal I had of my own writing and passages slash poems I found inspiration in. Because I was so young, talking single digits here, it never occurred to me to write down the author or anything, especially not in my own journal. A few weeks went by and my mom had stumbled upon journal while cleaning my room. She read the poem and assumed it was original writing. She approached me about it that night and was so proud of it. Like any eight-year-old, I wanted my mom's approval and pride, so I didn't tell her I had actually found the poem in a book. I didn't think it would be a big deal, and she was so proud. Fast forward a month or two, my mom is reading the Sunday paper and sees a poetry contest for young people. She immediately thinks of my poem and insists I enter. That afternoon, she had my dad drive us to his office so she could type it up before home computers. She sends a copy into the
the newspaper, and, of course, because it's an eight-year-old's name on an adult's published poem, it wins the first prize in my age group. My parents are so happy with me, and I feel so incredibly guilty. Within the next month, the poem and my picture are ran on the front page of the arts section in the paper. I'm invited to read the poem as part of an award ceremony for all the contest's participants. Of course, I go because my mom wanted us to, and why wouldn't I? I get a small award, a ribbon, and maybe a gift card? I don't remember. What I do remember is feeling so incredibly guilty. I have spent more sleepless hours over this poem than I can count. A few years later, we learn about plagiarism in school, and I feel as though I'm being personally called out. I remember tearing out the book's page with the poem, ripping it up and throwing it away, wrapped in an unused sanitary napkin because I was so afraid anyone would find out. It's been 20 years since that award ceremony, and even though I realize it was a childhood mistake that isn't even that large, I still can't quite shake the guilt. I mean, like, you were eight. I think it's fine, you know? Like, who's gonna find out now? As a kid, I traced a picture from Cartoon Network magazine, sent it into Cartoon Network magazine, and then won first place in their art competition. I mean, really, that might be Cartoon Network's fault because they they had the picture in the magazine. They should have been able to see how traced it was. Well, these are the things that keep you up at night. I used to charge a kid a made-up fat tax. A long time ago, I was a high schooler at a boarding school. I was a decent kid in the eyes of the teachers and school administration. In fact, they liked me so much that throughout my time there, I was able to rise through the student ranks. I became a prefect, then I became the head boy. And at one point, I had passed training that allowed me to run my own sports sessions or event where I was supervising younger and even a few older kids. This was just basic training for first aid, situational awareness, etc. At one point, the school had so much trust in me that I was allowed to leave the school premises alone in the afternoons. This was huge, and very few students had this privilege. In typical fashion, as soon as I received the privilege, I began abusing my power as a free man. The school was very adamant on getting us balanced meals, so we weren't allowed to get food delivered. All delivery vehicles were refused entrance. Having the privilege of leaving the premises meant that I I didn't have to order junk food and risk getting caught. I could simply go out to any fast food joint and bring food back with me. It all started out as an exclusive club. Myself and my friends were munching on McDonald's and KFC as the plebeians were having the filthy, healthy cafeteria food. Then I was offered something I couldn't refuse. Money. Not long after, I had built a whole operation for bootlegging junk food into the school. We had cutoff times for orders, a priority list for regular customers, extra fees for late orders, and even a spreadsheet for keeping a record of orders, payments, and profits. This smuggling was next level. We were organized, knew all the fire exits, where to walk to avoid corridor cameras, and how to pack the food so that it's unnoticeable when walking in. Mostly used sports bags with a thin layer of clothes. The teachers knew something was going on. There was food wrappers everywhere, but no one knew how it came in. Business was booming, and I was making profits of $50 a day for three to four days a week, but it wasn't enough. I was hungry for more. There was a fat kid that ordered regularly, so I pulled the most a-hole move you could do to your best customer. I started charging two times the price for his orders, and I would hide behind a BS moral barrier claiming we were doing this for his own good, since we learned in economics that increased prices reduced demand, and so he would be eating less and he would lose weight. The kid saw straight through the BS, but in the end, he couldn't resist it and continued ordering from me. Mahmoud D., if you're reading this, I'm sorry. Sorry. All right, so when is the Netflix series coming out? Because this is juicy. Abusing your powers and making a profit? So I guess you became a successful politician? Prefects and head boys exist outside of Hogwarts? I know, I know it's hard to believe, but Britain is a real place. This is the guy you go to when you want a heist planned out. For real, I honestly can't believe that you actually did, like, spreadsheets to track your profits. Like, you're actually doing business. <laughs> I leave fake parking tickets on cars that deserve real ones. I ordered a batch of them off Amazon and leave them wherever. Sometimes, if nobody is around, I make an effort and fill in all the details on it to freak them out before they get to the bottom and see it's a fake. Sometimes, I just write something dumb in the comments and leave the rest blank. I've left them on cars at my university that aren't technically illegally parked and on cars that are parked in no parking zones at my grocery store. I especially do it when somebody is parked in a handicapped spot that's not supposed to. No plate or hang tag. Local laws are sketchy on this. Some would argue it's misrepresenting itself as official and therefore illegal, but at the bottom of them, 
and they say they're fake. So others would argue the worst they could get me on is littering if the police actually cared enough to do something. Well, as we all know, the cops will only do something if they're bored enough. The fact that they sell them on Amazon. Yeah, I might actually have to look into that just for some mild trickery. Put your PayPal info there and see how many people pay you. It can be done. Should put one of those fake folded hundred dollar bills that tell you to find Jesus near the car as well. Hit them with a double whammy. I feel like that's just like a purely evil combo to do. I use my roommate's face towel to clean up his pee. He still hasn't noticed. I go to college in Midwest United States. I live in a dorm and have a roommate who shares a bathroom with me. He's not from the United States and seems a little nervous to talk to anybody who isn't from his home country. The first few weeks of college, I started to notice pee on the toilet seat. No big deal. I cleaned it up. After about the 10th time, I asked him if he could stop peeing on the toilet seat or if he does, wipe it up. He said okay and went on his day. About three months later, I started to notice pee all over the floor, toilet seat, and all around the toilet. Worse than before. I used my own toilet paper and started going through it very quickly, so it was getting expensive. I ended up walking over to his side of the counter and grabbing one of his extra towels. I've been using it to clean pee for about one month now, and I've definitely noticed a change in color due to the urine, and the fact that I've never seen him wash it. I feel bad about it, but what he's doing is disgusting, and I've tried to tell him to stop many times. Should I feel sorry and stop? Uh, you know, I would say you could find a different towel to use, maybe not that. No. He needs to wash his towels and wipe his piss up. That is a pretty good point. I still don't think you should be doing it to his face towel. Next time, leave it on the floor. Message sent. I changed my grade senior year of high school with the principal in the room. It was senior year of high school, and we were doing a partnered assignment in environmental science, tracking the river behind the school to find its source. There was an odd number of students, and I was okay with working alone. That day, the principal was observing the teacher, evaluating her performance. My teacher trusted me and gave me her laptop to do the assignment, and asked if I would show the principal what we were doing. I agreed and quickly finished my assignment. The principal and teacher were standing by the door chatting, so I opened the Power School app. There it is. All my friends' grades, including mine, staring at me in an Excel-style format. I noticed copious amounts of zeros by my name, dragging my grade down somewhere in the low 70s. I was a minimal effort high schooler. I quickly changed most of the zeros to 70s or 60s. This way, it wouldn't look too suspicious. My heart was racing as I saved the updated grades and didn't tell anyone for a few years, including my best friend slash brother. I never got caught, and I still grin thinking about it six years later. I mean, your teacher practically gave you the golden ticket. They should have logged out of it if they were giving you their laptop. It ain't much, but it's not honest, lol. Part of your education is learning how to navigate the system, weighing the consequences and taking opportunities when they present themselves. You didn't harm anyone else by boosting your points, but he ain't a real friend for not changing his friend's grades, too. That is a good point. Why didn't you go ahead and help your buddies out? You had the chance. I stole my friend's folder in third grade, and looking back, I deserve to get sent to a mental hospital for what I did. A little backstory to showcase little me. Parents divorced in second grade, and something snapped inside me. Every minor inconvenience in my life became worthy of a tantrum. Screaming at my parents, telling them I hate them, threatening to jump out of windows. Once the cops even came to my house because I screamed so often, my neighbors thought I was being abused. One day in third grade, I don't remember why, I snuck under my desk and into the backpack of the girl sitting across from me. I took her folder and put it in my bag. It was towards the end of class, and she told our teacher who asked me to return it. I went into a rage screaming that I didn't steal it, and how dare she accuse me. I gripped my desk, and a security guard and my vice principal carried me out of my class as I kicked and screamed. I was sent to the principal's office, where I kept screaming how I hated life, and I wanted to die, and I wanted my parents to die. My parents were called, and I was taken to a hospital, where I spent the night. Then the next morning, I was carried, kicking and screaming into an ambulance. I remember my mom sitting there crying as I screamed every curse word I knew at her, saying it was her fault, and I was gonna pee myself if they didn't let me out. My time at the hospital they took me to was a blur, and when I was released, I would be in therapy up until I graduated. I've always, for some reason, felt the need to defend myself, saying it wasn't my fault and blaming everyone for freaking out on me. But I'm finally ready to say it. I stole her folder, and I was the one responsible for everything that happened after. Not my parents. Not the school. Not my classmate. I did it. And it feels so amazing to finally say it. And to think all you needed was a Snickers. That's right. You're not you when you're hungry. I plagiarized my entire dissertation, and I got caught. It just felt too big. Too nebulous. I had no idea where to start, and I kept putting it off and putting it off again, with no idea of what to do. I could have asked for help, but I didn't. How pathetic, I thought.
thought. Every other student can manage to write one, but you need help? Just put your head down and do it. But I didn't. With 24 hours to go, I had nothing. So I found a dissertation on Google, and I went through and changed it enough that I thought I could get away with it. I didn't. I have a hearing in a few days, and I can't see any likely outcome other than being kicked out with no degree. I haven't told anybody besides a nice woman on the phone from Samaritans because I didn't know who else to call. She didn't seem to know what to say, though, and I can't blame her. What is there to say? You freaking idiot. How did you not ask anyone for help at any stage? Why are you the only person who can't freaking write their own dissertation? I'm so ashamed. So, so ashamed. I can't tell my friends. Students have fun at university, but I feel as though there is an unspoken contract that everyone can do so because they're all working hard. I've broken my contract and I cannot admit it. This shame pales in comparison to the shame I feel regarding my parents. I'm dreading telling them more than anything. They have been nothing but supportive my entire life. They are wonderful people. They've given me so much help, sacrificed so much for me to get a good education, and I've spat in their faces. I am ashamed to be their son. Wow. <laughs> so we're, start we're starting off heavy and deep. Oh, man. Ah. Uh, live and learn, I guess, buddy. Sorry. I intentionally ask women well above the legal age limit alcohol to show me their ID. I work as a cashier at a grocery store. Whenever a middle-aged woman who clearly looks older than 21 purchases alcohol from me, I intentionally ask them to show me their ID. I do this because somewhere deep down, I feel that if I ask them for their ID, it creates an impression that they look far younger than they are. I do this every chance I get, regardless of how busy the line is, in hopes of making them feel younger and possibly happier. I used to ID old ladies who requested the senior discount. They loved it. Every time I have to ID people, they always get pissed off and annoyed. I once told an elderly woman, have a nice day, young lady, and she went and told the manager and I was written up. Well, you gotta be subtle about it, man. <laughs> you can't just say, young lady, because then she kind of feels like you're kind of, you know, you're, you're taunting her, you're messing with her. But you, you just gotta be subtle about it. I stole my dad's car at night to lose my virginity to a chick I had never met. Hi, I'm 20 now, but this happened when I was barely 16. I met this girl on Hot or Not who said she wanted to have her way with me. So I was like, dope, I'm gonna get some good strange for my first time. I decided to meet up with her on a Friday night. I waited for my parents to go to sleep, then snuck out my window with my dad's keys and stole his car to meet this girl I'd never met IRL. I called her on my parents' house phone right before I sneak out to make sure she knows I'm coming over. They took my cell phone at night. So I get there, and guess what? She's not there. I drive back to the McDonald's down the road from her place and call using the phone number I had written on my handwritten Google Maps directions. Again, had no cell. She tells me she will be home in 30 minutes, so I waited out. I go there around 12.30 a.m., and she's waiting for me on the porch. I walk up, and I was like, ah, uh, shoot. She's a lot less attractive than in her pics. But I'm already here, and went through this much stuff to get here, so frick it, why not? We do the thing while on the floor, and two days later, I got ringworm on my ass cheek. I also neglected to tell her I was a virgin till I was done smashing. Haven't told anyone except my close guy friends that story. That's a story he will tell his grandson laughing his ass off. Laughing his ringworm off. A typical young man following his crack, whoever that pe leads him. Ringworm and memories. <laughs> ringworm and memories is just such a, a nice tagline. I took a dump on my neighbor's doorstep. So back when I was 10, my dad asked me if I wanted to make $20. I accepted. The catch, I had to poop on our neighbor's doorstep. It was clear my dad had beef with this woman. She woke in the morning and tried to blame our chihuahua. My dad yelled at her, saying that poop was bigger than our dog. Impossible. Point is, I don't feel bad. Forever daddy's girl. An even better trick is pooping in a bag, lighting it on fire, ring the doorbell, and leave. Wait, <laughs> girls can poop? Hate to tell you guys. <laughs> Sorry you had to find out this way on, on YouTube channel Ask MK. I lie about having my university degree, and it got me a great job. I have now been working with this company for almost five years. They provided all the necessary job training, and nobody's ever questioned my education. I entered with a starting salary of 72500 Canadian dollars and received annual raises. Upon hiring me, I was told that the management staff was quite impressed with me through the hiring process, and they usually only hire applicants with a minimum requirement of a master's degree. I basically crap my pants every day while in the interview and training process, but now I really don't think about it ever. I didn't tell my university friends I faked having a degree. The only people that know I did this are my parents. You should probably stay at that job your entire career. There would be a huge risk of getting caught if you applied for a different company now. What I realized about job interviews is that telling the truth actually doesn't help. Lying does. And unfortunately, this is the reality. Hey, I'm proud of you, dude. <laughs> That's a killer job you got. 72,000 starting and you get raises? Bro, give me that job. When I was a server, I threw a customer's phone into the trash compactor. I had just started serving tables at a restaurant and was working my first super busy brunch shift. I had six plus tables and I'm not going to lie, I had a tough time running all the mimosas that my tables were ordering. I could tell that one table of all women were getting abnormally angry about their drinks taking a while. I apologized for the delay and made a joke about it being an especially busy shift. I offered them a round of drinks on me to smooth the situation over. When I walked away, one lady murmured under her breath that I was an incompetent crap. Let's stop there. It's common for people to treat servers like crap, but this was the first time I had ever experienced being spoken to like I was garbage. I shook it off and continued to be nice to them, but it only got worse from there. They
they started to laugh at me and talk bad about me to one another. They told me that my future career looked pretty bleak considering I couldn't even serve tables. Honey, even a toddler can deliver drinks. When I took their order for food, one woman refused to speak to me. She just stared at me while her friend ordered for her. By now I'm pissed. I asked her why she felt the need to have her friend order for her. She laughed in my face, looked down at the menu, and said because I was a dumb little b Due to the fact that I was at work, I couldn't argue or even tell her to eat for treating me like I was a dog. If I did, my boss would have fired me. They ended up stiffing me on their $200 check. Once they left, I realized the woman that gave me so much crap had left her phone. I took it and went out to the back door to smoke a cigarette to try and calm down. Who the hell did that woman think she is? So I promptly turned off her phone, threw it in the trash compactor, and turned it on. She came back minutes later and asked multiple staff members if we found it. I told her that I didn't see it when I bust the table and that I would call her if it turned up. I never told anyone, but I never regretted doing it. When you treat people like Quack. expect Quack. things to happen to you. I would have sold the phone. I mean, she left such a generous tip. You can't just throw it in the trash. Except I'd pull it out and hand it over like, oops, looks like it went in the compactor. Bummer. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> that's that's great. That's great. Should have told her only dumb Quack. lose their phones. It's true. As someone who has never lost their phone, I can I can confidently say I'm not a dumb Quack. I pretended I was selling something on Craigslist and got two strangers to meet awkwardly. This is going to be good. I can just tell. Years ago, I made a new email address and got two potential buyers for a PlayStation that I was pretending to sell. I confirmed a date and time with both of them, decided on the mall near a certain store. I asked what they'd be wearing so I could find them. I gave them each other's descriptions for myself and then went and hung out. One walked up to the other. I could tell there was an immediate confusion. They started arguing over who had what. You could see them get pissed once they realized what happened and wasted their time. They both stormed off on their phones. Sure enough, I got angry emails from both of them. I feel kind of bad about it, but it was a funny interaction to witness. That sounds like something you would see on a TV prank show. <laughs> That's hilarious. I feel really guilty for laughing about this. This is what produces Craigslist murderers. Hey, I said it was going to be good, and it was good. That's how you know you can trust your boy Mason says Mason. After my bike was locked by campus police for being illegally parked, I damaged property to get my bike free and get out of a ticket. When I was in college, I illegally parked my bike onto a signpost. I did this because all the bike slots were overflowing every day, and there just wasn't enough parking for all the students. So I locked it to a nearby signpost. I can't remember what it said. Probably no parking. Anyways, I locked it, went to class, and when I came out, it had a lock on it from the campus police along with a ticket. It was one of those heavy-duty U-shaped metal bar locks. I walked home that day, and then later that night, when nobody was around, I went back to get my bike, worked the signpost out of the ground, which was compact crushed stone, and got my bike free. The lock was still on my frame, but I could ride it. I laid the sign on the ground, rode back home, Then the next day, I borrowed a stone wheel attachment for a drill and cut through the lock. It wore down the attachment, but I got out of a $15 ticket. Yes, I was an a-hole, but I was determined not to let the man win. And let the man win, you didn't. Honestly, you didn't really destroy property other than the bike lock. So I think it's pretty base to you that you did that. I stole $40 from my mom to buy a can of Pringles. Back in grade school when I was about 10, I stole $40 from my mother's purse to use whenever I wanted to buy something. Once I got to school that day, I saw one of the other kids had a can of dill pickle Pringles, which are still my absolute favorite to this day. So my stupid 10 year old self gave him all $40 for that single and enjoyed every single of those delicious efforts. When I came to school the next day, the same kid I bought the Pringles from gave me back the $40 while crying because apparently his mom screamed at him to give it back and now he couldn't buy candy with it because his mom wouldn't let him keep it. I held on to that money for a couple days until my mom started looking around and asking if I had seen the money laying around since it wasn't in her purse. So once I realized how I'd get my ass beat if she found out, I hid it under the couch and found it about 30 minutes later. I never got caught, but still look back on it and laugh that I essentially got some Pringles for free from the whole ordeal. <laughs> Lol, $40 for Pringles. Dude, if you ever need more Pringles, PM me. Waiting for the other kid's confession how he made $40 selling a can of Pringles. Bro has no concept of monetary value. That's crazy. <laughs> My husband is the moderator for a few different subreddits and he genuinely thinks it's a job. My husband refuses to look for a job even though I think it would be good for him and we could use the additional income. But he just says he's got too much on his plate already. That being monitoring these stupid subreddits. And every time I bring it up he claims what he's doing is unpaid labor similar to that of a homemaker. But he doesn't clean or cook or do any of that the way he used to. He just monitors his stupid subreddits. I don't know what to do. Sometimes I want to leave him because I believe I may not be able to reach him. Most mods do, and they take it way too seriously. Deleted. Removed. Zero dollars an hour. Imagine all the Reddit mods side-eyeing their partners wondering if they wrote this. Reddit mods with partners already brings it down from all to 0.1%. Is he gonna delete this post? Delete post! Ban OP and call it a day's work. He's abandoning his responsibilities to the marriage, putting it in jeopardy. You should tell him as 
as much. Also, he's a complete tool. LMAO mods in shambles. Even their spouses know they're delusional. Rough day to be a Reddit mod. Ugh. I found out that my boyfriend of two years is married and has kids. I'm showing myself to his family tomorrow at his church. Throw away because I don't want my followers to see this. I'm just so confused right now and need to talk to somebody. I've been seeing this guy, Adam, 32, for two years. He's from another town but visits me on weekends. I never met his family, friends, or been to his town. I know that he works at the church and he takes pride in that. Three weeks ago, I found out that he's actually married and has two kids. I was devastated and in a state of disbelief, but most of all, I was mad. Especially after I confirmed this via his wife's social media account. We're still talking and I haven't broken up with him yet. I planned and decided to show myself to his family on Sunday at his church and let them know that he used me and took advantage. I plan on ending it right there and then. I'm currently in his town staying at a hotel. I'm doing this tomorrow and no one knows except myself. He's still texting me lies thinking that I'm stupid or ignorant. I feel terrible but something's pushing me to do this. Don't know if it's anger or feeling bad for his wife and kids. I just, I'm not gonna lie. I'm worried this might backfire at me but at this point I have nothing to lose. I just feel like I need to get my respect and dignity back after being lied to and fooled for two years. Ooh, yeah, finding out you're the mistress is a little more rough, I think. Talk to the wife, not publicly. Leave the kids out of it. You have a right to be hurt, but hurting children and a wife that did not do anything to you puts you in the wrong with him. Be an adult about it. As scummy as that is, it is pretty remarkable that he got away with it for so long. I can't even take a sh without my wife and kids hunting me down. I am with everyone else here. It's going to blow up in your face if you make a scene. The church will make you the villain, him the victim, and the wife the lame duck. Sit next to her and tell her you want to speak to her in private. Give her unrefutable evidence. Walk away. Never look back. If she wants to make a scene, let her make that call. It's probably hard to see it this way, but both of you are victims to this man's machinations. As much as you want to ruin this man in spectacular fashion, it's not her fault he did this. Please be considerate. I'm sorry, but how do you stay with someone for two years and not meet any of his friends, family, been to his town, or his house? I'm not attacking you, I'm just saying you didn't think it's a little strange? That is somewhat of a red flag, to be sure. I hired a male sex worker for two hours just to hug me and hold me, and I gave him flashcards of what to say to me. Wait, did I write this? I'm a 22-year-old female. I'm introverted. I have one boyfriend who cheated on me eight months ago, and since then found it incredibly difficult to socialize. Not that many people made an effort. I'm simple. I don't have social media. I have a few friends, but they don't really speak to me much. I'm average looking, pretty insecure since my breakup. I'm in college and on weekends work a 12 hour shift at a fast food restaurant to make ends meet. I don't know, I felt really lonely, so I knew of a guy who works with me who told me his friend is doing sex work. I found him on Facebook and he told me how much he charged. Also asked me a bunch of questions about my sexual health. I never planned on sleeping with him, I just didn't want him to find me weird. Anyway, we met at a hotel. I told him I didn't want to have sex, I just wanted to be held and given words of affirmation and care. He agreed and I paid him. I gave him flashcards. They all said things like, I'm proud of you, you're doing so well, you're strong, did you eat, are you okay, I know you can do it, etc, etc. And he just held me until our hours was up and then I bolted and I feel so ashamed and had to tell someone. But I don't speak to anyone so here I am. Edit, thank you all for the kindest words and making me feel better and less ashamed. Yes, that's me immediately upvoting. I'm not good with words, so please know I appreciate it more than you know. Thank you so, so much. I mean, it's not the worst thing to do with a male escort. Here in California, this actually exists. They're called professional cuddlers. Don't feel bad at all. This time of the year is cold, gray, and lonely for a lot of folks. There is nothing wrong with utilizing these services after a traumatic breakup. As someone who grew up in California, I have never heard of this service that just happens in California, I guess. Good for you. You got your needs met in a way that didn't hurt anyone. You're not weird. You're a normal human lacking normal human interaction, so you got yourself some. That's self-care too. As a former cam girl, about 20% of my dates were just people who wanted to talk. Nothing sexual. I'm sure that guy has seen it before. In NYC, I would attend cuddled parties. No sex allowed. I'm learning a lot about the world right now. You're not a cringy or bad person for needing this in your life and utilizing the services you were afforded. Humans are social beings. We all need to have people in our life to love us
us and hold us and encourage us. And I'm proud of you for realizing that need in yourself and finding a way to fulfill it. I hope you find a more steady source of love and reassurance soon. I'm rooting for you, OP. This has to be one of the nicest threads I think I've ever seen. It just feels so, like, actually wholesome. I got a delivery driver fired. Last night, I ordered a pizza as my boyfriend was out of town and I was feeling lazy. Older gentleman delivered the pizza and started saying things like, Are you wearing anything under your clothes? Do you live alone? Is anyone in your apartment? I like you. You're very sexy. Right at the end, he tried to hug me and kissed me on the forehead. I was wildly uncomfortable and I kept waking up to car sounds in the parking lot, checking that it wasn't him. I slept with a bat. I do not like to rock the boat. I'm very non-confrontational, but I reported him to DoorDash. They just called and told me they are so sorry. There is a zero tolerance policy on that sort of behavior and they have deactivated his account. I'm glad I reported him. He might have done something worse in the future to another woman, but I feel like trash that I got a guy fired. Weird dissonance in my head right now. Oh uh, no, you shouldn't feel bad at all, actually, because that guy is a certified creep to just say that to a stranger when you're doing a job. No, you probably did save some other women from very uncomfortable situations. Just think of it this way. You saved another woman from going through the same frightening experience as you had, or even saved a woman from getting R-worded or killed in the extreme. You did a good thing and shouldn't feel guilty. You did the right thing. As much as it does suck knowing that you're the cause of somebody losing a job, I think you did the really right thing here, cause yikes, man, oh, you don't get away with that. Don't feel bad. As a DoorDash driver, it is very, very, very easy to not even interact with customers, so any who do are effing creepy. I'd file a police report. If he's caught around you again for any reason, the police have this information on file and it will make it a lot easier. In his mind, he knows where you live and he just lost a job. Call the police. You didn't get anyone fired. He fired himself. Honestly, with that kind of behavior to a customer during your job, you did get yourself fired. There's no excuse. I'm a chef and I've been living a lie about the quality and authenticity of my food. I'm a personal chef for an upper class family in the US with a multi-million dollar house who go on many vacations every year. They claim they miss authentic European and Asian food after living abroad for several years. When I first started cooking for them, I made elaborate dishes that took hours to make, finding the exact ingredients, examining each piece of carrot, potato, or chicken by hand, finding the right brands and going to multiple grocery stores to find the exact Pinot Noir to make the perfect red wine sauce. They didn't like it. I once messed up a dish and had to remake it really quickly, so I took a few shortcuts to make sure it was still tasty. A normally 12-hour dish I made a quick version of in less than 30 minutes using vinegar instead of red wine. They said it was the tastiest thing they ever ate. It reminded them of the times they were traveling through some European mountains. Since then, I've realized I don't need to spend hours making all the food perfectly authentic. I stopped using expensive brands of wine. Sometimes I don't even use wine at all. Grape juice or vinegar or even sugar seems to taste just as good, if not better to them. I've saved tens of thousands of dollars and probably thousands of hours getting cheaper ingredients that have already been brined or marinated and they absolutely love it. They even had me prepare large meals for parties or events and they'd claim it was authentic French or Italian food. They'd ask me what combination of flour I used to make the pasta that was so clearly handmade. It was 99 cent boxed pasta from Walmart. Or it was clear I used a very particular Pinot Noir for a Coco Vaughn, which I actually just added a little fruit juice with some vodka. Or that the saffron really made a difference in my risotto when I really just used turmeric. Or how the food tastes so much better when sauces are freshly made with raw ingredients when it's really mayonnaise plus ketchup or some other dumb combination of common condiments. I just smile and nod. A part of me feels guilty, but not guilty enough to go back to making the more authentic versions that they just complain about that cost me way more time and money anyways. I'm more just worried that one day they'll find out, but I've gotten away with it for almost eight years now. Edit, because so many people have asked, this was my first job as a professional chef and it was a side gig. When I took the job, I didn't know how much to charge. They asked what would be the price per meal for their family of four, including getting groceries, planning, prepping, cooking, plating, cleaning, etc. So everything, including groceries, would be included in what they pay me. So the groceries are a business expense. They don't reimburse me for it. It's part of my total fee. TBH, that fee was vastly undercharging for my time and the amount of work I put in initially, as well as the quality of ingredients. Rookie mistake as a rookie cook, I guess. 
Also, I don't regularly serve boxed pasta, lol. It's just one of those examples off the top of my head. Sounds like you're a good cook regardless of where the ingredients came from. Or their tastes aren't as expensive as they think, lol. Keep it up and don't tell a soul. Well, they did just tell a lot of people through this, so uh, whatever, they, they're getting away with it. The thing is, maybe you are really making authentic food. Because maybe this is exactly what the chefs were doing at those authentic restaurants for the same reason as you. To save money and time. And now the food tastes exactly the same to them. Because it is. Rich people reading this post and going home to their chef's authentic cuisine. <laughs> Yet rich people all over the world see this and now they're worried that their chef isn't actually making authentic food. Wealthy people can be strange. I worked in a house where the chef cooked up a pound of bacon, sliced a couple of perfect beef steak tomatoes, and brought it all upstairs to the lady of the house. She chooses the three slices of bacon and tomato that she wants on her BLT, and the rest goes in the trash. Every day. You see, this is why rich people don't deserve anything. I think my dad might have killed someone when I was a kid. One night, when I, 36 female, was about 8 or 9 years old, mid-90s, my father took my little brother and I to Blockbuster to pick out movies. We left there, and my dad stopped at a corner store for some snacks, and he parked on the side of the building. He left me and my brother in the car while he ran in. On his way out, a man came up behind him and held something to his side. My dad pretended he was going to hand the man his wallet, but he instead elbowed the man in his face and he fell to the ground. The guy got up and came at my dad with a knife, and my dad fought it away from him and stabbed him with it. It was long, and that went all the way in. The guy let out this horrible groan. I can still hear it. He left the guy on the floor writhing, hopped in the car, and took off. For so many years, I thought this was a dream until my little brother mentioned it to me when asking if I remembered. We've never brought this up to my father. Ever. I've always wondered what happened to that guy, but this was way before cell phones and stuff, so who knows? It's crazy the weight that comes off someone when they say things they've always been holding in. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, that sounds like... I mean, it's not murder necessarily, but it's not good. Sounds like your dad made a decision that he was going home with his kids that night. And his wallet. Sounds like he was just justified in doing it. Weird he didn't call it in since he was a victim and it was self-defense. Undocumented immigrant from Antigua, an island in the Caribbean. I'm assuming he didn't want to risk deportation. Yeah, you know, that seems fair enough to not call the police in that circumstance. Your other option was possibly watching your own father get killed in front of your eyes. So as far as outcomes go, I would objectively say you got the better of the two options. Yeah, I mean, it's both bad outcomes, but at least yours was better. But... Did you make it to Blockbuster? What movie did you get? Wow, great question. I got Mrs. Doubtfire and my little brother got Free Willy. Blockbuster was the first stop. If I have to jump through 80 hoops just to apply, then still make it through three interviews, the least you can do is give me a courtesy call saying I didn't get the job. Man, even an automated email would be better. How do they expect us to show loyalty if we're literally just bits of machinery to them? Oh my god, I feel this so hard. Oh, that's... Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> it is unbelievably ridiculous how companies can just get away with, like, stringing you along and never have to tell you if you didn't actually get it. So by that point, you're already homeless. True. When I was a manager in retail for several years, anyone that applied, I followed up with because my boss explained that everyone who applied was also a customer. And that's a relationship you don't want to break. Dear hiring manager, thank you for your rejection. Unfortunately, due to the sheer number of rejections I have received, I am unable to accept yours. I will see you on the coming Monday. Sincerely, me. If you've interviewed for a position and they don't call to tell you you've been unsuccessful, that's pretty rude. You've taken time out of your day to speak to them. A 30-second courtesy call is the least you could expect. A bit of information about where you missed out would be ideal. On the other hand, if you've just submitted an application, don't expect to hear back. Job ads attract so many applicants these days, it's just not possible to reply to everyone. While I understand that it's like, you know, too many applicants to really get back to everyone. Uh, it's ridiculous to say that nobody wants to work anymore when we have people that want to work, you just refuse to let them at a certain point. Sorry, I'm not mad, I'm just mad. Uh, most 
HR people I have met are sociopaths. There are notable exceptions, but most in HR are people who like to boss over other people without much knowledge or responsibility. Just ignore them. You won't work for them. I slept with my girlfriend's mom two years ago. I can't tell her because I know she'll dump me and it'll probably end her parents' marriage. Dog, what are you talking about? So, let me first just say, I'm not the one who's in the wrong for this, but I have to say it somewhere. It's eating me alive. Two years ago, when I was 19, I met this woman while I was working as a personal trainer. She was in her 40s and looked like a 25-year-old. She took an interest in me and invited me out a number of times, and we had sex a few times. After one of our meetups, she said it was wrong for someone of her age to be with me because I was too young and changed gyms. My girlfriend and I had been together for just under a year. She's amazing, and I love her so much. Two months ago, I met her family for the first time, and it was a shock. Like, she took me to the house where I had hooked up with a woman, and I felt like I was being pranked. Before I see her mom, it hits me. I have a type, and they both fit that type, so it makes sense. I've been hooking up with a single mom, and I'm now with her daughter. Then her mom and dad pop out, and we both almost crap ourselves. I met her parents. They've been married for 20 years. I realized I had been a married woman's boy toy. I feel incredibly ashamed. Later that week, her mom finds my number and tells me that I can never speak of what happened. She says that my girlfriend will hate me forever because I'll be the one who broke up her parents. So now I'm stuck keeping this secret. She invited me to spend Thanksgiving with her family, and since my family is a thousand miles away and I already told her I don't plan on going home, I don't really have an excuse to not go. So now I'm going to have to sit there at a table and enjoy Thanksgiving dinner with the woman I had an affair with, her husband, and her daughter, whom I am now in love with. I'm effed. They've got a type too. Hmm, seems like it really runs in the family. <laughs> I'll see myself out. This sounds like an 80s movie. I realized I've been a married woman's boy toy. Definitely some inner monologue an 80s movie character would say. Damn, the mother is certainly projecting and deflecting her guilt into you. Not your fault, my dude. The guilt isn't yours to shoulder. What movie did this happen in? The plot sounds pretty good. The Graduate. I think OP got the story from an old copy of Penthouse. Admittedly, this story does feel like too scripted to be true. I would want to know if I was your GF. And her mom busted up her own marriage because she had an affair. She's just trying to shift the blame to you. You know, you kind of have a point there. You mother f***er. In the most literal sense, yeah. The candidate I had to interview for this week was my high school bully. I work for a fairly large company in the tech industry. I've worked there for about five years now, and I have a fairly high up role in management. Over the last few weeks, I got roped into helping build a new team within the company and was assigned to do multiple interviews. This was fairly short notice for me, so my job was only to do the interview and give my impressions of the candidate and the results of the interview. The company is also just back to doing in-person interviews, so the process is even more wonky as of now. When I received the list of candidates for the day, I saw the name of a man we'll call Brad. It had been over 15 years since I had last seen him, but I could never forget the face of the man who made my high school years a living hell. Brad was your typical bully jock. I was an overweight theater kid in AP math and science, and you can see where this is going. Those were the worst years of my life, and Brad was one of the contributing causes to that. So to see him in the candidates here was a shock to me. I didn't believe it at first, but when Brad walked in for the interview, I knew that I was face to face with the man who bullied me in high school. At first, Brad didn't recognize me, but as we sat down, he remembered who I was. He tried to play buddy-buddy with me, pretend we were friends in high school, and I played along. I did the interview. He did okay. Nothing stand out, but middle of the pack. He made a joke that I would get him the job, right? I laughed along, and he left. I finalized the interviews yesterday. I wrote Brad a scathing review, downplayed everything good about him, and exaggerated his flaws. Also wrote in that he tried to coerce me into giving him a good review because he was an acquaintance in high school. School. It's been 15 years since I graduated high school. I'm an entirely different person than I was then. But for some reason, I was dragged back to those days, and I don't know how to feel. My school bully saw me at a reunion 20 years later. He came over, we chatted with a group of people, he waited for the right moment, then asked semi-privately for forgiveness for what 
he and a couple others had done. He said he cannot expect me to accept his apology, that he wished he could undo it, but that he really felt sorry for it. I accepted. Felt good. Don't you love it when life comes around full circle? You know, you always hear those stories of, oh, you'll be a big CEO and you'll get to fire your bully. I never thought I'd actually see a story like that. Don't beat yourself up or feel bad about this. Had Brad changed, he wouldn't have tried to pretend like you were buddies. He wouldn't have made the nudge about you getting him the job. He would have acknowledged the obvious discomfort, apologized for his past actions, and asked you to consider his application. He did the opposite of that. He is still toxic, and you absolutely did the right thing, keeping him out of your work environment, not only for your own well-being, but for the well-being of your coworkers. Yeah, screw that Brad! I would have done the same. If he were a changed person worthy of respect and hiring, he would have been straightforward. Wow, imagine this. Obviously, fate has given me an opportunity to make amends. I'm so sorry for how awful I was to you. I wouldn't blame you for ending this interview right now, but I need to let you know that I'm not that person anymore, and I'm truly sorry for how I treated you. But he didn't. He tried to hide from it and minimize it. He's a coward at best. You don't want him working for you and the company. As a firefighter who responds to all sorts of incidents, can I just say, at an accident, either help or get out of the way. Don't just stand there filming with your phone. That person is going through the worst day of their life. Have some respect. I couldn't agree with you more. WTF is up with people whose first thought is, let's get the phone out rather than, as you say, help or move. I'm in security, involving at times medical issues, and if someone was filming me dealing with a seizure or something as personal, my attitude is if prob throw their phone across the car park. In Germany, they put up screens for privacy, but also so that traffic doesn't get distracted. I didn't know they did that, and that's actually pretty interesting for the traffic aspect since a lot of people rubberneck. Also, yeah, I know that accent was bad. Move on. My dad was a police officer and always told us kids, if you're ever stuck in traffic at an accident, it might ruin your day. But that accident might have ruined that person's life. It might have ended that person's life. Be grateful you're just stuck in traffic today. I've heard someone else say it best before. Whenever there's a fight or emergency that happens, everyone is pulling out their phones. But nobody is calling the police or 911 for help. I hate it. When you're at a scene and try to work and help people, and there are a bunch of people just standing around doing nothing, staring at you while you do your job. You know, this also applies to fast food workers as well. I say that of all emergency issues. There was a shooting where everyone started filming the shooter and started talking on Facebook Live. Those people didn't even get behind cover. Some got shot. Next thing you know, more bystanders appear and film the victims, but don't help. After EMS arrives, some of them get in the way because they're recording and not paying attention. This sounds like a scene from Black Mirror. I can't imagine having the impulse to film over help, but with gunshots, I'd probably have the impulse to get the heck out of there. As a black person, white guilt is cringe. I understand your empathy about others and those who are underprivileged, but god damn, you people make it seem like I have to walk into a damn pity party every day. I get up, work, eat, sleep, and crap just like you. I can't fathom this idea that many non-black people have it in their heads that they should feel sorry for us all the time. Like, it feels like whatever accomplishment I make, you have to make it seem as if I need some extra attention. Like, I'm the kid at show and tell who needs a forced hand clap. I don't want to be seen as underprivileged, but I want to be seen as your equal. When I see all these white celebs give up their jobs because they feel sorry, it just makes me angry. No, you earned your job just like I will earn mine. It's virtue signaling at this, and TBH, it's infuriating. Edit. Didn't know this was going to blow up. Let's clarify that I'm talking about white and non-black people who go on pity parties for black people without warrant, i.e. going out of their way to signal that blacks are underprivileged and will never be looked at by them as their equal. There's a difference from being upset about issues and trying to virtue signal that you're a good white person. Black people don't want to be seen like we can't do it for ourselves. I should say most of us because there are some who still have a mentality they can't do anything. It's extra cringe when a parent takes a picture of their kid with a black kid and is like, my kid don't see color, proud parent. Comments like, raise them right. The f so embarrassing for the innocent children. I think most people should know that black people aren't a hive mind collective. White people aren't either. When someone is being a jerk to you, they are being the a-hole. Not everyone they share skin color with. The individual is responsible for the individual's actions, not the group. So you're saying humans are not part of a hive? 
hive mind and are, in fact, individuals? Looks like I'll have to revise my report to the homeworld. Thank you. This is such a nice, refreshing perspective on everything. Yeah, no crap. Go read some Malcolm X and his thoughts on the problem with the white liberal. Someone that pities you doesn't respect you. Got called insecure for breaking up with a girl that I found has an OnlyFans. If I'm the insecure one, why would you hide it for months? Anyways, I hope you have an amazing career and life. I really do. But I'm never dating a sex worker, online sex worker, OnlyFans, or any of that. It's just a personal decision, and hope you can respect that and realize it's not because I hate you. Edit. Wow. Didn't expect this many responses. Thank you all for your input. Alright, so you are definitely the a-hole. What? Uh, oh, wrong subreddit? Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. Sorry. I think the bigger problem here isn't whether or not you want to date a sex worker. That's your own preference. It's the fact that she hid it from you. Obviously, she's entitled to do whatever she wants with her body and her time. But when you enter a relationship, that's something that should be disclosed. The fact she didn't is not okay. Nothing wrong with your decision, OP. You aren't insecure. Edit. People really out here trying to say not wanting to share your significant other, visually or otherwise, makes you insecure. It's really just the term share in that sentence that kind of puts me on edge. Like, what are you talking about? Sharing. You set a boundary and stuck by it. Good for you for not letting her walk all over you. Was she walking all over you by having an OnlyFans? I don't understand some of this perspective here. Just as having an OnlyFans is a choice. Not wanting to be someone who has an OnlyFans is also a choice. Insecurity exists when either side does things to bring it up. Like have an OnlyFans and keep it secret. Playing online games as a woman is exhausting. Men treat women like we aren't even human beings. And even worse, on the internet. They scream at the top of their lungs, GAMER GIRL! Whenever they hear a female voice. Aren't you embarrassed? You should be ashamed. It's not fun to play a lot of games as a woman where it requires to speak because men ruin the fun by being pieces of crap. What goes through a male's head thinking it's okay to treat others like that? Not all men. Well, guess what? It's a massive amount of them. Even speaking and simply saying hi can change the way you get treated once they find out you're a girl slash woman. Then you get called slurs and stupid stuff. Go outside and take a class on how to talk to people. A man invited me to his party in a game and was being friendly to me, but the rest of his group was calling him a simp for showing me basic human decency. If you get offended by reading this post, then you're part of the problem. Showing basic decency is the bare minimum and we don't even get that on the internet. A lot of men need to grow the f*** up and stop being rude a-holes. Unfortunately, being a stinky Valorant player, I understand what she's talking about completely. The second a woman speaks in chat, the most rizzless losers you'll ever meet come out of the woodwork. It seems playing co-op games makes people act nicer. I was playing Deep Rock Galactic the other night and there was a girl on mic. No one said anything about it and we all just played well. She complimented me on my score, had slightly more gunner kills than her engineer, which usually engineer gets more if they're really good, after the mission was done and that was nice. I hate dealing with guys that make it a big deal one way or another. Just play and have fun. I avoid using my mic at all costs when playing randoms because of this. That way I get treated like any other other dude, which is way better. It sucks that this is still such a massive problem. I'm a dude, but I like to play female characters in games. One of them was a damage priest, and since a female priest equals none, and none equals sister, I named the tune Sister Death and dyed all my gear to look like a nun's uniform. Literally every single day, I would get people sending me whispers with super sexual content, offering me in-game items or currency for nudes, all sorts of stuff. One dude offered me $100 to come onto his vent server and have phone sex with him. I logged into the server and was like, sup bro, in my deep manly voice. I didn't get the $100. Hmm. You might not have gotten the $100, but you at least killed his boner and embarrassed him so much. My fiance and sister won't team up with anyone and voice chat with each other on Discord just so they can play games together online without being hassled. It makes me sad, especially because women are becoming a sizable demographic for this medium, and yet every Every time people hear one playing, they freak out. It's actually quite pathetic. I use a voice changing mic. I say the bare minimum and then I am done. First time I hear name calling like that, I dump their worthless asses. They are trash and know it. Message to all gamers out there. Knock it off, maybe? I don't know, just be nice and normal. The fact that women's legs are naturally hairy is such a mind frick to me. My dislike of hairy legs on a woman feels so natural to me, but it isn't. It's a socially imposed preference and if I had been born in any time before the
the 1900s, women would all be walking around with hairy legs and men wouldn't give a crap because it would be normal. It's hard for me to believe my preference for hairless legs is a social construct because it doesn't feel that way even though it is. It makes me wonder what other aspects of myself that I believe are inherent are actually not. What an interesting thought. I'm gonna do the same. A few minutes ago, I was thinking about how in shows and movies when you have characters stranded for a period of time, men are often shown to have more facial hair, but I don't think I ever seen more body hair on a woman in that scenario. It's like it's not even something that's considered. I love that hair on women's legs is making you question all of socially constructed reality. Yeah, my brother being disgusted with me wearing shorts around the house with unshaven legs while he has a thick brown full-on fur on his legs is insane. Not hating on you, OP. I just agree that it's pretty insane if you think about it. Glad you're starting to realize. Wait until you find out women also fart. I only poop with my legs crossed because it's more feminine. Slash S. I threw eggs from the 16th floor of my apartment to maintain peace and quiet. I used to live on the 16th floor of an apartment building. There was a pub on the ground floor and people would often congregate late at night in the street in front of the pub entrance. This was a hindrance to residents because we would wake up at 1 or 2 in the morning to drunk people talking outside. My apartment had two balconies on two sides of the building so I often looked down on people grouping together on both sides of the building. I got fed up with it and decided to drop an egg where a group of people were chatting. They immediately dispersed and I could enjoy my sleep again. I did this on another occasion and again it worked. I started buying more eggs and it became a habit that I practiced for about six months. No one had a clue it was me and I even went to the pub and overheard people chatting about eggs being dropped from balconies in the building. Needless to say, I used to maintain peace and quiet by dropping eggs from my balconies. I have nearly gotten water dumped on me outside a bar underneath some apartments. Let's hope it was just water. That would be Lol, I moved into an apartment above a bar, then was annoyed it was loud. When the police won't enforce late night noise ordinances, the Eggman restores law and order. I tried to miscarry my baby and hurt her permanently. When I was 15, I got myself pregnant unintentionally. I was a very promiscuous, horny teenager and wasn't exactly safe about it. Sometimes I used condoms, sometimes I didn't. I got really worried when I started experiencing the usual symptoms of morning headaches and nausea and skipped my period. So I took a pregnancy test and what I feared was true, I was pregnant. I had no idea how to react to this. For one, I was utterly terrified and I wanted to get rid of it. In a way, it felt parasitic. The thing inside me with the power to frick up my life. I have a very Christian parents who would have disowned me for having an abortion, but I knew they would actually love to raise this kid. However, I hated the idea. I had problems with eating at the time and didn't want to gain the pregnancy weight and I just didn't want a child. I guess I'm making excuses even now. I started a smoking habit very promptly since I heard in science lessons that one of the effects of smoking can be miscarriage. I barely ate at all and if I did, I threw it up in hopes of starving it as if I was trying to get rid of a fever. It didn't work. I gave birth to her fire too early and as a result she is blind. I gave her away and haven't heard from her since. She's eight by now. My parents were surprisingly supportive and I got the help I needed for my eating disorder and I still go to regular therapy. I just had to get it off my chest. And this is why we need better sex ed along with easy access to contraceptives and an undeniable right to choose. And this is why we need safe abortions. This is an excellent example of why you shouldn't be so strict on your kids that they feel that they can't come to you with anything. I guess I am my brother's keeper. I used to watch over my little brother who at the time we didn't know had Asperger's when he was at school. Kids would always pick on him when he came home with bruises. I ditched school. I was in high school and he was in middle school and snuck onto campus during recess and lunchtime but always stayed a ways away. I saw some little <laughs> hat push my brother down and watched as he got back up, picked up his books and walked away even though the boy was following him and smacking the back of his head. After my brother made it to the classroom, I ran up, grabbed the kid by the back of the neck and without thinking, headbutted him. Once he started to cry, I pulled him in and told him that if he ever lays a hand on that little boy again, I'd break every last one of his sad little bones. I never told anyone about doing that. After school, I watched my brother begin to walk home and the little <laughs> friend walked up to him, yelled something about some dumb older girl. I can only assume he meant me and he pushed my brother into the street and a car had to slam on his brake to avoid hitting him. At that point, I lost it. I pulled my brother onto the sidewalk and made sure he was okay and I told him not to move. I ran over to the little <laughs> I didn't care that he was younger, not one bit, grabbed him by his hair and yanked him to the ground and started beating the ever-loving crap out of him. At some point, I broke his arm. The driver of the car that almost hit my brother had called the police and pulled me off of him, but backed me up 100% and told the officer the truth about what he saw. I got insanely lucky. The police officer told me he has a little sister with autism, and he probably would have done the same thing. Didn't even get punished in the slightest, was just told to take my brother home and to promise never to hit anyone again. The best I could give was to never get caught hitting anyone again. We stopped by the 7-Eleven on the way home, and I got us both some ice cream. I don't know if he remembers that day now, but I'd still do it all over again in a heartbeat. You did the right thing. I can't think of anything better to do than that. This one feels like one of those stereotypical bully situations you see in movies, but this one had a much better outcome and justice was actually served. The kid wouldn't have stopped if you didn't step in, so kudos. I framed my mother's ex-husband when I was five. So for a little background, my mom's ex-husband was a jerk. Later on in life, I found out that he was even worse than I thought, but even a five-year-old me, he was a jerk. For example, there was one summer where he spent all of our money, meaning his and the money from the three jobs my mom worked at the time, on cigarettes and booze and other dumb stuff, leading to me and my sister having to spend the summer at my grandma's house because 
because there was literally no food in the house and my mom had to live off of bread and butter for about three months. He was that kind of guy. So when I was a kid, I always got up much, much earlier than everyone else. I can't remember why, but it was probably just so I could watch cartoons in peace. One morning, I went into the living room and found this dude's pocket knife on the couch. It was closed, but I got curious. I opened it and I was playing with it when I had the thought. Obviously, I can't remember the actual train of thought, but it led to me deciding to cut my hand right in the center of my palm so that mom would be mad at Meathead McDonald. I immediately started bleeding and a lot. Now, I know that I bled so much because I have a blood clotting disorder. Yay me. I started screaming. Mom came down the stairs along with Quack. wipe and they saw what happened. I told mom that he had let the knife open on the couch arm and I had put my hand down on accident. This led to one of their biggest fights with mom saying that he was endangering me and micro Quack. saying he swore he didn't leave it open. So yeah, I still have that lovely scar in the middle of my hand to remind me that I was more of an evil genius when I was a child than I ever will be again. Fun. I love how in every paragraph you have a different name for him. Your hatred for this man is so great you have to make a new name for every time. Poetic. He did leave a knife out where a five-year-old could get it. This did endanger you. You single-handedly, sorry about the pun, won your mother's custody over you when you were five and before the divorce even started. You evil mastermind. Bro is a genius at five. <laughs> Bro knows what's good. I used to eat my co-worker's apple chips at work then tell him I was allergic to apples so he wouldn't accuse me. Well, this guy just seems kind of like a jerk. Just to be clear, this wasn't because I was particularly hungry. It's because my co-worker was an absolute a-hole. He was really creepy towards the girls in the office. Immediately, I take back what I just said about him being a jerk. Good for them. <laughs> and always said some pretty weirdly racist stuff to our other co-worker who was from Mexico. He was just a crude, horribly annoying person who seemingly took enjoyment out of making everyone around him uncomfortable. He was like a mix of Todd Packer from The Office and Tony Soprano. He always brought these apple chips into work to eat for lunch, and occasionally I would go in, take the apple chips, and go to the nearby park and eat them for lunch. He would go around asking if anyone took the chips and would act all pissed off because he knew someone took them. Instead of just flat out telling him I'm allergic to apples, I put on a little show. He was eating his chips two days before and I started to take them. And I asked if I could have one and I took one and almost took a bite and then he said, these aren't apple flavored, are they? And he said they were. And then I quickly put it back on the plate and went to go wash my hands because I said I was allergic. Much more believable than me just flat out telling him. This went on for about two months and I must have taken his chips like 10 times or so. 2000 IQ. You're living in 3019. You deserve a round of applause. Hey, you know what? I said that you were being a jerk. I lied. I apologize. That guy who's being weird to girls and racist deserves to have his apple chips eaten, at the very least. I took a dump in a mason jar and left it in my friend's pantry. About 13 years ago, my 19-year-old self was partying at a friend's house, and there was a good 20 to 25 people packed inside this 1,000 square foot house. I have been drinking Mike's Hard Lemonade and Tampon Blender Benders all night long. Full disclosure, I have an allergy involving certain alcohols that can cause severe hives, swollen throat, and intense diarrhea. I was 19 and stupid. Anyways, I was chatting with my gal pal at the time and felt the inevitable groan in my stomach. Ah, crap. I thought, figuratively and literally. I asked where the bathroom was and she pointed down the hall. I squeezed myself through the teenage crowd only to find a ridiculously long line of women waiting to use the toilet. My bowels were screaming. The cramps were intensifying. I recalled seeing a toilet closet in the basement of the house once before and decided to take my chances. I darted down the stairs all while puckering my pooper with all the strength in me. It was dark, so I flipped the light switch and saw the porcelain throne glowing in the corner of the room. I slammed the door behind me and shoved my pants down around my ankles. I make a swift penguin waddle over to the toilet. To my surprise, the toilet isn't connected to the plumbing, it's just sitting in the corner of the room. A failed attempt at a bathroom remodel. I put myself in a perilous poo position with no escape. People saw me come down here and there's no way I could go poo in the toilet and get away with it. But now, my ass was on fire and I could barely hold it much longer. I panicked. I scanned the room and noticed an open mason jar filled with potpourri with a lid lying beside it on a shelf. My mind was weighed up. I snatched the mason jar from the shelf and promptly dumped the potpourri into the empty toilet bowl. Ever so carefully, I placed the mason jar on the floor of the bathroom and popped a squat over it, spreading my cheeks and with surgical precision, shat my brains out in the jar. I filled that sucker to the brim. I released the crack into final size and never felt such relief before in my life. But what now? What do I do now? I can't leave it here. I hear my friends calling me from upstairs that they were wanting to leave. I needed an escape plan now. Quickly, I pulled up my pants. Wiping was not an option, but I pinched off like 99% of my crap, so it was clean enough, and I placed the lid on the mason jar. It was warm. So warm. Still unsure of what to do next. I hide the jar under my hoodie and exit the bathroom as if nothing happened. What were you doing down there? My friend asked. Just freshening up. I said in absolute horror that she may notice my mason jar sh smuggling. Hurry up, we're all in the kitchen waiting to leave, she barks. I swim through the crowd of people to the kitchen to meet my friends. They're all crowded around the pantry door, which was next to the garage. There you are. They holler as they open the door to the garage. Here's my chance. The door to the garage was blocking the visual to the pantry. I did it. I slid the smuggled poop jar out from under my sweater and placed it next to the identical jars in the pantry and promptly left. To this day, I wonder, I wonder with so much wonderment that I wonder how I've never been caught. Did they ever locate this jar and open it? Was it assumed beef stew? Was it tasted? I'm good. Smelled? Tossed? I regret this. But I was desperate. This is my poo fashion. Somewhere at some time on Reddit, someone is sharing the discovery of that poop jar. I hope these stories will find their way to
to each other. That jar might have exploded, especially if it got hot outside. Poop creates methane gas, and you might have poop bombed their pantry. I knowingly stuck a booger to my boss's hand and let a customer get blamed for it. A few years ago, I was a salesman for a tool company, and as I'm sure you all know, salespeople shake hands all the time when closing a deal. One day on my lunch break, I was sitting in my car eating a salad, and for some reason, I felt like a hard, dried snot stuck in my nostril. So obviously, I didn't think anybody was around or watching me, so I went and dug for gold. Well, as soon as I pulled the giant flaky booger with a snail trail of slime on it, my boss, who had just got back from vacation and bops the hood of my car and reaches in for a handshake. I kind of panicked and just shook his hand. We talked for a few about his vacation, and then he saw somebody walk into the showroom, so he went in the building. I finished up lunch and headed back into work. I punch back in and hear from the showroom, what the frick? And then I hear gagging and coughing. My boss is holding his hand away like it's a dirty diaper. He's dry heaving, and he says, that guy just wiped a frickin' booger on me. And I look across the room and see this old guy standing there in total disbelief, and he let my boss have it. He's telling my boss that he's never coming back, told him to stop picking his nose like a window licker, and a few other colorful sentences. My boss kicks him out. While this whole thing is going down, all I can think to myself is, holy crap, I got away with it. I just drove by my old work and thought about that time and figured it was time to confess. This is quality content right here. That's it. You're going to hell. Hope you pack your bags, lol. You may think this is a good confession, but it's snot. <laughs> I ordered $80 worth of pizza for a non-existent client. It was a family business and they were very mean and have no patience. I ordered a delivery, it came one hour later and cold. Called him out about it. Dude got mad, started yelling and refused to take it back. He threw the change at me and stormed away. I called his father, the pizza owner, to complain. And he told me that his kid don't get mad if he wasn't right and he told me to put the pizza in the microwave and hung up. I was mad AF. I decided to wait until I cool off and think about what to do. So the next morning I called the pizza from a phone booth and ordered almost $80 worth of pizza. I gave them the ad address of the apartment next to me, which was empty. I turned off my TV so I can hear him coming. He came more than an hour later and started knocking on the door. Of course, no one responded. He insisted by knocking loudly. So I opened my door and see him with a ton of pizza. I just laughed and closed my door. He automatically knew it was me, but couldn't prove it. I could hear him yelling, insulting while leaving the building. That day was satisfying AF. I ordered Domino's to celebrate. You should have been eating Domino's pizza when you opened the door to look at him, but awesome either way. Gotta love the petty revenge in this one. Plus one for opening the door to watch him steam. You're kind. I would have kept on doing that constantly until it affected the way they treated all their customers, thus putting them out of business. How's a how's a how's a small business pizza place gonna gonna have that kind of attitude for customers? Like, unfortunately, you kind of would expect it from a bigger chain who you know they have plenty of money and don't care. But the small places, I don't know, man. How are how are places like that still in business? I stole a book from the library page by page, then glued the pieces together at home. I was about ten, and I was addicted to reading encyclopedias. I could spend hours learning about all sorts of stuff, staring at the illustrations and photos, and of course smelling the books. Smelling? However, I could get my fix at my local library only as my parents could barely afford food for us, let alone buying fancy books. So I became a regular guest at the kids slash teenagers section of the library. One day I couldn't get there in time, so I only had about half an hour to spend before closing time. Not just that, but they also had a brand new 400 page encyclopedia waiting for me on the shelf. It was love on first sight. I felt awful because I knew that I couldn't do much reading in such little time, and then there was this lovely smelling book with a montage of astronauts, cars, and magnificent landscapes on the cover, just begging me to read it. But sadly, books like those were not borrowable and time was ticking. I thought about taking it, but it was just enormous and I wasn't. I wasn't a bad boy either, I told myself, but what if I just take a few pages? That surely won't hurt anyone and no one will notice. That's what I did. The book was binded in a way that I could carefully rip out about five pages out in one go. I wrapped the pages around my foot, slipped them in my socks, covered my socks with my pants, and I just casually walked out. The first time I actually said thank you very much with a big smile to the librarian and she gave me that awkward, what the heck are you talking about look. I 10 year old mind quickly realized how stupid I was to say that and I, maybe even my parents, could be in jail for this. So I just rushed out, sweating, and with my heart jumping out of my chest. Originally, I wanted to return the pages of the next visit to the library, but I was sitting on my bed at home, reading about the wildlife in Africa, the only content I got at the time. I came up with the master plan of repeating the process until I got every page, and the plan was working. Not just that, but I improved on the technique. I wrapped pages around my feet, around my arms, I had to wear long sleeves for that, and also kept a stack on my back, tucked carefully in my pants. I can get about 20 to 25 pages in just one day, and I remember walking slowly like a robot on my way out, as I didn't want to crush the pages too much. I couldn't bend in any direction because the pages were holding my limbs tight. After several visits to the library, the encyclopedia began to visibly shrink, so I got some paper from the photocopy room and replaced the missing pages with blank ones. My last visit was the sketchiest because I had to take the trophy somehow. By trophy, I mean the hardcover with the astronauts on it. There was no way to wrap it like I did with the other pages, and it was too big to hide it anywhere on me. But I was so close to the victory, and I couldn't let it go. I had the shiny cover in its full glory in my hand, I put it under my t-shirt, on my back, hands in my pockets, trying to hold the cover with my elbows, I and mean, I was scared to the bone that they will catch me and send me to jail. 
I checked my reflection in the window, but it looked like a terrifying Lady Gaga with a fake shoulder pad. But I was also shameless by this time, and I knew I was an awful person. It was nearly 5 o'clock, and every library goer left. The librarians were doing their closing up routine, so the front desk was abandoned, and I just walked out without anyone noticing me. I glued all the pages and the cover together at home. The book was nowhere near as majestic as before, but I loved it anyway. I have never stolen anything else in my life, and I'm so sorry for this. Later heist includes stealing the Mona Lisa in a similar way, yes? In a similar way? Mm, I don't know about that one. God dang, dude! That's a hella plan for a young child. Steal the moon! I stole a girl's iPod Touch and then sold it back to her a month later. It's 2011. I'm in year seven. It's my first year in high school, and I got sent somewhere where I literally only knew one person, and we never spoke. A few months into the year, I'm sitting in math class, and this one girl who I just could not stand and who also bullied me on and off kept just interrupting for the stupidest of things and just generally kept getting on my nerves the whole lesson. Our way through the lesson, the teacher tells us to leave our things in the classroom so we can go to the computer lab, and I was the last to leave the classroom. Note that most kids hid their iPods under their pencil cases during class so they can get away with using it, and I knew for a fact she'd left it there. I don't know what possessed me to steal her iPod, but I did, and she never found out. But now I leave school. The iPod is still in my shorts pockets, but nobody knows what I've done. The girl thinks one of the guys was screwing with her and doesn't suspect me at all. Now, the one defining feature of her iPod was that the back was completely covered in small circle stickers. Once it had gotten so worn down, they'd almost fuse with the device. So I did what I could and scrubbed those frickers off until it looked brand new. I didn't use it at all in fear for my mom seeing it and screaming at me for being a thief. So I just sat in my room gathering dust. Until about a month later, I overhear her asking some people if they know about anyone selling an iPod. One week later, and I made $150 by selling a girl her own iPod that had just been factory reset and scrubbed down. Now that is what we call a pro gamer move. Serial number would have been the same, too bad she didn't notice. Oh, aren't you a freaking fun at parties, Nax74? Um, actually, the serial number's the same. Shut up! It was funny. My friend and I lowered our GPA and broke into the teacher's lounge because we were thirsty. I really like soda. And around five years ago, my friend and I were high school freshmen. We were really poor, but we still both would scrounge up change to buy a soda every now and then. The recent healthy lifestyle thing schools were doing, all the soda vending machines were removed. For a while, we were really upset. However, I walked by a teacher's lounge one day while a teacher had the door open and saw that there was a Coke vending machine still in there. Not only that, but the price of a single bottle was only 50 cents. That was an outright steal to us. We knew we had to get in there. The problem was the door was constantly locked. We began creating our plan. During lunch hour, we scoped out the normal high school building since it was lunch, all students were required to be in the cafeteria. However, we knew a way to have access to the building was to get lunch detention. Kids in detention were released 20 minutes late for lunch. The easiest way to do that was to not turn in biology worksheets. Three zeros in biology and a few late lunches later, we found out that one of the teachers would leave a key in the door for easy access. On the fourth day, we put our plan into action. <clears throat> B would watch the door as I slipped into the lounge after teachers had gotten their lunch and I made my way to the machine with a dollar and quarters. On the way, I noticed a bowl in the corner labeled soda fund with lots of change and dollar bills inside. Reed took over me that day and we ran out of the school with three sodas each. We did this at least four more times through the semester. We had to stop after the school installed security cameras and eventually the cheap soda machine was removed. Overall, our average biology score dropped nearly 15 points, but the sodas tasted really good. Reading this was like watching a heist movie. I thought you meant thirsty as in horny. Bro? What? A small price to pay for satiation. I forged Good Charlotte's signature for a Nintendo. When I was eight, there was a boy in my third grade class who was obsessed with the band Good Charlotte and he had this blue Nintendo Game Boy that I'd been eyeing for a while and I decided to propose a trade. I told them that I actually knew Benji and Joe Madden, link singers of the band, and I had their autographs. I told him I traded the autographs for his Game Boy and he enthusiastically agreed. I went home and spent a good 20 to 30 minutes with my next door neighbor forging their signatures. After we agreed on one, we used her parents' lamination machine to make it really legit. The next day, he handed over his Game Boy in return for the fake autographs. A week later, my little brother was playing with the Game Boy and dropped it in the bathtub. Well, karma, I guess. Benji and Cameron are regulars of mine at my coffee shop. I'm excited to tell them this story. I'll send you a Game Boy if you get me their autograph. Heist of the century. You did that at eight? You deserve the Game Boy, you creative bastard. Son, I've been reading your Reddit posts. Son, you just graduated with top grades from a tough engineering program, and you've got your dream job lined up. So I thought it was time I fessed up. I've been reading your Reddit posts since you were a sophomore in high school. I know you think I don't even know what Reddit is. I may be over 50, but as you're learning, parents aren't really that oblivious. The secret Santa gift you received years ago that you thought I didn't notice showed your account name. Ever since I watched your account, so when I saw some comment about being down or unhappy, mom and I tried harder to make sure you knew we loved you and we're sure everything would work out. Teenage years can be tough. I'm proud of what you've accomplished and see the mature, confident, capable young man you've become. So no need to change your account name now. I don't feel the need to watch over you in the same way I did years ago and I promise to stop reading your posts. So what weird plan is your son into? Dad invades his son privacy. Then his story invades my heart. Mad tears, bro. That's a heartwarming invasion of privacy. I don't know whether you're an awesome dad or a huge d I used to throw out food 
food, so mom had to cook again. When I was a kid, I used to live alone with my mother. She always cooked more than necessary at lunch, so she don't need to cook again for dinner. Food usually was enough even for the next day lunch, and I hated this. In my mind, there was no need for that. She was just lazy. I threw out the food, so she had to cook a new one. This lasts for a month or so. Obviously, she realized what I was doing, but never said a word. She just took the hint and cooked less. Looking back, she was so busy. Single mother having to take care of a child and work at the same time. Honestly, this is not something I cared that much until last week when she died and everything came back. All that stuff that I've done in the past that made our life difficult. If that had been more than a mild inconvenience, I'm sure she would have said something about it. You were a child. Find comfort in knowing that these were things she would laugh about when sharing with friends and family and co-workers. Sheesh. I don't even, I don't feel like cooking 80% of the time. Lamau. I stopped attending a class, lied about turning in the final, and still passed. Back in my junior year of college, I took a class with a professor that I really did not like. He was so disorganized, absent-minded, and really didn't teach anything. The kind of professor that tells you to watch YouTube videos instead of actually teaching you the subject. It took him weeks to grade anything, and I don't even think he read them. It seemed like he was just coasting until retirement. Anyway, I flew out to see my grandma one week for her 90th birthday, and I missed a few classes and missed a few YouTube lessons. Well, the following week, my grandma passed, so I flew back out for her funeral, in turn missing a few more classes. I was really far behind and really had no clue what we were working on, flunked the midterm, and missed the big project. At this point, I just gave up and reserved myself to failure and retake it in the summer, and I didn't show up to any other classes. At the end of the semester, he emailed me regarding the final project and final test. He congratulated me on a great job with the group project. Really weird, since I hadn't been to class in months, and he was definitely not part of the group project. He was also wondering if I had turned in the final paper. I emailed him back and told him how happy I was that he enjoyed the project, and I had definitely turned in the paper. Well, I don't know if he wanted to cover his tracks and pretend he didn't lose my test, or whether he didn't give a crap about it, but when I checked my final grade for the semester, I had passed with a high C. I do not regret it at all. He was a horrible professor and a total slob. Freaking amazing. C's get degrees. Even from slobs on the job. Deception 100. Bro didn't even try. Bro didn't even try to deceive. He I went off on a homeless person and I'm not sure if I should feel bad. So I just graduated this year as a nurse and got a job working at my local hospital. On my walk to the hospital, I passed the same homeless person every morning. He has a camp set up. Sometimes he's minding his business and sometimes he asks me for money and I say no sorry. Well this morning he asked me for money again, but this time with more aggression in his voice and I said no. Walking past him, he proceeded to throw an empty bottle of Coca-Cola at my legs and then his dirty blanket, which he missed, and proceeded to scream something like, you're a doctor, you can afford my food, yet you don't give me stuff. I stopped in shock at this point, but something overcame me, to which I replied, I just graduated with a nursing degree, I have almost six figures in freaking debt. I don't owe you or the likes of you anything, while well, you lay in your own piss all day, beg for money just to do a bump, and wait to die. Get a job. He didn't say anything back, but I immediately started walking during my last few words. I felt like some rage came about me, and I never took myself as the person to speak that way. I honestly don't know if I should feel bad. Nurse outside my work got decked by a homeless person for saying nothing at all. Stay safe. My boyfriend encountered an aggressive homeless man while driving home from work years ago. The guy was adamant about getting a ride even after my boyfriend politely refused him multiple times. This light bulb of a human proceeded to spit in his face and my boyfriend, who was never violent, punched him almost immediately. Guy deserved it for sure. I see nothing wrong with this. The moment he lashed out at you for his problems, he deserved to hear that everybody has them. Homeless people are people too and people can be assholes. I don't think you need to feel bad. Someone threw something at you and they were aggressive. Your reaction was totally justified in my book. Not that you need any validation from me. He lashed out at you. You lashed out at him. You could have been the bigger person, used better phrasing, but hey, this guy literally threw stuff at you. Nobody's perfect and you can't be empathetic 100% 24-7. I get a huge kick out of paying for people's stuff when they can't. Yesterday, a young guy ahead of me in the grocery store had about 92 sec worth of groceries and he would forgot his card. Broke out my card and paid for his stuff, even over his objections. He wanted to pay me back, but I just told him not to worry about it, just do something nice for someone in the future. A few years ago, my wife and I were at Costco and the young couple ahead of us were trying to use EBT to pay for their groceries. But Costco didn't take EBT, so my wife and I offered to pay for their entire order. It was almost $400. I didn't hesitate and it felt so good to be able to do that. We're not a wealthy family, but we are better off than some, and it just seems insane to not help people in those moments, especially considering that I know full well how embarrassing it is to rock up to the grocery store clerk and not have the money to pay for things. I've had a few more experiences like that and I actively hope for more just for the serotonin hit I get from helping people. I completely get this. I'm not wealthy, but I've worked in the airline industry for years and I've always collected a huge number of air miles, etc., with all the various airlines and alliances. It can be a very boring, lonely existence, but every one of the biggest buzzes I've had come from giving someone a flight or upgrade when they didn't ask for or expect it. These are things I could never afford to do with cash, but it's been no bother at all to me to just use points to put a smile on someone's face. Good for you for paying some good forward. If you're genuine, it's a lovely thing, and thanks for not wanting to be buried in the ground with your gold. I had a homeless guy outside of Goodwill ask if I can buy him clothing. I was like, hell yeah, come on and pick what you want. I spent about 40 bucks on him. He got pants, two shirts, a hat, and a backpack. I tried getting socks, but they had none. Cool thing to help out rather than give
without money. When I was making good, good money, I would bless a small amount of people on Facebook. I wouldn't give them money, but if they needed diapers or a bill paid, I would call and pay it, or I'd send gift cards to grocery stores if I could. It actually got to be great that I started having people donate to be able to help. I've been in those situations where it's been pay for this bill and be without food for a week, or pay for groceries and not have electricity or water for a week. When I'm back on my feet, I will be doing it again. It's fun. One of the most attractive things about my boyfriend is he's always buying other people's dinner, and he asks that they not be told until after we're gone. One of my favorite memories was being in line at a clothing boutique behind a woman who was paying on her layaway items. Once she left, I paid it off. I ate a whole family-sized cake in the parking lot. I was eight months pregnant, and I had this insane craving for chocolate cake, so I went to buy one. As soon as I got in the car, I knew I couldn't wait to get home. I got the cake and sat in the back seat so no one would see me. There I sat, eating an entire family-sized chocolate cake with my hands. I don't know what came over me. This was almost a year ago now, and I still haven't told another soul. Thank you. That is all. You got that vitamin chocolate you needed. My only negative thought is how messy. I wish she had a fork. You didn't sit in the back with the cake because you didn't want to be seen. You sat in the back because you didn't want to share. I bet you and the baby enjoyed it thoroughly, but I hope you got some milk too. Life is hard. Eat the damn cake. I'm 5'0 and on the thin side, but binge eat on my occasion. And my family has held two interventions fearing I'm bulimic because nobody can eat that much and keep it down or gain weight. The fuck I can't, Doris. When I was really depressed, I would eat an entire pizza by myself. Don't feel bad about it. Usually when people crave chocolate, it's because the body is looking for more magnesium. OMG, chocolate is my number one lifelong craving. All day, every day. But since getting pregnant, my doctor put me on a magnesium supplement and the craving has significantly died down. I was just telling my husband how weird it is that I'm craving vanilla cake because usually I only eat chocolate, but I just really want vanilla and plain vanilla sugar cookies. I'm a chocolate chip cookie person, never a sugar cookie person. If we're talking about those crappy grocery store sugar cookies with the cake icing on top that is just disgustingly thick and they taste like sand and they come in those plastic containers, those are gross. Disgusting. I made up a lie and everyone I know thinks it's true now. When I was a kid, I found out my stepmom was allergic to pineapple. I thought that was cool. I don't know. I just wanted to be like her, so I told my friends I was allergic to pineapple. I used to love it, but I just decided one day I was allergic to it. Now everyone in my life thinks that I'm allergic to it. I haven't eaten pineapple in 12 years or more, and I know it's such a stupid lie, but everyone knows that about me, and they always make sure I can't have pineapple. It even says it on my medical chart, and it's completely made up. At this point, I've avoided it for so long and told everyone I'm allergic to it that I'm afraid my body might actually react to it because I almost believe it myself. It's such a stupid lie, but it's carried into my entire life. I feel so stupid. Just go get tested for allergy and act in wonders when you can find you are okay with pineapple now. Allergies can appear and disappear over time, so you can safely salvage this. Plot twist, you're that guy from Glass Onion and you actually are allergic and now you're dead. I lied about my height for most of high school, so once I stopped growing, I was at a happy six foot even, but that wasn't enough for me. I needed more. I would tell everyone I was five foot ten. I noticed there was a large population of guys who claimed to be six foot, but were just under the mark. So to really drive the point home, I'd argue that I'm under six foot, and since they were shorter than me, they can't be six feet tall. Watching the panic in their eyes as they tried to defend their height was the highlight of my high school experience. I'm five foot one at 18, and I'm super insecure about my height, and sadly, I can't lie about my height. You could always say that you're 4'11". Yeah, make the <laughs> make the even shorter people feel even shorter. I'm five foot 12. Nice try. I anonymously put my friend's phone number on a gay Craigslist ad. This was a few years ago before CL stopped the relationship stuff. As a joke, I created an ad of Craigslist relationships, male looking for male. Essentially, the ad was pretty much a guy looking for a one-way ticket to pound town, ready to frick and sick anything, willing to be a dumpster and all types of things. I made sure to make it for serious inquiries only. I put his phone in the weird code like everyone else on similar ads, like 555535375545. I sat back and waited. The next day, he makes a Facebook post about the who the frick put my number on a gay Craigslist ad, and if he gets one more wiener pick, he will strangle whoever did this. As you can imagine, the comment replies on his post were great. Calls slash texts continued for a few days until I took the post down and went to go hang out with him. He told me about the phone calls he got, the text messages, the pics. Oh, it went great. I never laughed so hard. I never admitted to it, and I don't regret it. I can't do that because my friend is gay, and this would bring him pleasure. Perfection. Have your upvote. Someone did this to me, except it wasn't as bad. Um, I didn't get put on a gay ad for Craigslist, but uh, somebody put my phone number on Craigslist and said that I was selling chickens, and surprisingly, I got a lot of text and phone calls about people wanting chickens. I don't know. I made my school believe they broke my iPad and made them buy me a new one. My high school didn't allow phones or tablets to be on your person throughout the school day. Instead, they made us all hand our devices in every morning and pick them up at the end of the school day. They provided us with these white cushioned envelope bags to protect them, but it really did nothing. Anyway, one morning, I was rushing to catch the bus, and on the way out of my bedroom, I decided to throw my iPad onto my bed, but it bounced off, landing face down on the slate tiles. I knew straight away it was smashed from the sound, and I stood there 
there cursing myself until I had an idea. I grabbed my phone bag and put the broken iPad and shattered glass in it and took it to school. I handed it in, acting nonchalant about it, and when it came time to pick it up in the afternoon, I put my best shocked and sad face on as I opened the bag. I went to the nearest teacher and told her that I found my iPad broken. She took me to the office and eventually to the principal. At first, she'd seemed suspicious about the entire thing, but when my dad, 25-year army veteran, came in to pick me up, he gave her and the entire admin staff a spraying. She originally agreed to pay for it to be repaired, but when that couldn't be done, she agreed to buy a replacement model. But the thing is, is that the iPad was a second-gen model and it was 2014, so I ended up getting a brand new model as well. I never admitted it to anyone in school out of fear it would eventually lead to the principal finding out. In my school, they actually broke my phone, but they just told me to F off and thought it was my fault because I shouldn't have brought it to school to begin with. Why is nobody talking about why the frick you have slate tiles in your bedroom? I was kind of thinking the same thing. What do you mean? Why is your floor in your bedroom tiles? It's not carpet or hardwood? Where do you live? I once skunked a bottle of wine given to a bullying manager on my team, then gave it to her. Many moons ago, I was working for a large technology company. It was common practice for managers on the same team to exchange some sort of token holiday gift just before Christmas, something under $20. One of these managers was a really nasty woman who was quietly bullying some of her employees and one of the other managers on our team. We were trying to deal with her through the proper channels, but the holidays sprang up in the meantime. When the holidays came around, I bought a case of nice red wine that I enjoyed and prepped them all with gift bags, except one bottle, the bottle for the nasty manager. I took that bottle and spent about two weeks heating the bottle and chilling the bottle by wrapping it in a particularly warm heating pad and sanding it on top of my dad's old apartment hot water heater for one or two hours and then sticking it in the freezer until the bottle was cold to the touch. My goal was to ruin the wine and turn it into Vinegar. The holidays came and I gave my fellow managers their gift wine and we all headed out of the office for a few days for company. Wide oh oh oh. When we came back, everyone was talking about how wonderful the wine was, except the nasty manager who was surprised everyone loved it. She was going on about how nasty it was and how bad it smelled and how she couldn't even drink it. It was intended as a harmless prank, but when she was fired a few days later for bullying people, she exploded and mentioned my bad wine in her tirade as she threw things around the office on her way out the door. I felt some degree of pride about that because frick her for bullying people. I thought by skunked, you meant that you farted in it. Sounds like she was really full of piss and vinegar there at the end. Revenge is a best served cold. Or hot. Or cold. I used to work in a shoe shop and deliberately sold a customer shoes while she was trying on shoes just to make her buy a new pair. Battle says it all. I was 16 and my first job was in a shoe shop. We had one regular awkward woman customer who came in every Saturday afternoon whilst the store was at its busiest and literally asked to try on every pair of shoes in the shop before leaving an hour later without buying anything. I was the new boy and the youngest, so all the other staff always dumped her on me. One day, she was up to her usual Saturday afternoon hobby, and an elderly lady, obviously visually impaired, handed me a pair of shoes and asked me how much. They were the awkward customer-owned shoes that the elderly woman had picked from the floor. I quoted her a ridiculously low price, and she bought them immediately. Ten minutes later, the awkward customer started shrieking that she couldn't find her shoes, and after complaining to the manager, believing they had been stolen by shoplifters, he was having none of it, stating that it wasn't the company's fault if customers had their personal property stolen in the store. The woman had to buy a new pair of shoes, or leave barefooted. We never saw her again. That's hilarious. Nice job. Made two sales and got rid of a bad customer. Good work. Now I really want to know what her deal was. She just went to a different store and continued doing that creepy behavior though. I sold sodas in high school after a ban of soft drinks was put into place to pay for senior fees. I routed out my competition. Junior year, a ban in California prohibited sale of soda in public school, specifically LAUSD. I seeing a need by many decided to spend my small savings from allowance, $17, on three Costco 24 packs. School was selling at the time for 75 cents prior to the ban, so I matched the price, roughly making $18 every 24-pack, which was about $13 in profit per 24-pack. After my first week and three trips to Costco, I made enough to buy more inventory per trip, minimizing my trips to Costco and cutting into profits. Added variety to what I had, started with Coke, then added Sprite, and then Dr. Pepper. At first, I was holding in my locker, but realized it was an issue. Invested in an insulated bag and had two to three frozen waters inside to keep things cool, and added help was chilling the drinks the night before also. I was sold out, on average, before lunch, or at the beginning of lunch. Four months, I noticed sales drop and I was leaving school with inventory. Found out I had competition of others who not only picked up on what I was doing, but started selling flavor variety like Cherry Coke, Fanta, Shasta, and whatnot. By this time, I had already established myself with faculty and added Diet Cokes, Diet Dr. Peppers per request. Yep, made them off with free drinks, which took a hit on profits weekly, but secured me from getting in trouble with most security guards, where I made transactions and classes. I had a few trusted teachers from previous semester. On average, lost about a six pack to nine sodas weekly. No big. Had the principal and a few vice principals buying as well. Needless to say, competition wasn't something I needed. Had him get pinched by faculty once I found out who it was. Out of six, including myself, four got caught. The other gent, I let him continue doing what he was doing because I knew his background and he and his fam 
Sam needed the money. I did get pinched by a substitute in class, was sent to the same vice principal who was a buyer. All I was told was be careful and sat in his office till next class period started. My end goal was to pay for all senior fees, which included cap, gown, diploma, senior night, prom, and senior ring. By early senior year, I had made enough to cover all the fees, including my tux rental and my portion of a limo for prom night. I also bought a PS2 and saved the rest as a base starting point for used car. After starting a job and saving for an additional year, it ended being a 97 Honda Accord, so nothing fancy. End of senior year, I helped two juniors continue what I was doing and helped them figure it out and connected them to my faculty buyers. I have zero regrets about it all. This is some drug game stuff, my dude. Nice work. California Soda Cartel. Mad street cred. I won my sister her only high school scholarship. This was three years ago when I was finishing grade 10 and my sister was finishing grade 12 about to graduate. She's in college now, but in high school she was a pretty bad student in most of her classes, but she can get by for most of it. One to two weeks before her graduation ceremony, she came to me that she hadn't done anything for her senior grade art class and was meant to hand everything in two weeks ago and her already extended deadline was the next day for report cards and she didn't have enough work to pass the class. I'm really into art so I spent all night with her filling in her whole sketchbook with the criteria. Full page, color, shading, texture, and giving her old drawings I've already done so she would pass. She brought it all and the teacher loved it and she got an art excellent award and I don't know how that worked but she got $500 and spent it all on clothes. Our family doesn't know and thinks she's an artist now. Kinda sucks but it's mostly funny bug her with. She should have given you at least half the prize. You're a good person for helping her by the way. LOL, I'd honestly love to see some of your art. It's really similar to his sister's early work, if you're familiar. <laughs> when I was a kid, I would wipe my ass with towels that were hanging up. This is something I never admitted to a single person. I'm not sure at what age I stopped doing this, but throughout most of my childhood, I had this OCD compulsion where every time I would finish wiping, I would stand up, walk over to the towel rack, and give it one or two more thorough swipes. I couldn't not do it. I felt unclean if I didn't. It wasn't until I got a little older that I just realized how freaked up that that was. My older siblings spent their entire childhoods drying their faces off with my crappy remains. I've been mortified about it for years, but I'm actually in tears of laughter writing this out now. Why does everyone in this house keep getting pink eye? You monster, how can I ever trust towels again after reading this? Have an upvote. Reminds me of when I was a kid and only peed outside. My dad noticed the grass was changing colors and advised I stop. I didn't. I pretended to be the merch guy at a concert so I could steal t-shirts. Pretty much just the title. Five or six years ago, my wife and I went to see a band we used to love. After 20 minutes or so of waiting for the merch guy to come to his booth, I had the bright and very drunken idea to pretend to be the man at the booth himself. It really started as a funny gag just to make her laugh. Almost immediately, people came up to buy stuff. I turned them all away, which made them very confused. However, my wife did pretend to be a customer and I sold her two shirts, which we really just stole. In my defense, I never took anyone's money. I told them I was waiting to get the square reader from the band's front man, and we did originally intend to pay for the shirts. The merch guy just never showed up. I remember it once or twice a year and I'm overwhelmed by guilt for like a minute. <laughs> wow. Didn't know anyone could get away with a thousand dollars worth of concert merch so easily. I know stealing is wrong, but this is such a fun story. Should have actually become the merch guy. They probably would have given you free shirts if you substituted for them. I trash my coworkers' mugs and dishes when they leave it soaking in the community sink. At work, we have a kitchenette, and at the end of the day, my coworkers leave their dishes and mugs filled with oatmeal and other things left to soak. We even have a sign that states, do not leave personal belongings in the kitchenette. We are not responsible for lost items. I stay at work pretty late, so I see the night janitor come in and clean. I notice that he goes out of his way to wash the dishes and mugs, which isn't a part of his job. Our company only contracts them to do floors and trash, so it's our responsibility to clean up after ourselves. My coworkers must have noticed too because they have since stopped doing their own dishes and have been leaving piles in the sink, knowing that they will be magically washed and dried in the morning. They even make comments about the Mexican sucker that's cleaning for them. This has been ongoing for weeks, and my coworkers even have the audacity to complain about water spots on their mugs. So throughout the day, when I find myself alone in the kitchenette, I take an item or two or toss them out in the building hallway trash so it can't be found. We work in a building where we share office space with other businesses and there's no cameras so I haven't been caught yet. A coworker asked our manager about their items being taken but my manager just reiterated the policy. I guess I'm being petty but my coworkers are trash and I don't feel bad. I hope the janitor doesn't get blamed for throwing things away. You're doing noble work my friend. I kicked the kid in his balls and he had to have one removed. You did what? <laughs> This is, uh, this is interesting. Let's, let's, let's find out. This happened when I was around seven or eight. It was my first year in primary school, and I had joined the school with some of my friends from the local feeder school in the area. One particular boy was a year older than us, and he was repeating the first year for some reason. He was of German descent from a very well-to-do family and a lot bigger than the rest of us. Possibly because he was embarrassed at repeating the year, he was a bit of a bully. He often picked on me and some of my friends. I'm sure we probably escalated things at times, too, because I know he was teased for being German. So one day, standing outside class, I kicked 
knocked him full whack in the balls. He buckled over, but I can't really remember much of what happened afterwards. We probably tucked tail and ran. I can't even say for sure whether he deserved to be kicked at the time or if I just thought I was getting back at him for previous behavior. Anyway, he missed school for a few days after, and I heard some kids saying he was in a hospital. Soon after that, I was called in to speak to a teacher who, as far as I remember, dressed me down and explained he had gone home and his testicle had swollen up to the size of a tennis ball and had to be removed. I don't really remember getting into much trouble about it, but I do remember some of the other kids going on about it in banter. The details are hazy, but I felt so bad and I felt and I felt I was in so much trouble that I never ever told my parents about it. This was made worse as my dad and his dad had gone to school together, only found this out after seeing my dad chatting to his dad at a rugby match that me and the kid were playing one Saturday about a year after. I was freaking out the whole time and they were speaking and then started feeling guilty that my dad might have been seen as rude by his dad for not apologizing for my action. It didn't come across that way as they seemed like old friends catching up but I felt so guilty. I felt so awful about it. I mean at the time I didn't realize that it may have an effect on him being able to have children but I felt like I'd done something so horrible and always expected my family to confront me about it. When I learned to the reproductive challenge this might cause, the guilt was just amplified. The year that followed in primary school were mostly fine on the odd occasion he would have a go at me. I remember him having a slightly shorter fuse with me than others, but I think he ended up being okay and less of a bully. Saying that, he did try to drown me in a river at our primary school, Leavers Camp, and I pissed him off for some reason, but mostly the in-between years went by without incident. Oh yeah, without incident, except the part where he tried to drown you. Okay, dude. I left that school to go to a different high school, so I never maintained contact with him. I saw him once during my teenage years, and we chatted for about five minutes. I remember it being friendly, and I never, ever mentioned it. I hope he was able to have children. I'm sorry, bro. I never said sorry to. Holy frick, the size of a tennis ball? You must have kicked faster than the speed of light. He tried to kill you, so you have his future children. Not as bad as you think. I met my current boyfriend by slipping him my number while he was on a date with someone else and I was their server. I used to work at a cheesecake factory as a server. About 1.5 years ago, my current boyfriend came in with some other girl for a date. I'm not sure what it is about my boyfriend, but he just does it for me. He's not at all my normal type of guy I'm attracted to, but for some reason, he just makes me melt every time I look at him. He's got the super self-assured smile and something about the way he talks gets me. He's got this little chuckle he does and always looks down and bites his lip after. He's just like it for me. So immediately I rushed over to their table. Typically, if I saw a guy I was attracted to, I could give better service because I genuinely want to interact with him and everyone at the table. And that usually leads to nicer tips. When I started serving them, I couldn't help myself and I was flirting, super obviously. So much so, my co-workers were telling me to be careful I didn't get complained on. But he flirted back, so I was like a shark who smelled blood in the water. I spent so much time talking to him at their table. Other tables I was serving had to call out to me because I'd forget about them. Honestly, looking back, that was more of a date for me and him than her and his him because we talked about what he did for work, what I studied, what my favorite foods are, what he likes, music. I must have been at the table accumulatively for around 40 minutes. At the end of it, she was being very short with me and him, and I kind of figured she'd complain. So I said, screw it, scribbled my number down and put it under his card when I gave it back to him. He texted me that night, and we've basically been dating since, and I'm moving in with him on Friday. It was honestly a very rude and bad thing to do, but I do it over again in a second. I don't know how I would feel if I was in the other girl's shoe. Would have hurt me quite bad if I was into him. Reread this when he cheats on you. Damn. <laughs> Yeesh. Tough crowd. I conspired with our local brew pub to stop selling my husband growlers of IPA because the beer made him smell so bad. I may get downvoted for this, but here goes. My husband loves IPA beer, but it makes him smell so bad it's not even funny. It just reeks out of his pores and will actually make our sheets and his pillowcase smell bad. It also really doesn't matter what brand or how high quality it is. Whatever is in an IPA doesn't mix with his body chemistry. His favorite beer by far is a from a local brew pub. I'd say he was drinking about two thirds growlers of their IPA a week. I finally couldn't take it anymore one day and at lunch I went in and asked to speak with the owner. He's a very super cool guy and he said that he also can't stand IPAs because it's the reason so many bad breweries have been able to open because IPAs take very little skill to make. People often cover up mistakes with the intense flavors. So he and I worked out a deal that anytime my husband came in he and his workers would tell him that they were out of IPA but they would offer him a more traditional lager at a discount. Our hope was that eventually he'd lose the taste for IPA and stop stinking up our house. I even offered to work out a deal with the owner that I pay him whatever he was losing in the discount and he told me not to worry about it. So it's actually worked. I tricked my husband's taste buds into liking lighter beer and he seems to be past the disgusting IPA stage and he smells way better. Suck it, beer. Lamau, you sneaky snake. That's pretty hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not a beer guy at all. Uh, I don't know th how th any of this works, but I've tried beer before and it's gross. So yeah. I ended a girl's gymnastics career when I karate kicked a door open and broke her toe. We were at gymnastics camp when we were teenagers and there was a swinging door that I had wanted to bust open with a sweet karate kick all week long. The only thing stopping me was that I was afraid there was going to be someone on the other side and I didn't want to hurt anyone. Well, the last day comes around and I said frick it and kicked the door as hard as I could. My friend and 
and teammate was on the other side and the door caught on her big toe, pulling it back uh, and breaking it so badly she couldn't compete for almost a year. Miss Regionals ended, ended up quitting. She just assumed I had pushed the door open like a normal person, but nope, I karate kicked that B word. I still feel bad about it, and that was about 15 years ago. Sorry, girl. I'm about to end this girl's whole career. This is why I never learned karate. I'm dangerous enough without such knowledge. Tables would not stand a chance. Karate chop this and karate chop that. What's she doing now? That's the big question. About three miles an hour on crutches. I read my roommate's diary all year and then stole it when we moved out. In 2019, I got into college and started my first year with a random roommate. She was really rude to me, and despite trying to be a good roommate, I would always clean the room, take out the trash, etc., but she was always an a-hole. I wanted to know why, so I dug around, like the third week, and I found her diary. I started taking photos of it when she was in class, and I would read it. I would make sure to put it back exactly like it was, and I never used it in our arguments. I kept that stuff hidden from everyone, even my friends. I did this consistently every other day for two semesters, and it was so addicting I couldn't stop. I learned so much about her and how she's mentally unwell, but she hides it really well. I couldn't help it. It was just so intriguing. Then COVID hit, and I just wanted to keep sake, and when she was moving her stuff out, I was about to get in my car and leave, and I went in and made the intrusive decision to steal it and put it in my pants and my shirt over it and left. She never texted me about it or anything and never posted about it. Nothing. Absolute silence. She had quite a few people who didn't like her, and her friends and BF were really weird too. I legitimately think she doesn't know it's me. She had such a huge falling out with one of her friends, and I really think it was because she thought she stole it. I know this is absolutely terrible, but I still have the book. It's been so long. It's just at my parents' house. I know this was absolutely terrible for me to do, and that's why it was my confession. I have dreams of her finding out and us arguing to this day. Man, was her stuff fricked up, though. I'll never be able to see it into someone's life like that again in real-time updates. Yikes. Makes me glad I don't have roommates anymore. This is why I write my diary on my locked phone. OP is fricked up. I gotta agree here. The, uh, if this was an am I the a-hole post, the OP would be the a-hole. But, good lord, you can't just do that. <laughs> like, yeah, she treats you wrong. She's just a random girl. You can't steal her diary. It's messed up. I stole a microwave from Walmart out of desperation. A while back, while I was still in college, I lived with my then-fiance in a very overpriced apartment in a relatively big city. At the time, my job was only paying about $7.50 an hour, and I was studying and working full-time just to pay the bills. Basically, a decent yet expensive apartment and just enough money to pay the bills. Not much wiggle room. Well, one night, my significant other was out at work, and I was at home, heating up some leftovers for dinner in her microwave. And as I go to take the plate out, it slips and hits the door of the microwave on the inner edge and completely shatters the front of the microwave. So I'm freaking out, expecting my significant other to come home mad at me and or stressing about, about having to buy another one. And then I saw a Walmart receipt on the counter and I went to Walmart. It was probably around 9 p.m. My significant other was going to be getting off soon. So I'm rushing. I walk in, find the exact same model of microwave that we have and grab it off the shelf. I took the receipt out of my pocket and held it with the microwave and just walked out the door. After getting it and setting it up, I told my significant other I cleaned the microwave. Never told a soul about it. That was probably about six years ago and still using the microwave. Sneak 100. Frick it, man. This world's nickels and dimes you to death. Walmart will be okay with one less microwave. We return things to Walmart. We did not buy at Walmart. They don't care. I lied about completing a project in the eighth grade and passed anyway. I completely and 100% despised homework as a kid and about half of my teenage years. When I was in the eighth grade, we were assigned a project towards the end of the year that counted for a big percentage of our overall grade. From what I can remember, it had something to do with shapes and equations. It was basically like a large project of everything we learned the whole year. I didn't want to do it. I worked on it a very small amount here and there, but never completed it. The math teacher collected them over a period of a few days, and then was going to spend a few more days grading them all. I played along to all my other classmates that I turned mine in and even explained what it, maybe, looked like. The day came and she was finishing up grading all of them, and as she finished each one, she gave them back. So, some students had already taken theirs home. So she's sitting at her desk and asks, Spoopy Pup, have I graded yours yet? And I quickly replied, Yes, ma'am. You gave it back to me a couple days ago. Some wonderful, powerful magic force was working hard that day because all she said was, Oh, I forgot to write your grade down. Do you remember what it was? I didn't want to aim too high because I knew what work I was capable of, so I simply said, You wrote 89. And she just wrote it down in her grade book. She didn't question to see it again or anything. I couldn't believe it worked. That was the only time that ever worked. But it worked nonetheless. I passed math because of that lie. I did learn to just suck it up and do all the work from then on. You know, at least kudos to you for learning your lesson in a weird reverse way. <laughs> Teacher knew, but didn't want to put up with nagging you to turn in your project and or have to fail you. I don't know, there are some teachers that are a little bit forgetful, so I kind of believe they might have just forgotten. This is my recurring nightmare. I'm glad I know how it ends. Why is this a nightmare? They, they got away with it. It's not a nightmare. 
it's a dream. I secretly changed our bed. Me and my wife bought a new bed, a really expensive one, the kind that has separate firmness on each side. We spent hours and hours in the store, where my wife took her time testing and deciding what kind of lower mattress she wanted on her side. Beforehand, she had done extensive web research on what kind of bed would give her most happiness in life, and so on. Eventually, she settled for one with firmness between soft and medium. Me, I couldn't be bothered with that. I've always liked my bed soft, but the store lady said that with my body composition, I should have a hard mattress. So during a brief brain fart, I chose that. Next morning, I knew I had effed up. The $2,000 bed I'd just bought felt awful. Even worse, when installing it, I'd taken the plastic wrapping off the lower mattresses so I couldn't return them. The solution? While my wife was at work, I flipped the bed 180 degrees so that now I have the soft mattress and she has the concrete slab. There are two additional full-width, thick mattresses on top of those, so it's not immediately noticeable. This was five years ago. I've slept like a baby ever since. My wife apparently still hasn't noticed. At least she hasn't said anything. And she seems to sleep well. She must never know, though. Well, I, there, there are worse things to lie about, I guess. What if she found out, flipped the bed again, and you are the one that hasn't realized yet? It is possible, but if they didn't like the hard mattress, they probably would have noticed pretty quick. Dude, you sleep on a literal bed of lies. My favorite thing working as a window washer was going through people's private possessions. So I worked as a window washer in my small town in Sweden for about five years. Every morning you went to the warehouse where we had all of our stuff, drank a cup of coffee with your co-workers, and talked for a bit before getting to know the places you had to go to that day and who you had to do them with. Our bosses were very keen on everyone getting to know everyone, so they changed up the teams every day. This meant sometimes you got to go out by yourself. A typical workday is going to four to five houses and or apartments, sometimes old people, they were always home, sometimes families who were home because they knew we were coming. Not very often, you got people who left their key under the mat and let us go inside without them being home. I like this the most, since you didn't have anyone breathing down your neck while you worked. And sometimes, once in a blue moon, you got a house with nobody home by yourself. I don't know if there's something wrong with me, maybe, but to me, it felt like I had struck gold, because I knew I would be able to walk around that house by myself, check out every inch of it. I usually started by doing my job super fast, make sure I had some way of knowing if they got home. Usually, I placed a ladder somewhere close to the door, so if someone came home, they had to move it. Then I got to work. I never looked to steal anything. It was pure curiosity. I looked through bathroom cabinets, nightstands, desk drawers, and basically anything that you could open, while making sure everything I touched was placed back exactly where it was before. During my years, I found diaries with dark secrets, cute secrets, and just downright weird secrets. I found used condoms in the teenage boy's room, dill and vibrators in the daughter's slash mother's nightstands. I found a gun under a mattress, which in Sweden is not something you see every day. One couple had a swing hanging in the bedroom, so it's not really something I needed to look for, but I thought it was strange that they didn't take it down when they knew people were going to be in the house. I once opened a teenager's MacBook and boom! Uh, paused mid-video. No password, no incognito window, nothing. Jewelry, expensive watches and knives. One kid had three knives welded together like a ninja star but with a handle. Like I said, never stole anything. That wasn't my goal. I just loved going through other people's <laughs> It's wrong, I know that. But I couldn't help myself. While this is a very inappropriate and wrong thing to do, I can't say that I wouldn't do the same. <laughs> Ever wonder if your house guests snoop in your bathroom cupboards? Strategically place several marbles in the bathroom cabinets. Works every time. Fair warning, odds are if they're fine with you in the house, they have cameras. Especially nowadays, everybody has those ring cameras outside, inside, just wherever. My grandma does this too. She's banned from coming to me and my wife's place ever again. I recorded a no over my aunt's wedding video. When I was 14 and 15, I stayed with my aunt Cindy for a week while I was working a job. The commute to my job was very long and she lived much closer. It sounds weird to work so young and also travel for work, but it was a family business. I couldn't sleep as usual, lifelong insomniac, and I'm awake at 3 a.m. flipping through channels on her satellite package. Flip, flip, flip. Wait a minute. Was that a... Flip back and see real honest to God... 
my aunt had subscribed the Playboy channel. Hashtag jackpot. It's in the dead of night. No lights on. I've got the volume down as low as possible, but this is in the living room, and it's a big open area in the middle of the house. So I've got one eye on nasty office slats get promoted, and the other eye keeping watch. I hear someone get up and go into a bathroom. Frick. I turn the TV off, but the satellite is still on. I dig through her entertainment center looking for a blank tape, find one, and slip it into the VCR. I set it to record and then go to bed. I lay awake in bed terrified because if I fall asleep and someone turns on the TV before I get up, they're gonna know it was turned to a dirty channel. When the first pinky streaks of morning show in the sky, I'm up and in damage control mode. I snatch the tape, change the channel, make sure everything is neat and tidy with the tapes underneath the TV. That's when I find a yellowed label that has fallen off a tape. It says, Cindy and Daryl Wedding, 1985. No, 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 no. Look at the blank tape in my hand. See the faint outline of where a label used to be. They lined up perfectly. No. Suddenly, I have this smoking gun of a horrible thing I did in my possession. Anybody who watched the tape would see 30 seconds of her getting ready with her bridesmaids, cut to half of a plan set in the workplace, then it cuts out later to reveal mid-wedding ceremony. What could be more sacrilegious? I never watched the tape with any joy. I never told anyone. I just kept it hidden like some awful burden. Oh my god, that is so bad. That's just so unfortunate. Finally, a plan that ends with marriage. Didn't think we'd see it. Don't think that's quite it still, but it's something. My favorite bit is, I never watch the tape with any joy. Yeah, that does kind of imply that you did watch it, maybe a few times. I used to go into random homes in my neighborhood when the occupants weren't home. This was in the mid 80s when security wasn't like it is now, and also lots of families didn't even lock their doors. The first thing I ever did was when I was riding my bike in the neighborhood and saw a front door of home wide open. I peeked in and said, hello? Just to see if someone was home. No one answered. I stood in the living room just scanning the area and got spooked and left. After that day, I was hooked on it. I would wait for people to leave and enter through whichever door slash window was open and would walk around. I never stole anything, but I did open drawers, closets, and went through personal belongings. I once found a wad of money rolled up in a sock. I took the money and sock and put it in the next drawer over. I felt like I needed to leave a mark, so I ended up moving dishes and cabinets, like I switched the cups with plates and moved utensil drawers to another spot in the kitchen. I did this in about eight or nine homes until people started talking and getting suspicious, and of course, people started locking their doors, including our family. I stopped after that. Someone did call the police, but nothing ever came of it since nothing was stolen. I haven't trespassed in anyone's home, but I do switch things around in other homes when I'm invited over. What is this weird trend of people just kind of breaking and entering to snoop around, like, for nothing else, just to look. I find it funny how you wanted to F with people, but sort of respected their boundaries at the same time. Didn't steal anything but those people's sense of security and comfort of their home. Hilarious. You should have stolen the sock and left the money. If it were my money sock, I think I'd be going crazy just seeing that my sock was gone, but the money's perfectly fine. I, I'd go insane thinking about it for weeks. Today, my next door pregnant neighbor knocked on my door. Around 7 p.m. today, I heard some knocking on my door. I opened it, and it was my next door pregnant neighbor. She was, I think, in her seventh or eighth month. She was holding a small plate in her hand. In a very shy voice, she asked me if I can give her some of whatever I was cooking, because she liked the smell. I think pregnant women sometimes have strong cravings, and they cannot resist it. Anyway, she was shy and apologized a lot for her request, since we don't know each other. I laughed and told her it was okay. I was cooking a traditional meal from my country, and the recipe has olive oil, garlic, jalapenos, and some spices. I think the smell was nice. I gave her some of my dinner, then she left. I watched her walking home like a cute little penguin who's happy with her successful little hunting. I felt really happy too for some reason. It can be completely overwhelming when you get those pregnancy cravings. Nothing in that moment is as important as what is needed. It was very sweet of you to share. I feel like we don't hear about or see many things like this anymore. Just genuine human kindness. I 
fake an accent at my job. My heart is pounding right in this because I literally haven't told anyone this. So I worked at this one store and I worked on the sales floor. But before all that, I was just one person interviewing for a position at the store. Before I arrived for my interview, a friend of mine dared me to interview in a British accent. I said I'd do it only if they paid me. And to my surprise, they sent me like $10 through Venmo, which was more than enough for me. I went into the interview with the mindset that I wasn't going to get hired and they inevitably hired me on the spot. Accent and all. I was nervous because I had already talked to a whole bunch of higher ups with the accent and decided to just go with it, thinking it was only going to be a summer job. I was so wrong. It's been like seven months that I've been working there and I still use the accent to this day. When people ask me where I'm from, I just tell them my hometown because I have several Brits from that town whom I grew up with. The accent, the accent hasn't really posed a problem until now because my BF is friends with one of my co-workers, so I'm going to have to find the right time to come clean. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. I mean, honestly, pretty damn impressive to go seven months and not be discovered that it's a fake accent because I just did like a minute of it and yeah, that was awful. It was terrible. Bet a co-worker that you can fake an American accent for the rest of the year for $300. Honestly, not a terrible idea. It might get you out of it scot-free. Fake a head injury and go back to normal. This post is hilarious. Sorry, OP. Apparently, a kid in the States acquired a British accent solely from watching Peppa Pig. Hey, I mean, I've heard stranger things. I photoshopped every photo of my mom. My mom has really had a hard time the past few years. When she entered menopause, she gained weight, and no matter how much she works out or what diet she tries, she can't drop it. She is a wonderful person, beautiful inside and out, but I could tell it was really taking a toll on her. So I started, lightly, photoshopping pictures I take of her before I send them to anyone or print them. I just nip a little here and there, slight reshaping, and smoothing out of a few wrinkles. Nothing drastic, but enough. Since I have started this, she has started acting more confidently and has stopped making negative remarks about pictures she's in. She loves being in pictures with everyone again. It has really helped. I have not told anyone and never will. Well, you did just tell a lot of people anonymously on the internet, so hopefully your mom doesn't figure that out. I'm so conflicted on this. Intent is so endearing, but if she ever found out, just really keep this one to yourself. I really don't want to imagine the aftermath of the mom finding out about this, because that could be, like, world-ending. I hate my brain-damaged sister. I can't believe I'm actually typing this out right now. It's making it feel very real. And before you say it, I know, I know, I am probably one of the worst human beings on this planet. Around a year ago, my older sister, 27, widowed mother of two boys, 8 and 5, decided to, against every single warning made, get drunk as shit and wreck her car into a rock embankment outside of our town. She was life flighted to an ICU, spent weeks in a coma, and awoke in vegetative state. In the past year, she has slowly began to see some progress. Because of this accident, I was forced to quit my job, leave my friends, move across the country, and back in with my parents to help take care of her and raise my nephews. I love them dearly, but I have never wanted to have kids, especially not forced upon me like this. She had the mind of a child now, argues about silly things, can't cook for herself, cries over everything, can't read, memory loss, partially paralyzed on her right side, has aphasia, and a list of other problems with me as her caregiver. She tell me how happy she is to be alive after such a bad car accident. I want to scream that I wish she would have died. Her boys are a wreck after losing their dad recently and now having an effed up mom. My parents are spending all of their retirement savings for her treatments. I can see the years getting shaved off my dad and mom from the stress. I don't treat her any differently. I still tell her stories and laugh with her and do my best, but I hate the way I feel when I look at her. Did you even think about your boys when you got in your car? She is smiling and completely ignorant to the pain she has caused to my entire family. So I guess that's it. That's my confession. I have a deep, dark hatred and resentment for someone I love, and I will never let her know. Oh, yeah, uh, I don't really know how I can respond to something like that. That's, that's really heavy. Damn. That's exactly what I said. That's all I can say. Damn. 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 My dad passed away this morning. He was riding his motorcycle to work early this morning. At around 2.30 a.m., he crashed his bike. We're thinking he had a heart attack, and that's what caused him to crash. In high school, about 13 years ago, I had to do a paper for English class. The topic was, write a paper on either a personal hero of yours or something that influenced you growing up, and then presented it to the class. I wrote my paper on my dad. I wrote about how much I loved him, how much he cared for me, 
his 15 years in the army, and how he was raising me to be a successful adult. I probably spent more time on that than any other paper I did. I was proud of it, and happy I got to read it aloud. Later that evening, I mentioned the paper to my dad, told him we could do it on either a hero or something that influenced us. He asked what I did mine on. I was embarrassed, so I told him I did it on a band. The last 13 years, I've regretted that. The last 13 years, I've wanted to tell him what I did the paper on. Just two days ago, it came across my mind again. Dad, I wrote that paper on you. You're my hero. Always were and always will be. I'm sorry I didn't tell you how much I loved you and how much you meant to me. Thank you for always being there. I love you, Dad. Oh my god, that is so heartbreaking. I am so sorry for your loss. He knows, man. He knows. I'm dying, but haven't told anyone. I was diagnosed with cancer a little over two weeks ago after a regular checkup. Turns out I have a tumor on my colon that has spread to other areas, liver and lungs so far, and will require extensive chemo and surgery for any chance to live longer than eight months. I'm not having any treatment, and I haven't told my wife because she'll only pressure me to get the treatment, which results in months of pain and suffering for a relatively small chance. Instead, I'm making sure our last few months together are filled with only happy memories. I'm starting work later and finishing earlier each day to make her breakfast in bed and take her on dates in the evenings. My landlord I rent my workshop from has agreed to let me run my business rent-free for the next six months, which means significantly less financial stress and I can save a lot more, so she has something to carry her over afterwards. I hope she'll forgive me for taking this path. Dude, that's rough. You need to tell her. Life isn't a movie. Your wife and immediate family deserve to know. While I think I understand the sentiment of wanting to keep it a secret and pass peacefully, you need to tell people, otherwise they're not going to be prepared and that's just going to hurt them even more, I think. I've realized I detest my boyfriend. We've been together almost three years. We live together. I support us 100%. In the time we've been together, he's worked maybe two months. He's depressed and anxious and he steals all the oxygen and joy out of every room. He never wants to go anywhere but then complains that we never go anywhere. I got him an interview at my work, a moderately well-paid entry-level position. He refused to go, saying he wasn't ready, then spends time complaining about not having a job. You get the idea. Everything in our lives revolves around him and his moods. He cries, yells, or just sighs incessantly. There's no laughter or happiness in our home. I walk on eggshells all the time. I dread coming home from work. He grabbed me a few days ago and shook me so hard I'm bruised on my upper arms. The apartment is in my name, but he literally has nowhere to go because he has no friends and he refuses to contact his family. So he'd be homeless and I can't do that to him, or any human really. I fantasize about being alone all the time, like only cooking or shopping or doing anything just for myself. It would be incredible to be able to breathe again. His birthday was last week and I saved up for a month to get him something related to his hobby. When I gave it to him, he said, I just told you, I didn't want to do this anymore. What were you thinking? I think at that point, any love I still felt for him just died. He doesn't cook, clean, care for his dog, or do anything but play video games. I'm trapped in a prison and I just don't really care what happens to me anymore. I don't want to die, but I wouldn't be upset if I didn't wake up tomorrow, if that makes sense. I know what I should do, but I'm just a dumb bee. Thanks for reading. Typing it out helps. Honestly, it seems like you're very entitled to just kick him out because you own the apartment, you pay all the bills, you do everything. Get that mooch out. This won't get better. You have one life. Live yours. Dump him and move on. Leave him like a mama bird would do, and he will find his way. Why, I am Aunt Susan, the Karma Farming Facebook fiend. My Reddit username is Cool Girl on the Train. I'm not really cool, but I commute daily on a train, so it's partially correct. I am an English woman, living in England. About two years ago, the fate that is called life landed an American guy in my local pub. My first impression was that he was different and a little odd. Odd. I was drawn to this oddness. It was cool and exciting, and it brings out my personality and inner quirks. About a year ago, we have become the best of friends. It's platonic, and it's amazing. It's a friendship like no other. Well, of course, being a typically reserved English woman, I had never heard of Reddit. The guy, who shall be known as Mr. X, obviously is a hardcore Redditor, and has an established account. He told me about Reddit, suggesting I set up an account and bet that I could never achieve the same amount of karma as him. I I think it was more so the smug grin on his face as he was looking down at me that had the greatest impact and made me more so determined. What I don't think he realized is that I am incredibly competitive with the determination and heart of a lion. The pro
surprise if I did would be a trip to Canada. I had never been west, so for me, this would be incredible. This was three weeks ago. Over the last three weeks, I have frantically posted all sorts of stuff in an eager attempt to work out what works. I have been called every name under the sun. Karma ho- Karma Farmer, Aunt Susan, and to colloquially go back to Facebook. I have even been requested to stay on my side of the pond. This is my confession. This is why I have been behaving like Aunt Susan, the Karma Farming Facebook fiend. I apologize, and if you're interested, I will, of course, keep you posted. Confessions of the not-so-cool girl on the train. I don't know why, but I feel like this is a really cute setup. This could be a rom-com for sure. 40k karma in three weeks? Damn. Edit? Another 40k in one day? Keep being a karma ho- LMAO. Yeah, I mean, clearly it's working out. Hopefully you're going to Canada. When I was 16, I took my family pet to the vet, found out he was terminally ill, and never told anyone. I'm the eldest of four kids in a family of six, and growing up, we had a beautiful albino chinchilla named Dusty. Dusty was an awesome little pet to have as a kid. Very sweet, never bit anyone, loved to cuddle and run around digging tunnels in the bedsheets. He had this really big cage in our guest bedroom that was connected to my room, and every time someone would walk past his cage, he would run to the gate hoping to be taken out. If you open the gate, he would just hop right into your hand. Anyway, great pet. So about three days after I got my driver's license as a 16-year-old, I noticed that one of Dusty's eyes were tearing a little bit, which I hadn't seen happen before. Feeling like a brand new adult with my new driver's license, I decided to take it upon myself to bring him to the vet and see what was up. So I put him into a brown paper grocery bag with his favorite blanket, made some air holes, stapled it shut, and strapped him into the passenger seat of my family's van. Fast forward maybe a half hour and I'm sitting in the vet office holding Dusty, feeling like the most responsible adult ever. The vet is an exotic animals vet and takes a look at him, then asks to do an x-ray. So she sedates him a little, does the x-ray, hands him back to me and leaves the room. Adult level 9000 as I sit petting him until he wakes back up. So vet comes back in and sits next to me on the little bench in the checkup room and starts petting him in my lap. She tells me how wonderful he is and how lucky I am to have such a great little pet, asking me my favorite memories of him. All this. So we are talking and finally I ask her something like, okay, so how much do chinchilla eye drops cost because I've got to get going? And she smiles gently, saying something like, I wish eye drops could fix this. She gives me a hug and starts to explain. Dusty was not bred responsibly and had some kind of internal deformity involving the roots of his teeth, putting pressure on his eyes and brain. This would eventually cause an early death. I couldn't believe it. I remember starting to cry and putting Dusty back in his grocery bag with his blanket and asking if the vet had a stapler I could use to close it again. I paid cash to the receptionist from my babysitting money and got into my car crying all the way home. When I got home, I sat in the car for a while in the garage, trying to gather myself as Dusty chewed on his bag. Looking back, I'm not really sure why, but in the car, I decided not to tell my family the news. The vet said Dusty wasn't in pain despite his tearing eye and we wouldn't have to put him down. She didn't know how long exactly he had left, but guessed maybe a year. I guess I figured I didn't want my family to be sad every time they played with him or passed by his cage knowing his time was limited. I wanted the rest of his little life to be normal. Eventually, I brought him back in the house and put him in his cage. I went later that day to Petco and bought rodent eye drops as a cover-up and proudly told my father that night how I brought Dusty to the vet to check his eye and lied saying the doctor gave me eye drops and told me eye irritation is common in chinchillas. Dusty lived more three years after that, two years longer than the vet had expected. He passed away just shy of his 10th birthday. On the morning he passed, I told my dad what had actually happened at the vet. He told me I was so much more of an adult than I knew. Honestly, I think that was probably the best decision you could make. None of the family really worrying, and you got two extra years compared to what the vet told you? I read that as Chihuahua instead of Chinchilla, and when you said you put Dusty in a brown paper bag, I was a bit concerned, lol. Admittedly, when I first read through it, I did read it as Chihuahua and I was very nervous, but I'm glad I figured it out. IDK, why I'm crying in the club, RN. No, it's valid. You you should cry. Maybe not in the club, but okay, just start crying. I cheated on my husband with a married man, which resulted in the breakup of both our marriage. Well, long story short, I was in a horrible marriage with my alcoholic husband. He was hanging out with swingers and got a drunken BJ while he was stationed in Korea. I was back home in America. At some point, he said things to me that broke my heart into pieces. 
So I went alone to prove myself I am worthy of appreciation from a man. Found a man and he was married and in a failing marriage. They had not have sex in two years and were sleeping in different beds. I just wanted a male friend to appreciate me. But we ended up falling in love. Of course, we carried on with the affair. And of course, a spouse got suspicious and had a falling out. And it contributed to the breakup of the marriage. I fell completely out of love with my husband before even started the affair. Once I met a new man, there was no turning back. It is about to be three years that we've been together, and he has been one of the best things that has happened in my life. We are soulmates, best friends. I can't tell anyone this story, but I had to confess. Ooh, yeah, uh, like, sure, it worked out. That's not okay, though. Like, necessary, you know, I don't know, that's bad. Military couples and cheating on each other. Name a more iconic duo. I'll wait. Word to the wise. If you're gonna cheat, then cheat with someone in a relationship so both of y'all got something to lose. Eh, that's a pretty good point, I guess. Two cheaters got together. I'm sure that will work out good. I cheated on every Spanish test I took in high school. So I am not a fan of cheating and have never cheated in any other class. When I was in high school, I was forced to take Spanish to graduate. I am not good with language, and living in the Southwest, I was the only student in the class who didn't already know Spanish. The teacher was therefore unsympathetic and refused to slow down and help. To pass, I needed a solution. I realized on her test days, she would have us use our own sheet of paper. I would make my study sheet on the page before the one I would use for the test and press so hard that I would have it transferred onto the test sheet. This bumped my grades from F's to A's. Teacher suspected me pulling shenanigans, but never caught me. I feel bad. And as an instructor, never let students use their own paper on tests. Whoa, 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 slow down, buddy, okay? Cheating is all a part of the game of school. At least that's how I learned it from Naruto. For my foreign language credit, I took Spanish 1. I was already fluent in Spanish, but acted as if I didn't know any and just skated by. You shouldn't cheat, but what else do you expect teenagers to do when you put them into crappy situations with crappy teachers? I hide my mother's iPhone charger. My brother and sister are both really rude and mock me for a lot of my personal choice, which have nothing to do with them. Considering I only see them for a few scattered days in the year and they still choose to spend most of the time insulting me, I get really upset. They both have Apple like our mother, who they live with, and I have Android. I often hide my mother's chargers. She has so many everywhere, in her car, laptop, bathroom, living room, kitchen, etc., so that when she discovers them gone, she blames them. She then spends the next few hours furious with both of them and ignoring their requests. Gets me out of the spotlight and no one suspects me since I don't have any Apple products. Okay, at first I did not know where your title could be going, but oh my god, this is genius. You're a criminal mastermind. Replace them with broken chargers so it gets her even more mad. You are a diabolical genius. Carry on. I just gave a suburban mom the middle finger and it felt so empowering. I'm a 16 year old boy. I live in the suburbs. Tonight we have a big parade in the downtown of our city, so tons of cars are driving there and back. I dropped off my parents so they could drink and had to take the neighborhood route back home since all the main streets were packed. I went 20 on the neighborhood roads since there were people and parked cars everywhere. I noticed a white minivan was riding my ass and I was a little annoyed but not angry yet. Then we got to the stoplight and they tried to cross the double yellow lines just to be ahead of me in the left turn lane. But I sped ahead because I was not having that crap. So we were both waiting to go left and I had the longest yellow arrow of my life. Also, everyone was going where we came from so there was not a single gap I could have went left on. But Mrs. Everything has to be perfect for me because my husband is rich honked three times and kept raising her hand and acting like I'm an idiot for not risking my effing life to make a left turn. So as soon as I got that green arrow, I drove right next to her and mouthed a glorious Fuck you, b complete with a middle finger. The look on her face was priceless. She looked so offended and shocked that I would use vulgar language in her little Christian suburb. I usually try to be civil and not get on the bad side of people with more authority than me, but dang, that was liberating. I'm so sick of rich moms doing whatever they want without any consequences, so to upset her like that just felt great. See, I wish I could have stories like this. I, I need more opportunities to be the mean person, but it, it 
it, you know, it's kind of justified. I feel satisfied just knowing this happened. Are you serious? Right in front of my little Christian neighborhood? Ah, yes. Driving really brings out a whole new side of people. It is a little bizarre how different people act when they're driving. Like, some people just go ballistic for nothing. In high school, I broke into the mailbox to get my report card. When I was in the 11th grade, I rushed home quickly because I knew I had a bad report card and knew that my mom would be home soon. I had a tough childhood due to my abusive mother, so I knew it would be bad. However, upon arriving to the front of my apartment was the usual bunch of tenants who liked to sit outside and talk with each other. This worried me because I wouldn't be able to get my report card with them around. I felt that they would lecture me and tell my mom. I stepped up in my unit, looking out the window, waiting for them to disperse. Yet, they never did. So, out of desperation, I took a spatula, hidden in a brown Ralph's paper bag, lol, and went downstairs. When the group of older tenants seemed to not be paying attention to me, I began to nervously proceed with my plan in desperation. As I saw the edge of my report card under the mailbox door, I quickly tried to retrieve it, but was unsuccessful. Suddenly, I was caught by C, a 60-something year old man. He looked at me and said, Hun, the f*** you doing? All the other adults turned to look at me. Finally, I confessed to what was happening, that I wanted my report card so my mom wouldn't see and explain that she was on her way home. I was expecting punishment from the group. They stared at me, then nodded. All of them began to help me. They all knew how my mom was. A, a mid-30s woman who lived next door, went to keep a lookout for my mom's car. C, couldn't get the mailbox open, so he called J over. Suddenly, J, a 40-something-year-old man who lived a unit over from me, quickly took out his pocket knife and busted the mailbox open. I couldn't believe what was happening, but I grabbed my report card regardless. How was I going to explain a broken mailbox to my mom? She was obviously going to connect the dots, right? The others in the group hurried to try and close the busted mailbox the best they could. We were able to close it, but I knew once my mom attempted to open her mailbox and couldn't open it, that I would be doomed. Within five minutes of that altercation, my mom came home to see me in front with the group of older tenants and immediately proceeded to get her mail. All of us were silent. She couldn't open her mailbox. Immediately after she attempted to open the box, the live-in manager showed up. My heart was pounding to death as he began watching my mom struggle to open the mailbox. Luckily for me, without a second thought, he went on to say, We have gangsters in this area. A lot of this kind of stuff happens. Don't worry, though. We'll get it fixed. My mom accepted that explanation, and I never said another word of it for years. I did get better grades, though. The tenants had made me promise to in exchange for their support. This is, like, a beautiful story. I don't know, like, I just love the idea of these people coming together to help this kid in a time of need. Like, that's so nice. That's so awesome. I love those tenants. That wholesome moment when you got away with committing a federal crime. But seriously, good for you for not wasting your lucky moment. You made it well-deserved for yourself. I love this. What an awesome village to have your back. I wish they still sent report cards in the mail. Now the school automatically emails them to your parents. And that led to many a nights of uh, yelling at my household. I steal my housemates' food and nobody ever suspects me because they think I'm vegan. I was vegan when we started living together, but I gave up since then and I started stealing anything I can get my hands on. They never suspect me because they think I wouldn't eat those items. Never been even close to being caught. I always make sure to cook when nobody is home or to hide packaging and wrappers in my trash. It's more about the fact that I can do it without consequences that makes me do it. Nobody complained about missing food items more than a couple of times, so I don't think I am that much of a nuisance. Uh, it's still not the best thing to do. You probably should, like, you don't have to tell them, but start buying your own food, maybe? When I had a roommate stealing my food, I started putting ghost pepper flakes on everything. It stopped real fast. That almost sounds evil, but I guess you gotta do what you gotta do. You are the enemy of the people. A rat is a rat no matter which way you shake it. How about you grab a bunch of groceries to replace stolen food, apologize, and come out as an omnivore? I agree with the first part. Maybe you don't apologize. Just buy more groceries and tell people, yeah, I, I don't know, I'm not vegan anymore. It's probably easier that way. I broke the Wi-Fi when my parents refused to get better internet. We have terrible internet right now. The kind that makes you wait until everyone is out of the house to try and play games. And I have a sister, so even when my parents are at work, I can't play. Our internet is so bad that I couldn't send emails to my teachers with homework, and I got punished for it. My parents refused to get better internet using BS excuses like, it's too 
too expensive. You will be on it all the time. And my favorite, our neighbors complained about the guy that installed the new cables. It's BS because we are on an old plan and it's cheaper to switch. I'm pretty active and there is no proof bad installation guy exists. So I learned from a Reddit post that you can give devices priority. Bingo. So after looking into it for a while and spending longer getting into the controls of the modem, I give priority to Ethernet devices. At least that what I think it was. I was messing about in the settings and the Wi-Fi doesn't work now. Feeling quite proud, I go and play my games. It is slightly understandable for the homework aspect, but I do, uh, like, I don't know. It's hard to tell who's right and wrong in this. Honestly, fair play. You're being punished for not sending in homework you were trying to send in, but can't due to extremely poor internet connection. Just play your games after the work is submitted. Slow internet is more pain in the butt than not having internet.